Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Elisa and Gaetano. Hello. Thank you, thank you for joining the session a few minutes early and welcome. So since we have contributors all around the world, uh, some of which are in very different time zones, uh, it's quite early for them. So I don't know how many people will join each session. So we'll see, and you can come and go, by the way, uh, throughout the day. So it's a very long workshop where we will be presenting and try to give as much feedback as possible to each other, uh, depending on how many people join the session. Uh, in any way, so I hope that it's going to be useful. Uh, so we have three presenters in this uh, upcoming session. So we are also waiting for Sasha. Hopefully Sasha also will join soon, who is the last presenter of this session. You know the rules. It is uh, 45, the, the, the whole session uh, presumably will last about 45 minutes or so, where each paper only have has, uh, has 15 minutes, so I assume 10 to 12 minutes for the presentation and then a few minutes for Q&A if uh, there are any questions. Uh, I will be here all around the sessions, you know, throughout the whole day, uh, as well as throughout your whole session. So if you need me, just let me know. Um, yeah, otherwise we are going to start promptly at 1.30 p.m. Uh, Gaetano, you are joining us from Italy, right? Yes, yes, yes. Italy, Rome. Italy. Okay. Should I uh, you, you just give you a co host privileges so that you can share your screens. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just doing that now. Um, okay. Maybe, Elise, you can just actually start your uh, screen sharing right away because we'll start promptly in a few minutes. Okay, perfect. Perfect. You can see it, right? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay, and now the slides are moving. Yeah, it's it's perfectly visible and legible right now. Thank you. <clears throat> ah, Gorana Christie is also coming here. Now we have a few uh, the Sasha is still not here, but maybe. Uh, uh hello, Banu. Banu Yovash. Hello. Uh, do you mind if I just turn on the camera later? Of course, of course. Uh, whichever way you feel more comfortable. Thanks. So let's wait. Maybe like, you know, we can just also give uh, one minute buffer for, for buffer just, just in case. And we can maybe start in about one and a half minute or so. Yes. Sounds good. So we'll first start with you. So we have three uh, presentations in this session, one after another. Uh, Yediz Kaçamak from Boğaziçi University in Turkey is going to present tax evasion and enforcement. Gaetano Lisi from eCampus University in Italy, Shadow Economy Mixed Firms and Labor Market Outcomes. And then from University of Hamburg, hopefully Sasha is going to join us, Sasha Hokamp, who will present about literature review, a literature review of utility functions within computerized agent-based models of tax evasion and non-compliance. Let's wait maybe, you know, a little bit more. I'm also recording the session uh, right now to the cloud server, and I will share it with all participants once uh, the whole workshop ends. And let me also thank Columbia University for its generous support uh, that provides us basically this uh, Zoom session and the uh, hosting privileges and uh, also uh, saving privilege to the cloud server that comes with it. Okay, Christian Berger is also with us. Okay, I think now we can start the list because uh, the time is really, you know, uh, of the essence. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, thank you, Jehun, Professor Algin, for uh, inviting me to this workshop and including me in the uh, Handbook of Informal Economy. This is a great opportunity. I'm I'm very happy to be here, and I'm very happy to meet all of you. And of course, I will appreciate any feedback you will be willing to give. 
Uh, the chapter I'm going to talk about is tax evasion and enforcement. And <clears throat> uh, I wasn't sure about the format. So what I prepared is just like, you know, brief overview of what it looks like and what are the seminal works that we have currently. So um, I want to start with why is tax evasion important? And I don't want to go into the very basic idea of why is tax evasion important because we are all economists and we know why tax evasion is important. But mostly, if you ever taken a public economics course or taught a public economics course, you will see that majority of the standard tax models or any model that we look at assumes full enforcement and compliance. But we all know that no tax system will be complied with simply upon announcement, even though we do see in the data that some taxpayers might comply for many reasons, which I'll come to at the end of the presentation, enforcement is crucial. And if we only use this uh, models that ignores enforcement or the fact that people do in, in fact evade, the results and policy implications driven from these models might not be accurate or applicable to real world examples. Okay? And tax evasion has implications for both efficiency and equity, which are you know, two forces that we try to you know, like uh, coincide in economics in general. And it is a real problem in the world. Not a lot of countries do uh, tax, tax gap estimates, but you know, the US tax, tax gap is estimated to be around $428 billion. Um, the uh, same for the UK government is 32 billion pounds. And the recent tax gap estimate from Australia is $33.4 billion, which are quite large. And in this chapter, what I'm planning to do is I'm planning to analyze tax evasion and enforcement by focusing on individual income taxes mostly, but of course, I'm also planning to talk a little bit about VAT, which I think is a very interesting case because there is information reporting, but there is still some sort of evasion documented in the literature. And you know, basically, I'm going to focus on the theoretical part, empirical part, and the behavioral part. And while doing so, I'm planning to answer the following questions. What are positive and normative questions about evasion and enforcement? What are the determinants, including policy of evasion? What empirical strategies are appropriate in answering these questions? And how does the presence of evasion change the answers to the classical tax design questions? What can we say about optimal enforcement? And there are many tax puzzles that uh, maybe we can explain by behavioral considerations. <clears throat> So I want to talk briefly about the theoretical part. And if you ever open uh, any uh, public finance uh, or tax uh, optimal tax literature, the first thing you will see is Ali Hamsan law, which is the canonical work in this field. It is a simple but a very powerful model, which adapts the Becker crime model to the tax evasion problem. And they consider a world where each individual has a single source of income, which is private information government has no idea. And they choose how much income to the how much income to report to the government. Evasion is detected with a fixed probability, and if evasion is detected, the taxpayer has to pay a fine on top of all evaded tax. So, in other words, the individuals are considering type of uh, like a lottery type of situation where they're deciding to allocate how much money in each state. And under these very heavy assumptions, we get. This, uh, this results, like we find that all risk averse individuals evade, even if it's just a little bit, all risk neutral individuals evade all of their income and tax evasion decreases with the probability of detection and the fine. And one of the biggest tax puzzles that come out of from this model is for individuals with decreasing absolute risk aversion utility, which you know is what we believe most people have, tax evasion decreases with the marginal tax rate. This is a huge puzzle because the empirical literature suggests that if we increase marginal tax rates, evasion increases usually. So I plan to start from this canonical model and then look at the literature and look, you know, what type of assumptions are dropped and, you know, what we get and can we even solve these puzzles. And uh, I plan to also move on to empirical research on tax evasion. So evasion is very difficult to measure foremost people go uh, to extreme extents to hide their evasion, right? Because, you know, not that because, you know, they don't want us to do good research, but it's because, you know, if they caught, it's really bad for them. So they actually go like to, uh, they hire people to hide their evasion. They do, you know, they invest a lot in this. 
um, there, there is this like huge uh, selection and endogenity problem where most independent variables are actually responses to evasion. So you have to be very clever when uh, coming up with your research design. It is also true that it's very hard to distinguish mistakes from deliberate frauds, which, you know, in real life, you don't want to treat, treat mistakes as deliberate frauds because they have different implications for the individual and for the economy itself. It is very hard to measure the probability of detection. Should we use just a fraction of people that are audited? But, you know, uh, if we do that, are we going to get do each person have the same probability? How do we determine that? And it is very hard to measure the fine as well because you know posted penalties by governments, dif sorry for the typo, differ significantly from actual penalties. And finally, it is also really hard to understand the audit rules used by governments because these are hidden by governments. Governments do not want to reveal their audit rules for obvious reasons. Okay, so. The overview for the amplic Eprinkle research is the early research focuses on observational data and it has serious measurement and identification problems. And some earlier research uses a uh, tax compliance measurement program by the US. So most of the evasion literature is in the US and lately in Scandinavian countries. And uh, newer papers use the national research program which is a newer and improved version of the tax compliance measurement program. And we have a lot of laboratory experiments and field experiments, and recently a lot of randomized control trials. So uh, the behavioral research on tax evasion is looking at despite, you know, I showed you the figures, despite the uh, tax gap being quite large, it is still less than what the standard theory suggests. So then this begs the question, why do people do not evade as much as the theory suggests? So most tax, tax compliance models are assuming that, like the Aliham Sanma model, that people will underreport income to the extent that it benefits them monetarily. But a lot of behavioral research, not just on tax literature, but you know, like similar to like lying aversion or uh, social compliance, or whether the society affects the individual or the individual affects the society, tells us that not everyone will do what is best for them, just considering monetary benefits. So then this brings up the question, is this the reason that we don't see as much evasion as the theory suggests, or there are some other things that are missing in the way that we are modeling enforcement. Like for example, a lot of the uh, models ignore the fact that we have information reporting and technology in the current world. So I'm planning to uh, focus on that and try to underline whether, uh, how much of the lack of evasion can be attributed to this behavioral aspect and how much of the lack of inf inf uh, evasion can be attributed to uh, information uh, reporting problems. Okay. So in the conclusion, I'm hoping to summarize the findings and provide potential policy implications. And I want to focus on uh, providing policy implications where I can underline potential strategies to increase compliance, because you know, I do believe that increasing compliance is a very cru crucial outcome that we would have we would have want to have uh, for our society again because you know first of all it does affect equity especially because the data suggests that uh, higher income individuals have higher opportunities to evade so even if we start from a progressive tax system if we allow uh, unsymmetrical asymmetrical evasion then the actual tax system might not be as progressive as we think which will defeat the purpose of designing the tax systems. So I, I think I'm right on time, right? And uh, that is all I have. Thank you very much. All feedback is appreciated. I would love to take your questions or feedback right now. And if, if anything comes up to your mind, you know, after I'm done, feel free to email me at this address. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Yiris. Uh, so you are really on time. Um, so thank you for the presentation. Any questions or comments from the audience? Because we have time for a few minutes, maybe three to five, three to four, uh, in case anyone wants to add something or ask or clarify or, um, okay. Let's see, let me ask one more time. Last call for questions, comments. <laughs>
Sorry for my voice, by the way. Um, I think I am suffering from cold, flu, or COVID, or a mixture of all these. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Yes. So now I guess we can continue with Gaetano. Sasha actually joined the session for a few minutes, but then dropped out, maybe uh, having some connection problems. But we can still wait for Sasha because he's going to be the th uh, third presenter. But now we can continue with Gaetano if Gaetano is ready. Yes, uh, I try to show my presentation. I... Yeah, we can perfectly see your screen right now, the PowerPoint file that you are sharing. You can see the presentation. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the invitation in the, in the handbook of, of informal economy. I present a theoretical paper. Uh, the uh, literature, the related literature require no, no presentation because uh, many study between shadow economy and labor market outcome use the benchmark theoretical model of the labor market, the Pisarisis model, Diamond, Mortens, and Pisarisis model. The, I quote the textbook by Pisaridis and uh, the uh, the work are many and important and recent. I quote, I compare my, my work with the last work in this, uh, in this field, Coleman Larson, International Ta Tax and Public Finance, a uh, few years ago. I introduced three main novelties in this framework, in these famous frameworks. Uh, the hypothesis one is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is the following. In my theoretical model, there is one type of firm that open job, job vacancy in both the formal and informal sector because there are benefits in both sectors. And then a firm named as mixed firm I, think, I believe that this is a, a name uh, uh, never used, mixed firm, uh, for exploiting the benefit in both sectors. And this uh, implies uh, an, an, an interesting assumption because the, the usual assumption of one job firms are replaced by the one firm more job vacancy. As far as I am aware, this is the first theoretical paper to use this hypothesis. Hypothesis two is that an employed worker does not consider their unemployment condition as an, a realized option in the wage bargaining. In the wage bargaining, usually the outside option of an employed worker is the unemployment. But <laughs> I think that this condition is not a real outside option. Finally, hypothesis three, the concealment cost is the cost of concealing a job vacancy. In this way, the link between job creation, job vacancy, and shadow economy is more directed and robust and, uh, and more strengthened. The, the concealment cost is not the, cons the cost of concealing income from government, but it represents the cost of, of concealing a job vacancy. Uh, summarizing the shadow sector in my theoretical model uh, is the following. There is a, uh, a one firm, a mixed firm, that use tax and, and evaded tax in order to increase their profits. Of course, the income produced by the entitled work is hidden from the government. 
at the, at the raw rate, government remove undeclared, undeclared work and punish firms gave up tax. Consequently, shadow activity, undeclared work, tax evasion, survive at rate one minus rho. From the supply side, there, is, there are no productive differences. This, this, this is a neutral hypothesis because the previous work usually assumed che, uh, that uh, workers in the formal sector are more human capital, are more productive than workers in the shadow sector. But uh, uh, nowadays, uh, there are very uh, workers with human capital can unfortunately work in the shadow sector. Job search, job search and directed. Uh, uh, directed job search, in my opinion, is an unrealistic hypothesis because it is implied to rate of unemployment for give an example. This is this, uh, the search and matching process. The only thing uh, che, um, uh, that change with respect to the benchmark framework uh, um, è uh, the, the presence of job vacancy in the shadow sector. Alpha uh, is the employee elasticity, quindi uh, we, have, we have the matching function, labor market tightness for the two sector. Note che the unemployment rate is the same, quindi we have two labor market tightness, one for each sector, but the unemployment rate is the same. What, what is the, the real, uh, this is the, the, the real uh, condition, the real situation. We have the probability of filling a job vacancy increasing in decreasing in the labor market tightness and the probability of finding a job increases in labor market tightness. Um, the value function of work of a worker are uh, the following. Uh, the main uh, novelty uh, uh, the possibility the, uh, to work in the, in the informal sector, the uh, worker in the, in the formal sector should, be, should pay a tax, but the worker in the, the shadow sector survive at the rate one minus rho, where rho is the audit, audit rate. This implies uh, that uh, worker in the shadow sector have two job destruction rate. The usually job destruction rate, for economic reason, the Poisson rate delta, plus the audit rate. We have the value function of a firm. Of course, the profit function is the same. There is one firm, mixed firm, but the value of a job vacancy is a different between the two sectors. The, dif the difference regards the cost of consignment. In, in, in the formal sector is the administrative cost, the registration cost, bureaucracy in general. Why in the shadow sector, the cost of consignment regard job vacancy. Quindi, uh, then not in the profit function of a firm, but the, cons the cost of consignment appears in the value of a job vacancy in the shadow sector. Usually, uh, a firm pay tax on the declared income, pay a penalty for tax evasion, and pay wage in the two sector. Firm behavior, the first case result under hypothesis one and three. We have three standard results. I uh, focus on the, on the final result. Note that tax, the effect of taxation on the firm's behavior is a, priori, is a priori ambiguous because taxation increases both the marginal cost of 
uh, operating in the shadow sector, but it reduces the cost, uh, the benefit, but it, it increases the benefit in the operating in the shadow sector. In this case, tax audit emerge as the main control variable because make the sign of the relation between taxation and shadow income ambiguous. And then, as a result, the relation between taxation and shadow income is a priori ambiguous and depend on tax audit. Wage differentials, uh, second K result under hypothesis, uh, hypothesis two. The wage differential is not necessarily positive as uh, happen in the usual model, usual search and matching model with the shadow economy, because the wage differential depends on both the bargaining power of work and the tax audit rate, namely the riskiness of shadow activity. In this slide, I show my calibration uh, che, uh, that show, uh, I think, uh, interesting result because uh, the bargain power of worker positively affect the wage differential, whereas tax audit negative affect the wage differential. Not that when the bargain power of a worker is low and tax audit rate is uh, high, the last row of the table, the wage differential is negative, namely, the wage in the shadow sector is higher than the wage in the formal sector. This result is consistent with the hypothesis that, that uh, worker with human capital can work in the shadow sector. The unemployment is the third key result, not that okay, the relation between the unemployment rate and the job destruction rate, the last formula in the slide is a priori ambiguous. And again, it, this the result depend on the audit rate. If the audit rate is higher than the job destruction rate, the relation between unemployment and job destruction is positive. This means that a high audit rate increases the unemployment both directly and indirectly through the job destruction rate. Labor market tightness in this model, this model depicts uh, a relation between the bargain power of worker and labor market tightness with respect to the standard framework of search and matching model that depicts instead a relation between labor market tightness and wage. Note that in this labor market model, the role of a bargain power is strong because it affects the relation between labor market tightness, but it also affects the wage differential. I arrive at the main conclusion. Tax audit remains the key tool for trying to explain this complex, a priori ambiguous relationship between shadow economy and labor market outcome. Of course, tax audit has both positive and negative effect. Tax audit reduces shadow income, but increases unemployment. The relation between taxation and shadow income depends on tax audit. The effect of the job destruction rate on unemployment depends on tax audit. The wage differential in the two sector depends on tax audit. Finally, for uh, reason of space, I, uh, I can not show this uh, conclusion. The high cost, the comparison between the registry cost, the bureaucracy in the formal sector and the cost of consignment a job vacancy in the shadow sector represent the main cause of the emergency of shadow job activity, job vacancy and uh, to the unemployed worker, a undeclared work and tax evasion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Gaetano. <clears throat>
Again, you were also on time. Thank you very much uh, for paying attention to this. So uh, before we go to our third presenter, Sasha Hokam, let me just ask whether you, any anyone from the audience has any questions, comments, or remarks to Gaetano. Uh, by the way, like I know the, the schedule is tight, maybe uh, it's very it's not very easy to uh, make a discussion in this tight schedule. That is why I will be sharing emails of our contributors uh, with everyone after the session ends, after the workshop ends, so that uh, you can also maybe send your individual comments or suggestions to all presenters after the workshop. Uh, okay, so let's continue with Sasha then, if Sasha is ready. I already gave co-host privileges to Sasha, okay. Uh, Hi. Hello. So, um, yeah. Um, you can see the slides, all? Well? Yes. 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 Okay. So, thank you very much. So, uh, I will talk today uh, uh, about a literature review um, and uh, of agent-based models, and um, uh, with respect to this. Uh, uh, I shortly motivate, then uh, I think all of you know the Becker's uh, economics of crime theory and the Ellingham Central approach. And then I will give a brief overview. And then uh, I will uh, also uh, tell you a little bit about the investigating the structure of these functions that are possible. And then I give a conclusion and an outlook. So with respect to the motivation, um, there are many ways to analyze tax evasion, uh, like experiments, agent-based simulations, and uh, uh, other parts. Um, what I'm thinking about is uh, what kind of utility functions uh, can be used in these computerized agent-based models of tax evasion and, and non-compliance. Of course, there are other uh, options uh, to model um, uh, uh, tax evasion uh, uh, in, a, in a computer. So for instance, econophysics, uh, uh, then there was a paper of, by Davis et al uh, with systems of differential equations and uh, also Markov uh, decision processes uh, and also genetic, uh, genetic algorithms uh, by Hemberg et al. So, um, but I will focus on utility functions here. Uh, this is the uh, uh, ellingham sample approach uh, from the 1970s. Uh, I think I don't need to go into detail here because that's a standard approach. And um, if you if you now um, uh, look in, into the literature review, um, I figured out. So the first paper by Mitona and Patelli in 2000, uh, who computerized, uh, analyzed uh, uh, tax evasion, they did not specify it in detail their utility function. And then in the early papers, uh, we have uh, basically linear functions. So, um, but these linear functions uh, cause problems because you have a zero uh, one decision if you uh, um, then model tax evasion with these kind of linear uh, utility functions. And then later on, uh, other uh, functions have been tested. So for, in uh, for instance, exponential functions, root functions, power functions, and so on. Uh, and uh, these have all some problems. So for instance, with respect to the linear, uh, uh, utility function, you have uh, a marginal, a marginal utility that is uh, violated so that you get a zero one decision. And with respect to if you use, uh, for instance, these uh, functions, uh, these root functions, uh, you can get negative values and then you get uh, uh, weird results. So, and therefore, um, I have a paper out with uh, um, where I have also. Uh, defined a set of Allingham sample functions. So what kind of functions you can generally use. And therefore um, you have uh, um, uh, here, um, you can test if it works uh, for uh, positive numbers. And um, then uh, you can also define these Allingham sample functions. This is a recent paper for me. And uh, then you can also define a set of Allingham sample functions. And, uh, the, here you can uh, do some algebra on these uh, uh, on these functions. So if you have two functions, you can combine these two functions and get a third function that also works. So 
and with respect to this, you can now check um, if uh, the um, the utility functions uh, you have in these kind of agent-based uh, models, if these um, um, uh, functions work also in this literature that I have found uh, on agent-based modeling. So if you go now here, um, you have what I said, the first paper by Mituna and Patelli, uh, they have um, uh, not specified their functions uh, in detail. So um, that you cannot say any, any comment here. And with respect to the early papers from Blomquist uh, and Antunes and Korboff and Zabo et al., they all use a linear function. And these linear functions are not really an Ellingham Sandbo function because you get these zero one decision. And um, these are, but they are uh, in the set of Ellingham Sandbo functions because uh, uh, you have the, um, the identity uh, and uh, zero, uh, which you need uh, to have a set. So therefore, it's the linear functions are some kind of a borderline case. So because you get these zero, one decision. So, and um, then you have uh, an exponential function. If you use exponential function, you have all these criteria are fulfilled. So, um, and then, uh, if you have a root function, uh, you can also um, have um, these different uh, different kinds. So sometimes it's an LNM sample function if you guarantee that you only use positive values. So uh, therefore you cannot have something that you evade more taxes that you can pay in this uh, this period. So then it could get you could get negative values and then you get uh, uh, that uh, the uh, uh, requirements are not fulfilled. And then with respect to the power function, you can also think of these. And uh, there's a recent paper by Dilla et al. They also use exponential functions and here it also works. So, and here I come to my conclusion um, with respect to uh, the overview of uh, utility, I gave an overview of utility functions for agent-based uh, tax evasion models. And um, I, have shown that ex exponential functions are less problematic than linear utility functions. So if you use linear utility functions, it's a, it's a very special case and you get these zero one decision. And um, so, and further with respect to the findings, you are not restricted uh, to tax evasion and uh, uh, non-compliance. So for instance, uh, I was also involved in a project where we uh, applied this Ellingham Sandwell uh, approach uh, to doping in professional sports and did there also some simulations. And um, here I would like to thank for your attention. And I think I was a little bit fast. So I will save a little bit time. So thank you very much. Yes, we did. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so since this was the last presentation of the first session and we have time for about 10 minutes, before the next session, any questions on Sasha or on others actually? Not necessarily on Sasha, but on others as well. <laughs> okay, I don't see any. So let's, okay then, give a 10 minute break because we are supposed to start at quarter past two, my time, or uh, you know, GMT plus three. So we can start in about 10 minutes. Next session, we'll have three presentations. Actually, next session, we'll have two presentations because the last presenter, uh, Professor Anul Duman, uh, is sick. So she won't be able to join the session for today, even though she has the chapter ready, uh, but she won't be able to present it today. So we'll have only two presentations. So we'll, we'll still also have maybe a break after the second session as well. So then let's give a break. So we'll be here, back here in about 10 minutes.
Um, okay. Hmm. So Vasilios International Hellenic University, where is it located? Is it in Athens? No, uh, it's uh, in northern Greece, in uh, Thessaloniki, and uh, generally in Kavala, the region of uh, Macedonia. I see. So, and you, where are you located? Are you located in Thessaloniki? In Thessaloniki, yes. Okay. Okay, maybe Gamze, you can start. Gamze Özyalaman from Eskişehir Osman Gazi University in Turkey. Maybe Gamze, you can start sharing your screen just to check. To check it out. So we will have two presenters in this session. The first presenter is going to be Gamze Özyalaman from Eskişehir Osman Gazi University. She will be presenting her joint paper with Colin Williams uh, on examining the extent and distribution of unregistered employment in Europe. And then after her, Vasileos Vlakos uh, will be presenting a joint paper with Aristis Pitsenis on evidence from the shadows, unreported income, undeclared work, and tax morale in Greece. So maybe since it is right now quarter past, Gamze Özyalaman, the floor is yours. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to talk to you. This is Gamze Özyalaman from Eskişehir Osman Gazi University. It's a joint study with Colin Williams. Uh, the topic of my presentation is examining the extent and distribution of unregistered employment in Europe. Uh, sorry. Uh, I would like to start with uh, informal economy first. Uh, you know, uh, it's a worldwide phenomena, uh, of course, and uh, there is a voluminous uh, literature uh, on the informal economy. Many studies examine who operates in the informal economy. Uh, the others uh, examine its component parts and evaluate different types of uh, work in the informal economy. And of course, the informal economy is composed of various economic practices. Uh, one of them is uh, unregistered employment. So uh, we would like to contribute to knowledge on different types of work in the informal economy. So uh, our aim of this paper is to evaluate the extent and distribution of unregistered employment. Uh, and uh, we can define uh, unregistered employment. How can we define it? Uh, we can define it a dependent employee has no written contract or terms of reference. Uh, and uh, tackling unregistered employment is uh, very high on the uh, policy agenda of uh, supranational organizations and many governments, both Europe and beyond, actually. Uh, why? Uh, because there are uh, lots of negative impacts of unregistered employment, not only the employees without written contracts, but also on formal employees, uh, formal businesses, uh, governments and uh, societies. Let's look at these uh, negative uh, impacts. Uh, first, uh, unregistered employees suffer poor working conditions. Formal employees indirectly suffer, but they still suffer uh, because uh, it weakens trade union power and effective uh, collective bargaining. Formal businesses suffer uh, unfair competition. Governments suffer uh, because they lost their ability to control uh, the quality of working conditions, collecting uh, social insurance uh, contributions and collect taxes. And uh, societies also suffer uh, because it limits the ability to foster social cohesion and social inclusion. So uh, we know that uh, unregistered employment has still received little attention, uh, and then uh, we would like to contribute this area. Uh, and we will show the evidence from the 2021 European Working Condition Surveys, uh, actually. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this is the last version of these surveys. Uh, the survey has been expanded to include over 70,000 uh, workers in uh, 36 European countries. Uh, uh, these countries are uh, European Union member states, 
the United Kingdom, Norway, Switzerland, Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, Montenegro, North Macedonia, and uh, Serbia. We will use uh, logistic regression analysis to analyze this data, and uh, we would like to capture some uh, significant relationship uh, between the propensity to uh, unregistered employment and uh, various individual household and firm related uh, characteristics. Uh, actually, uh, I would like to show you our empirical results, uh, but uh, our data set uh, has new re newly uh, released, uh, and uh, I have already get in touch with uh, to access the data, but uh, they haven't sent me my username yet, so uh, I can show you our empirical results. Uh, but uh, we would like to capture some significant relationship between uh, the uh, propensity to work with no contract and uh, various individual household and firm related characteristics. And then uh, we, uh, sorry, we uh, discuss theoretical and policy implications. Uh, thank you for listening to me. My presentation is uh, finished. Thank you. Thank you, Gamze. Uh, again, let me ask uh, whether there are any comments, questions, feedback. As I said, like I understand it's quite difficult uh, given this tight schedule, maybe to have a um, you know, fruitful discussion uh, after the presentations, but I will also share, as I said, the email addresses of all presenters with the whole group so that you can also maybe send your feedbacks or questions to the presenters directly via email. But I see Baun Yuba, she's raising her hand. Maybe she has a question. Yes, may I ask, uh, is there a difference in the definition of unregistered work and uh, uh, informal employment? Uh... Actually, uh, informal employment uh, is uh, very large, uh, maybe we, uh, we can define it largely, but uh, our un unregistered employment, uh, it's, we, we can define it, a dependent employee has no written contract. Uh, unregistered, we, we would like to, yeah, uh, actually uh, we can define it like this, but uh, informal employment is a very large def uh, definition, actually. Uh, if I say uh, unregistered employment is a subset of informal employment, would it be correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, anything else? Uh, Vasilios? Yes, thank you. Uh, just one question, because uh, I would like to ask you if uh, you are going to include in uh, your research, uh, are you going to research the phenomenon of uh, undeclared work in total, or are you going to look in partial undeclared work as, as well? Because I have seen that partial declared work in uh, developed economies, it's a very uh, large phenomenon. Uh... So the question is whether you are whether the authors are differentiating between totally undeclared work and partially undeclared. Partially, actually. Yes. So you partially, are looking at okay. partially. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Gamze. Uh, thank you. So now I think we can give the floor. Again, we are ahead of time. Uh, so you can use your time as much as you want, Vasileos, because we have more than 30 minutes actually if you want to use the whole time uh so the floor is yours Vasilios. so let me okay i can use the search screen option can i do that yes you can yeah you can directly start sharing all right i believe you can see my pdf yes. presentation yes. so just in brief to introduce again myself i'm Vasilios blajos from international Hellenic university in northern greece and uh, this is uh, uh, I work with uh, my co-author uh, Aristides Bitzenis from the University of Macedonia, also in uh, Thessaloniki, northern Greece. Uh, we are going to uh, write a chapter about uh, undeported income, undeclared work, and tax morale in Greece. Uh, this may be 
uh, different uh, themes which uh, should not be explored just uh, in one chapter. But uh, what we are planning to do is to look into what we know uh, until now uh, from research from uh, the previous two decades, and then to present uh, some uh, findings from uh, the Sado Economy Observatory, uh, uh, in which I'm uh, a member since uh, the beginning of the previous decade. So tax evasion and the size of the informal economy Greece, uh, the discussion about uh, tax evasion and the size of the informal economy actually dates back to the 1990s. And uh, however, it gained significant international attention during the Greek sovereign debt crisis. So we're going uh, approximately 50 years back and we had a triple crisis here in Greece and other European countries. Uh, we had a sovereign debt crisis and uh, a bank and, uh, and uh, an income crisis as well. Uh, the focus uh, since uh, the uh, regained interest has been on whether Greek uh, authorities can increase uh, tax receipts and informal activities uh, from informal activities, which can be uh, formal, and whether, of course, informal activities can be formal. So it was uh, most uh, a discussion about uh, policy measures, which uh, could uh, uh, gain uh, inform uh, get, uh, transform informal activities into formal uh, economic activities in uh, the economy. Uh, the problem in Greece uh, by presenting uh, the results from uh, the shadow economy from uh, estimates of the famous mimic model of uh, uh, from Professor Snyder is, uh, as we can see, that uh, Greece sits at the bottom end of uh, regarding the size of the shadow economy. It's approximately 24%. Uh, this is uh, just an, uh, an average uh, uh, for the last uh, 30 years. And uh, in, it may deviate uh, up or down, but uh, it remains uh, approximately at about 25%. Uh, so it is a big problem. And uh, I could also show you, and you may already know that uh, uh, at other uh, aspects of uh, unreported income, also Greece uh, is also at the bottom line. Uh, regarding the size of unreported income. For example, we could look at the uh, VAT evasion, and there we could see that Greece also has a very large size of VAT evasion vis-a-vis -vis other uh, European member states. However, this uh, picture gives uh, a very good uh, glimpse of the problem uh, in Greece uh, over the last three decades. Uh, now to go into the aim of our chapter is to investigate the effect of economic downturns because we are going to look uh, in uh, 12 uh, to 13 years uh, time of uh, which Greece has been experiencing economic downturns because of the sovereign debt crisis, which I already uh, mentioned. And of course, because of the pandemic, which we, we have experienced since uh, 2020. And uh, uh, how these uh, economic downturns uh, affect on the size of the Greek informal economy. Uh, our uh, pro the, our uh, uh, process will be twofold. We aim to conduct a systematic review of the literature in order to uh, see what do we really know about uh, the determinants of the Greek uh, informal economy and uh, how uh, we get estimates about the size of the informal economy in Greece. And then we are going to look uh, into this finding to compare these findings with the sizes of unreported income and undeclared work and of course estimates about the level of tax morale in Greece from uh, uh, survey data which we have collected from approximately 50,000 questionnaires uh, fr throughout these years from the Sado Economy uh, Observatory. Now regarding the systematic review of the literature uh, we have uh, initiated this process uh, through our research in uh, the Scopus database. We have found uh, 252 documents by using the keywords Greece, tax, uh, and evasion or morale. We have 58 documents. And by looking into uh, unreported, undeclared, or informal or shadow work or employment or income, we have uh, already uh, found uh, 211 documents. Of course, we are already adding into this uh, document reports from uh, IMF and ILO, which uh, have been published uh, in the previous decade uh, regarding the size of 
and reporting uh, income increase and the uh, other uh, unregistered activities. And of course, working papers and other publications which are not uh, found in the Scopus database and uh, of course, as mentioned in uh, this report. Uh, some working papers are from the back of Greece, for example, and are very interesting. And uh, we categorize these documents according to the research questions, which uh, they are uh, researching, uh, the data sample, the method, the variables, and of course, uh, their findings. And uh, uh, we will use the findings from the literature survey to, uh, as I said, uh, to compare them with uh, data collected from uh, questionnaires from uh, the Sado Economy Observatory. Uh, the questionnaires uh, are themed uh, around individual and firm tax compliance, uh, corruption in terms of uh, bribing, tax and social security contributions evasion, informal employment, and uh, do-it-yourself activities. Now, the, with the exception of bribing, uh, one of the uh, themes of the questionnaires, uh, we aim to collect uh, data on informal activities that are legal, but are, not, uh, but are deliberately concealed from public authorities in order to avoid the payment of taxes or social security contributions or meeting legal standards and of course, complying with uh, other administrative uh, procedures. This is uh, just to mention on where we are going to focus in terms of uh, the informal uh, activities, uh, informal economic activities in Greece. Now, in order to be more precise, uh, I'll uh, present a table from uh, uh, a paper uh, published uh, last year in the Journal of Economic Surveys. I have uh, a blue uh, shadow here theme of the underground production. This is uh, a theme from the OECD regarding productive activities that are legal but are deliberately concealed for public authorities to avoid the payment of taxes and uh, the rest of activities I just mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, uh, and this is the core theme on which the questionnaires are centered uh, to. And we are going to present frequencies and descriptive statistics of the size of uh, unreported income, the size of undeclared work, and the level of tax morale, estimates, of course, from uh, the questionnaire data, and compare them with the findings of the systematic review of the literature. Uh, before, uh, uh, just for conclusion, to mention that uh, the database that we have from the Sado Economy Observatory is a, a, a big, uh, uh, many times bigger than the samples that the previous uh, research have used. Then I'm talking about uh, macroeconomic uh, surveys. Thank you very much. I'm open to any suggestions and uh, questions about our uh, proposed uh, work for the chapter. Thank you, Vasileos. <coughs> Sorry again for from everyone for my voice, which sounds horrible. Um, thank you. So, any questions from the audience? Any questions, comments? <coughs> again, like you know, for for latecomers, uh, let me tell you that I will share contact information of all contributors so that uh, maybe we can communicate after the session uh, and ask our questions and send our comments to the contributors. Thank you very much, Vasileos. So Thank you. again, we are ahead of time. So since our third presenter is not here for the session, as I told you earlier, so let's give a break now again. Until uh, can I, thank you. Can I just ask briefly and, uh, uh, is there going to be a link where we can see the contacts or uh, some info? Yes, yes I will uh, share it. I will share it with everyone after the session. I have all of your email addresses, so I will be oh, sending okay. you uh, the contact information of all contributors after the workshop. Okay, thank you. I will also send you the uh, recording link in case you want to watch the recording later. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's meet in about 25 minutes. Thank you very much. So again, we just are now in a break. We'll meet again at 3 p.m. GMT plus three. 
So in about 20, 27 minutes. Thank you. And maybe like, you know, while we are waiting, let me just share the workshop program with you. Uh, so that, that, you know, this can stay here now. Again, okay. So Adam, maybe you can start sharing your screen. So we have four presentations in this session. Uh, the first paper will be by Adam Yaguzelveran and Idir Yoksal. Uh, the title of the paper is A Macroeconomic Perspective on Gender and Informality. Then this is going to be followed by another paper by Christian Berger and Nina Sophie Fritsch, uh, where the title is Gender Inequalities in the Informal Economy. Then David Anzola, who is not here yet, hopefully will join soon, uh, will present about informality and well being. And then finally, there's another paper. So there are four papers in the session. So we have one hour allocated for the session by Gülay Günlük Şenesen and Banu Yobaş on comparative intersectoral analysis of formal and informal employment by gender in Turkey. I would say Turkey, but I think now the official name is Turkey. So they also, the authors also use the new official name, Turkey. Anyway, so let's start. Uh, Adem Yavuz uh, the floor is yours if you are ready. Uh, thanks so much. Greetings from Turkey. Uh, I assume everyone can see my slides. Excellent. Okay, so yes, yes, perfectly. Uh, Dr. Egin already mentioned, uh, but I would like to emphasize that this is a joint work with Idil Göksel from Izmir University of Economics. She was planning to attend this workshop as well. Unfortunately, uh, she has another meeting at the very same time. So I will do my best uh, to uh, present the outline. Uh, so. I hope I can manage. Yes, here we go. Uh, so uh, I think maybe macroeconomic uh, is like sort of maybe a very assertive title. It could be better to say that a general review on the nexus of informality and gender. Uh, so it's a very broad uh, review paper. We are going to deal with uh, different aspects of this nexus, uh, the nexus of gender informality by paying attention to labor force participation, growth uh, inequalities, and also the economic crisis. So uh, uh, I think one important uh, issue about this uh, paper is that uh, whenever it is possible, uh, we are trying to emphasize uh, different economic uh, schools, their perspective. Uh, because uh, it's a general critique that neoclassical macroeconomic policy is not always, but generally gender blind, or at least even though if they argue that it's not gender blind, uh, the perspective, the understanding of gender is different when it comes to neoclassical macroeconomic models and feminist macroeconomic policies. Uh, yes, there's a, a growing uh, literature on the gender wage gap. Uh, we try to sort of like mention about it as well. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm not saying that this review will pay attention to these other intersections of gender, ethnicity, and class, but it is worth to mention that we cannot think of them in, in, uh, independent from each other. Uh, that's another issue. And also, it is very important to uh, move away from just paid labor markets and to emphasize that women disproportionately shoulder the burden uh, because they perform uh, even in most advanced uh, or let's say yes advanced countries even in Scandinavian countries they still perform more unpaid housework uh, that's also a very important point to uh, discuss uh, so I think I can skip this part relatively much faster particularly considering that we have very short time to present uh, I believe this is very straightforward for uh, particularly such a selected group of uh, listeners, uh, participants. Uh, but yes, uh, basically we see this uh, informalization uh, becomes a serious issue with the late 1970s or at least with the early 1980s. Uh, we see a significant impact of IMF structural adjustment programs. Uh, and of course, uh, this a change in the economic paradigm has a significant impact on uh, women and their uh, you know, involvement in informal sector as well. Uh, of course, uh, feminization of labor is a very old, very well-known concept. And I should say, in fact, now it's a sort of like 
mainstream concept, uh, but in this chapter, uh, we introduce or we prefer to use this relatively new concept uh, to better emphasize the, this like the interdependence between interconnection between uh, feminization of labor and informalization. That's why we say that fem informalization of labor and uh, we would like to you know talk about the, what caused that, the demand and supply factors. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, when it comes to this, you know, particularly export-oriented sectors, uh, we see that employers uh, have tendency to uh, prefer you know, hiring the male workers, and there are a uh, few uh, major reasons for that. The first one is, of course, uh, most of the time, of course, I should say maybe always, women are paid less compared to men, uh, and also, uh, actually, Employers take another benefits in terms of uh, reaching higher labor productivity. It is basically due to this uh, intermittent uh, employment of women uh, due to pregnancy, you know, uh, breastfeeding, and for some other reasons during their uh, employment. Uh, that means, you know, like the you can still increase productivity without like the uh, paying more uh, because women cannot easily be promoted because of this. Uh, let's say pauses in their work life. Uh, and of course, uh, from the like the supply perspective, we see that this uh, highly flexible uh, work is, uh, you know, quote unquote, uh, fits better uh, for women because they may prefer working at home based on this like home-based work uh, to deal with those unpaid uh, household works as well. Uh, and uh, I would like to note that's perhaps uh, unnecessary, but uh, as I uh, mentioned, at least try to be perfectly clear at the beginning of this presentation, uh, this is a very general uh, review uh, article. Uh, that's why it covers so many topics without, uh, you know, discussing in detail. Uh, so uh, that's why, you know, like the, I am also uh, paying attention to these very broad issues, which are very, very straightforward or what's basic for everyone. Uh, then what's the contribution of this chapter? I believe uh, one of them is, as I said, uh, you know, whenever it's possible, we try to emphasize, you know, how uh, different feminist macro models, uh, you know, like the deal with this issue. For example, uh, later I will talk about that when it comes to this human capital, it is important to understand this neoclassical understanding of human capital and also how feminist macroeconomics uh, you know, deal with it or how do they understand what they mean by that? Uh, or when it comes to like the, this macroeconomic models, you know, like the how can we include informality in terms of like the Kalashkin or uh, Caldorian models? These are going to be, I think, uh, some minor contributions of this uh, review, very general review article. Uh, I would like to skip this part. Uh, this is again a very general issue, you know, like the uh, sort of determinants of the labor force uh, participation rate. Uh, here, as I mentioned, feminization of labor is a very important concept going back all the way to uh, Guy Standings. Uh, I think, it, yeah, I don't know. I think he introduced the concept. Uh, but as we said, you know, like the, we cannot think of, uh, uh, you know, like the without the importance of informality. Here, it's important to note that uh, the relationship between trade expansion and feminization is not definitive and uniform. Uh, there are some recent research, uh, you know, like the uh, underscore this important issue. Uh, I think I would like to skip this part so that we can have more time uh, to, if there is any question or to leave more time for other presenters. Uh, so uh, I can actually skip that part too. It is true that, you know, there are like the, you know, particularly when it comes to policy uh, recommendation, I think it's very important to uh, talk about the childcare subsidies, uh, paid parental leave. Uh, that's the key issue in terms of the uh, female labor force participation. These are the key issue to uh, like to create more opportunities for women in the paid work. Uh, these are very well uh, known issues, and there are some uh, highly advanced uh, macroeconomic models uh, that show uh, the impact of, let's say, childcare subsidies uh, or other kind of this, like the fiscal policies that targets women uh, in terms of both women employment and 
uh, income distribution as well as economic growth, uh, both at theoretical and empirical uh, level. Uh, you know, uh, mostly they based on uh, Kaleshkin growth models. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, this uh, very important uh, relationship between informality and economic growth have been discussed both by neoclassical economists as well as feminist economics. Uh, and they, of course, argue that there is both direct and indirect impact. Uh, and uh, because the first one is that uh, there is this sort of like the uh, selection problem in terms of the pool uh, when you exclude women workers. Uh, that's sort of like the direct impact. Uh, and indirect impact uh, is in terms of the uh, when you invest in women. Basically, women have tendency to spend the money uh, more on household and kids compared to men. So that is like the very same dollar that goes to women instead of men is more likely to be spent on uh, children. And that's a key issue in terms of the human capital. It's a key issue in terms of the uh, increase in productive capacity of the economy in the long term. And that's how gender equality impacts uh, economic growth in the long term. Uh, and the key difference, I think, between, uh, of course, I mean, I don't want to say key difference, but one of the key difference between uh, neoclassical growth models and feminist growth models here in that, uh, perhaps their understanding of human capital, uh, because when it comes to feminist models, uh, I think their uh, their approach is much broader. Instead of just, I mean, uh, of course it's common. They are also talking about human capital, but perhaps they go uh, beyond uh, that and also say it's not just about human capital, but it's sort of like the capacities uh, by referring Amartya Sen's uh, capabilities approach. Uh, I think that's important because. Uh, it's not just about like the you know those differences, their causes and consequences, but also uh, to you know to try to show more uh, long-term uh, differences between uh, those economic policies in terms of their impact on men and women. Uh, for example, like uh, just like the increase in female labor force participation due to increase in education in women is like a well-known aspect. Uh, but if you uh, stop, if you just discuss this part of the, uh, you know, economy policies, uh, then you fail uh, to show that, uh, you know, like the, if you don't compensate that change uh, in terms of the increase uh, of wage of women, uh, that means if you don't reduce the gender wage gap, actually you just like the uh, deepen uh, the exploitation of women uh, in that sense as well. So uh, no need to discuss those details. I know maybe even I'm running out of time. Uh, so uh, when it comes to inequality, I think there is no need to discuss that uh, because other uh, presenters probably will have much, much better, uh, more detailed discussion about the issue. As I said, this is a very like the general uh, sort of like the umbrella uh, uh, review uh, article for the book. Uh, so. Uh, we are also uh, going to pay, uh, you know, particular attention to Diane Elson's works uh, as well uh, when it comes to this impact of uh, economic crisis uh, uh, to try to also make connection with informality as well. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm almost there. I'm actually planning to finish, uh, which is my last slide. Uh, so uh, I think uh, the this chapter, we are planning to finish this chapter uh, uh, by paying, you know, like the particular attention to this very recent uh, feminist macroeconomic models, as I said, uh, where the scholars uh, both show, you know, like the, this relationship, or let's say the impact of like the child care policies or expansionary fiscal policy, you know, particularly uh, targets uh, women's well-being, uh, both at theoretical and empirical level. Uh, you know, like the, or I should say, like sort of public investment in care. So we are going to pay attention to uh, those issues uh, to uh, try, you know, try to provide a more broader, uh, broader uh, review, not just in terms of the concepts, but broader also in terms of the different economic uh, perspectives to this very important nexus of gender and informality. Uh, I don't know if I was. Uh, that's all I want to say at this for now. Uh, I would be happy to respond to any questions.
if you may have. So thank you so much. Thank you, Adam. Just on time. So we have only one minute for question and answer if there are any. <laughs> Again, for latecomers, I will share your contact information with all other workshop attendees and you'll be able to also send your questions or comments to the contributors later after the workshop via email if you want because again, we are really on a tight schedule we have a lot of contributors therefore uh, we have to be really very strict uh, about timing so okay thank you adam now just on time so now we can i think start with the second presentation by nina sophie fritsch uh, joint paper with christian berger uh, the floor is yours thank you Uh, thank, thank you so much for the great uh, organization. Uh, Christian, we have difficulties in hearing you. Uh, it's very... It's, maybe your connection is not really... Christian, Christian, sorry, we can't hear you. And Yes, we can't hear Christian. Uh, Christian, uh, if you can hear us, we can't hear you. And uh, okay, I just messaged Christian. I think now he got my message. Uh, maybe we can just give a minute to Christian so that maybe he can switch connections if needed. Or maybe otherwise we can continue with Nina. Uh, or maybe while we are waiting, we can jump to the third presentation first. Uh, and then, you know, once Christian establishes a better connection, uh, he can present that. Yeah, okay, thank you. I'll just talk to him. He is trying to start up um, the, the connection again. Okay, so maybe like we, let's continue with David. David, if you are ready, can we continue with you first? Yes, yeah, right. Okay, okay, let's do it with you. So let's let's uh, have your presentation first and then we can go back to Christian and Nina's presentation if that's okay with you. Yeah, it's fine. <clears throat> okay, perfect. So let's start with your presentation. The floor is yours, David. Thanks. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Adrian Sola. I work at University at the Forsyth in Bogota, Colombia. And my proposed chapter is on informality and well-being. Uh, so in general, we have some literature on informality uh, that usually consider, or we usually consider informality a social bad. And we have evidence that it increases workers' vulnerabilities because of low wages, no wages, because of difficulties for uh, job mobility, social mobility, also poor, unsafe working conditions, among others. In the same way, it also affects uh, organizational productivity. For example, these workers have low human capital, have difficulties to accumulate capital, to mobilize that capital. It's not very technology intensive. There's uh, difficulties to use technology in a proper way. It's also uh, difficult to escalate these businesses. And finally, it has an impact on state's revenue and also has an impact on governance sometimes because there are some illegal elements, criminal elements involved in uh, informality governance. So in general, because of that, over the years, we have informality policy that is mostly informed by two independent, but um, at the same time interconnected, uh, rationals are mostly economics. So most policy centers centers on uh, improving conditions, economic conditions and economic outputs for uh, individuals and organizations. And at the same time, they focuses some most time, most of the time on increasing uh, the state's uh, revenue. But more recent research that uh, has started to consider informal workers and informal occupations have um, unveiled 
that this formal informal distinction or dichotomy is uh, oversimplifies working arrangement and conditions. Yeah, so not necessarily informal workers are in worse conditions. For example, if they are employed, they might be in better conditions than self-employed formal workers. They have also shown that there are different informalities. Uh, so for example, in some cases, informal arrangements, they just mimic formal arrangements. It's just that they are not properly formalized. In some others, there are completely different working arrangements. It also works different uh, depending on the country and the degree. So for example, gig work, is very different in workers in, in countries where access to health depends on uh, working status. And most importantly, I think it has shown that there is this um, subjective understanding of the effect of their informality. So people uh, choose to become or remain informal based on this subjective understanding of their informality. And in some cases, we can also see how they act uh, similarly or different based on this subjective understanding of informality and how they sometimes also act collectively. For example, when there is some contentious or identity politics, uh, in the case of those occupations that depend on public space, then naturally pushing against those policies that try to push them out of the uh, public space. So I think that, especially in the future and with the recognition and the the increasing attention to actual conditions of informality and not just this very general distinction between the formal and informal sector. There's a way to getting more out of this subjective understanding of informality. And I believe that one of the aspects that is going to start becoming more popular is well being. So I'm talking about well being, but this is in fact a very large literature that combines several concepts. So happiness, welfare, quality of life, life satisfaction. Uh, wellness and in another level of things like human development, uh, poverty, etc. So, for example, in the previous um, presentation, sense capability approach would be included in that, right? Uh, so, well-being studies are very interesting because even though it's a very old literature, it's becoming more and more popular precisely because of understanding of subjective well-being. And the idea is how you can have a subjective informal like, oh, knowledge about subjective informal experience in general, but also about their well-being. And the reason why well-being has become so popular is because of this distinction between subjective and objective well-being. At the beginning, it was basically approach from an objective perspective that has to do with uh, improvements in life conditions. And that's how, especially when you consider the concept of welfare, how policy has been um, grounded for many decades. Yes, you can provide some uh, goods and services that will make people's lives better. And that's true to some extent. So it's definitely important to provide education, infrastructure, health. But um, especially in the second decade, at the second part of the 20th century, these uh, researchers realized that there was something more that's pe that people were considering so, uh, factors in terms of what makes them happy, what makes their uh, life fulfilling. And that's where the subjective uh, view of well-being appears. Right? It has to do with this subjective understanding of your life conditions. And it's interesting because it combines, uh, as you see there, positive and negative effect, which is an uh, emotional component of well-being, but also this cognitive uh, oral life satisfaction. Uh, so I think, and I, I, I see already some uh, informality research showing um, why this is important. So we can have some insights on informality based on this literature. For example, one of the reasons why informal workers do not formalize is because they don't necessarily prioritize economic outputs. So we see, for example, in informal workers, sometimes, especially when they're self-employed, they value uh, autonomy. They value the flexibility of their work and not necessarily their income. Uh, more, is, more interesting, though, I believe that there are some insights in terms of formalization. For example, the well-being literature has shown that individuals self enhance That's it, that they consider their situation more positive than they should. So sometimes if you see informal workers and you say, clearly they should formalize and they don't do it, maybe it's because they value their situation more positively than they should. Another mechanism that might prevent formalization has to do with the fact that this literature has shown that 
individuals uh, report higher well-being in unequal societies or individuals in bad conditions. Um, so again, this might be a reason why individuals in the uh, informal sector might decide to remain informal and not really try to formalize. There is as well this uh, bidirectional relationship, I think the informal, uh, the literature on informality uh, might also raise some questions for the literature on well-being. So, so far we know that well-being in general is U-shaped in terms of age. That's it, you are happier when you're young and when you're old. Uh, but when you consider the situation of informal workers, then clearly uh, it is possible that that is not the case because of the limited access to health, social protections, pension, and stuff. Uh, and we actually had a study here in Colombia where we found that people over 60 report significantly lower levels of subjective well-being. Um, also, it had, we know already that happy workers um, are more productive and usually earn more higher incomes, but the well-being literature also argues that happy people go on to earn higher incomes later in life. In the case of the in the case of informal workers, that might be difficult because of uh, the limitations in job mobility. And finally, uh, we know that market dynamics affect differently formal and informal workers. So, for example, uh, the threat of technification, automatization, uh, replacement that we have in the informal in the formal sector might not be the same in the informal sector. So, how is this going to affect in general? Uh, subjective perceptions of well-being in informal workers. Um, so at the end, I wanted to propose the idea, and I think it's going to be considered, the uh, well-being informed in informality policy. And the idea is that when you see well-being studies, they are um, arguing in general that social policies should more explicitly incorporate uh, considerations of well-being in the design implementation evalu evaluation and social policy. And they have like three major reasons for that. The first one is that distinction between subjective and objective well being and the ultimate goal of policy. And if the goal of policy is really to make people happy, then obviously, in the case of informality policy, we should consider how these other factors affect what, how important it is, for example, to, for informal workers to be autonomous, to be flexible. Um, uh, also, the knowledge that we have about these non-economic factors that society in general uh, values, and in the case of informal worker, for example, the two I just mentioned, autonomy and flexibility, how do they affect their overall well-being? And finally, uh, there's also this acknowledgement that I think is important that we have for several decades now uh, improvement in economic conditions worldwide, but not necessarily an improvement in well-being. And that has to do obviously with, with a lot of things, but the problem is how we incorporate this recognition and in informality policy. Like how can we help informal workers beyond uh, economic outputs, which is mostly where policies have been um, focused. And I think that's like the general idea of my chapter. Okay, thank you, David. You are also on time. Thank you very much for uh, paying attention to that. <clears throat> so do we have any comments for David's presentation from the audience? <clears throat> so if not, then uh, is Christian ready now? Uh, do you know Nina? Okay. So maybe, hope. okay, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well now. So maybe <clears throat> you can start sharing your screen, okay. Okay, thank you so much. Um, uh, my apologies for the uh, technical performance problems uh, earlier. Uh, thank you uh, also very much for the great organization around the volume and uh, the opportunity to present our contribution concept here today. We can really learn a lot from all of you. I'm going to start with a few uh, general remarks. Um, by informal economy, um, we mean uh, activities uh, that have a market value and would add to tax revenue and the GDP if they were recorded in one way or another, uh, as we all know, uh, and, and uh, as we all know, it, it is a global phen uh, phenomenon. Um, 
informal workers contribute uh, to economic and social development through market and non-market activities that are not uh, protected, regulated, well recognized or valued. Um, and the regional focus on our work is the area of the European Union, as this is uh, where our research um, interests and expertise lie. We will nevertheless try to establish global connections and references uh, where this makes sense and is uh, possible. Our contribution deals with a special focus on the informal economy, uh, the uh, gender aspects and gender inequalities. Um, fundamental and global gender specific issues such as sexual slavery, uh, trafficking in women, domestic violence and private uh, imprisonment reproductive control over women's bodies and economic deprivation of women's lives all can converge or are linked in uh, uh, are linked directly or indirectly with the informal uh, sector uh, from uh, illegalized activities like prostitution to legal ones like the field of domestic uh, and care work and uh, just to present you a few more great uh, gender lines uh, of informality. Women are the majority of the world's poor households, where a lot of informal uh, work takes place. Up to 80% of stateless, uh, stateless persons, uh, they do two thirds of the world's formal and informal work and are politically and economically mar marginalized. And uh, they all only receive a few percentages of the world's uh, overall income. Have little to no capital, their bodies are often um, violated and abused, and their voices are, if not suppressed, uh, less often heard. In reverse, uh, men dominate what is formally and informally produced uh, and dominate the conditions under, uh, under which production takes place. But men also work in the informal sector as well, disproportionately in some industries, uh, such as construction, transport, and criminal activities economic activities like pimping or money laundering. So on the structure and uh, direction of our contribution, um, only, only a few um, highlights. First, we will summarize social and economic theories in order to understand the informal economy in a gender perspective, um, what functions it serves, who participates in it and why inequalities um, like the um, described uh, emerge. Here we concentrate on the unequal division of society into private and public spheres, on mechanisms um, of inequality, production and reproduction, and the consequences of power relations between men and women. Thereafter, we summarize the state of research, while specifically focusing on prevailing inequalities in the informal fields, such as cleaning, caring, nursing, prostitution, and platform work. And uh, second, we put challenging uh, societal uh, dynamics and future trends uh, center stage, which were only accelerated by the effects and aftermath of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, increasing labor market flexibilization interventions of the last decades, and uh, changing uh, occupational structure and ongoing digitalization. We also broke some, uh, uh, brought some um, first insight uh, and at this point, we would like to present a few initial outlines of the content of our in, um, contribution. Um, since uh, the Industrial Revolution in Europe, economic production and social reproduction have not only been spatially separated, but also polarized. The former is done to secure material uh, existence and to, um, yeah, uh, in, in, in a, contra a contractual relationship, uh, it's, it, it's, uh, it is uh, financially remunerated and, associ and associated with men and masculinity. The latter is uh, based on care for other family members, compliance uh, with family duties, with moral. It is uh, not financially remunerated, but only associated with gratitude, uh, love, and associated with women and femininity. Though no significant social, political, or economic importance is attached to the domestic private sphere, although it creates the conditions, as we all know, for living and working, um, especially living and working in the public sphere. It is no a coincidence that we observe differences between women and men in the um, exercise of occupations. 
women uh, are increasingly found in commercial and personal service occupations, while men prefer technical occupations and also that work in typical, typical women's occupations is generally less paid than in men's occupations. That women uh, uh, than men earn extra money in part-time work or that men than women, women occupy more uh, management positions. So much for the formal side. On the informal side, mm -hmm. sex and gender are also not just relevant, but in our opinion, critical uh, and central aspects of the informal economy. This is because due to the simple but significant fact that women temporarily um, or for a longer period in the course of their lives work to a considerable extent in some form of subcontracting capacity, selling their labor outside the framework of regulated labor markets. For example, in the family business or in a marginal part-time employment and do not benefit uh, from any of full health and safety uh, protection. Moreover, a significant share of women do not sell uh, their labor at all because they do most of the unpaid care work in private households. Uh, for their own relatives or as 24-hour um, personal care workers. And they do quite a lot of uh, other forms of uh, informal work, such as subsistence, uh, community and voluntary work, emotional, effective and sex work. Under the conditions of contemporary capitalism, uh, COVID and multiple crisis, the pressure on women uh, to perform reproductive work either unpaid or to pass it on to migrant women is increasing. That this is also a very uh, important aspect of our contribution. A so-called transnational household is emerging, especially in Europe, increasingly organized through the use of digital technologies. So due to high work pressure and time constraints, uh, the domestic work of well-earning dual earner households is outsourced to migrant workers who rise uh, socially as single female breadwinners in the context of uh, their origin, but at the same time accept uh, some form or some kind of dequalification and usually find precarious living and working conditions in the destination context. The predominantly informal employment relationship of the migrant domestic caseworkers is highly personalized um, and determined by transnational class hierarchies. Care chains are created uh, that not only cannot close the gaps that have arisen um, in Europe, but also shift them to the social structures of the global south, to the families uh, left behind, especially children, men, and the elderly. And this development uh, must also be seen in the light of neoliberal economic policy of the European Union, which also aims at um, expanding the service sector to include uh, so-called household-related services, in order to create new forms of business and jobs. This refers to the so-called um, service agencies uh, that place migrant workers as au pairs or in precarious, primarily marginal employment or new forms of self-employment or bogus employment uh, from EU third countries. These developments are based on the premise that European men do not take on significantly more care work despite reforms in family law and selective recognition of, um, for example, child raising periods under social security law. As a result, uh, traditional gender roles persist. Um, for our contribution, um, as I already mentioned, uh, it is situated in the uh, critical social sciences and we will use approaches from anthropology, sociology, uh, so, uh, socio sociology and feminist political economy uh, to grasp the gender dimension of informally I, I, all, uh, I just outlined. And we will analyze um, some policy areas and also some empirical problems. Um, policy areas such as the neoliberal economic policy of the European Union, employment policy efforts, welfare state and the level of familiarization and the gender um, specific division of unpaid uh, labor. I'm going to leave it at that, but Nina will now make a little more concrete comments on our data and our empirical analysis. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, my part is to briefly summarize what we're going to do in the second part of our contribution. First, 
as Christian already mentioned, it's an um, outline of, of uh, state of the state of the art, state of research, and also some thoughts on the theoretical uh, explanations. And then we, in the second part, in the second half, as you may, um, we want to present some empirical facts and data, and we are going to use um, common uh, databases such as ELO, OECD, ELOSTAT, or uh, Eurostat. So as uh, Christ, uh, Christian already mentioned, we are going to focus on Europe. But of course, when concentrating on informal informality, then it's also necessary, if possible, to refer to the Global South, for example. So mainly, as we did so far, I, we are using the concept of the of ELO, International Labour Organization, and also using um, the definition, pre definition presented by the ELO. So, uh, which refers to enco encompassing all economic activities by workers in economic units that are in law or in practice not covered by insufficiently covered uh, by a formal arrangement. So we know that's a very broad definition, but still um, we want to refer to Illustrate because it's uh, just a common definition used uh, in empirical data. So. The first step um, is that we want to uh, present an overview and then a descriptive time series analysis. So we ask, um, or the first first research question, if you may, is um, we ask what has changed over the last 20 to uh, 15 to 20 years, again, with a special focus on Europe. But then also, of course, because it's the main topic of our contribution, we want to analyze which if we and in in what to what extent we can quantify differences in inequalities with respect to gender, and then um, putting some highlights on more current examples, we want to specifically specifically focus on um, um, particular realms of society, for example, care work, um, where we want to present some. Um, current data, some current figures on uh, also uh, the question whether or not COVID-19, the pandemic has uh, raised some further um, inequalities and which um, groups, risk groups are uh, ex uh, particularly exposed. So just to give you some quick, and I know I just have two minutes left, um, some um, figures we already found and it's work in progress, of course. What you see here is that uh, first empirical findings, of course, so we see that the informal sector um, shrinks is increasing over the last 20 to 30 years. Um, here I have some figures on, on the globe or worldwide, but as I mentioned twice already, um, our focus will be Europe and um, also finding some answers to the question why the informal sector is increasing over the last decades. Um, some Further empirical findings, um, even though the informal sector is, in, is increasing, uh, is decreasing, sorry, <laughs> sorry, decreasing, um, more than 60% of the world's employed population earned their livelihoods in an informal economy. Of course, that's, that's a lot. And um, the informal sector is shrinking, but still represents a great deal of countries, of the country's economic activity. Um, as uh, Christian already outlined, uh, informality as such affects men and women differently. And we are going to highlight specifically in which areas this is particularly pronounced. So while more men, um, and this tells us the data, um, work in the informal economy globally, a majority of countries, um, in the ma majority of countries, women are more exposed. and. Um, um, finally, we also find that in the most countries, women are more found, more often found in the most vulnerable, vulnerable uh, forms of informal employment, as Christian already mentioned, for example, sexual trafficking and so on. So we just uh, looked quickly at some uh, employment, informal employment rates by sex. And here we can see that um, this represents a uh, European um, continent. So we find great differences between countries. And we also find that um, in some country, countries, um, women are more exposed than in some um, men, and we want to, um, yeah, in our in our contribution, find some answers to why gender differences are um, uh, persistent uh, in the European Union. Union. So 
Next steps are finding more uh, up-to-date up -to data and also analyze how COVID has a specific impact on gender inequalities and then concentrate on some present case studies, for example, care work, as I already mentioned, or the construction um, industry. So that's that for now. Um, and we are happy to answer all your questions now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have slightly less than two minutes for Q&A, if there are any. Uh, and also, by the way, uh, Bauno Hojam, you can also start sharing your screen in the meantime. Any questions? Let me ask. Okay. Uh, or Gülay Hojam, who, who is going to present, you or Bauno? I'm going to present. Bauno might also contribute. Okay, sorry, then I didn't know. Okay, let me just make you co-host then so that you can share your screen. Thank you. Okay, you have 16 minutes to present, if possible. Okay. Uh, let me see. You should be able to share your screen now. Is it okay? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, well, I, I must uh, first express my really happiness or pleasure to be with the community uh, with such a, a specific focus. And I apologize for my being late. Luckily, my flight was uh, on time. And I apologize in advance that I have to leave early. Uh, cannot stay until the end of the workshop. Now, our um, joint work with Bano uh, focuses on the input output analysis, intersectoral analysis, in other words, uh, comparing formal and informal employment uh, with the gender dimension, to state it in short. Uh, as some of you are already in the audience, are already familiar, um, women's labor force participation is the lowest. Uh, among o OECD countries. And that is why in total employment, women take up only around one third of the whole uh, employed force. And among the informal employment, uh, which we relate to the SDG 83, again, women are ranked quite uh, low in the uh, overall uh, well, in the disadvantaged uh, state, I would say. Uh, however, our interest in, is in especially uh, sectors. So sectoral analysis is important, we think, because uh, among the uh, women, we note that informal employment rate is high, but also it's, it's highest, and especially within agriculture is high, which is a universal trend and uh, relatively low among women, but quite high, almost equal or close to men in services. Now, this is the, uh, the general overview or outlook. Well, it, I don't have to go into the definitions of the employment, but it, they are already stated in the previous uh, presentations, just in the very pre previous uh, presentation, which we also adopt the same ILO uh, definitions or uh, coverage. Now, uh, our aim is not to uh, focus on only the three sectors, but conduct the analysis in a much more broad and detailed coverage because the available data for 18 sectors provide us the information that the informality in agriculture is highest, yes, but there is also significant proportion in manufacturing and also health and social work activities, which includes care services as well, uh, stand out. 
So we have only highlighted some significant figures here, and we all, I'm sure, aware that informality is not specific to women only, but men's, men also uh, conduct informal or employed informally without any social security and pension payment and so on. Uh, in agriculture in Turkey, in manufacturing, in construction, again, uh, which overlaps with the previous analysis, and trade, uh, which also includes some uh, transportation activities, but not transportation per se by itself, it does not appear to be that significant. So we want to, to compare the women's case uh, and men's case, both in informal and formal employment, uh, within an industri inter-industrial framework, uh, in a comparative uh, context. Now, the, the purpose is therefore to compare them, not only in terms of where they are employed, that is the origin sector, because we always, we generally put the blame on the sector which is uh, employing informal labor, both men and women. But our focus is, or our concern, is more on the other sectors which reinforce this employment in the origin sectors. Because there are uh, intermediate input, uh, input uh, transactions between the sectors, and it's not the burden and the responsibility is not on the origin sector of employment or, the in, or on the employer sector, but also, or more maybe, uh, we will highlight, we want to highlight that dimension. The responsibility is more on the other sectors, which due to cost advantage, and lose flexible labor regulations, which benefit from the cheap and vulnerable employment in the original, original sectors, origin sectors. Therefore, <clears throat> we thought that we will compare genders and formality and informality and the and with the links to the education levels. Now, the methodology is the input output model. In the usual uh, or the well-known employment generation model, we, and, uh, we, the employment uh, structure or labor demand is related to final demand, which is why. This is the uh, this is the common approach in especially global value chain analysis because uh, there are uh, significant studies also which incorporate uh, the social footprints of international trade through uh, not only final good exports but also intermediate good exports uh, as well in a very uh, comprehensive world input output data modeling system. And they also include some bad social footprints as well, including slave labor, which was mentioned. And that's why I was happy to hear the previous uh, presentation, which overlap with our social uh, concerns. We, we use a modification of this model to serve our uh, purposes. But first I'll show what we mean, uh, what this implies or the basis of our model. And if it's a two sector model, then we can uh, construct easily from the statistics that we have, how many, how much, uh, production is in agriculture, flows from agriculture within agriculture, from agriculture to non-agriculture and vice versa. And with the total output, we already know from national accounts, we can calculate direct input uh, coefficients and also the inverse. Now, what we observe then 
is, and we also, we, we need a complementary data, which is the employment data. So people employed in all sectors, then uh, this is the total employment that we, I just presented in the first slide. And there's the formal uh, counterpart of it. And in its simplest form, our um, crucial, that is coefficient matrix is the labor coefficient matrix, where we see that, for example, in agriculture, we usually uh, emphasize that women are disadvantaged, but in terms of the production technology or production function, we note that in order to uh, produ produce $1 million of agricultural output, there is not much difference between the labor required. One is 22 people, the other is 23 people. So this production function approach, we then um, modify to account for deliveries both to both final demand and intermediate use. It, it is very straightforward and it's an established uh, model. But in this, while here the L or labor coefficient matrix appears to be a single one, a composite one, we decompose it into formal and informal, uh, women and men, and various education levels. Because in general, yes, we know that uh, it is the low educated, low skilled labor, which are mostly concentrated in the informal employment. Or in the Turkish case with Turkish data, we also note that um, the patterns could be different, including high level educated individuals employed informally in some sectors. So the, our model concentrates, of course, it's a, um, it's a model with many sectors, but I only present here the model with two sectors for simplicity and to give you all an idea. And uh, we, as I said, we will focus in our comparative analysis on cross multipliers because the own multipliers, we already know how many people are employed in agriculture. But what we uh, trace is what is the role of the non agricultural sector on informal employment in agriculture? Sector. And we conduct the computation, we will conduct the computations uh, in compliance with the so with some drawbacks within the discussion of the total flow approach uh, model. Uh, and I'll show you a very an early uh, structure of what we have found and what we mean with that. Now, uh, in comparison, education is not here because it would be too detailed, but informal, uh, you can see the comparative uh, outlook between the multipliers in inf for informal employment and formal employment and for genders. Now, uh, it is very, um, striking or it stands out that non-agriculture output is um, associated with informal employment of women in agriculture, but agriculture output is has much weaker or relatively weaker with the informal employment in non -agriculture. And this case is, you know, the and it is this comparison uh, exposes that the production that is the output in non agriculture sector as a whole uh, has very, very low association with 
formal output, formal employment of agriculture in agriculture for women. This is why we want to compare these cross multipliers. And it also applies, uh, the same line of reasoning also applies uh, for men. So what we are going to do is we are going to we are going to work with a much larger empirical table because as I showed you, available statistics provide information for 18 sectors, which is good enough. However, in ma the manufacturing is taken as a as a, a composite sector. Subsectors of manufacturing are not there. So we want to expand this information with a reconciliation of uh, information from the household labor force survey. And therefore we will, uh, while keeping the, or adhering to the uh, general aggregates in for consistency, we decompose the manufacturing sector in to its subsectors, and therefore we also uh, integrate or we also derive we will derive the statistics, the data for both informal and in, and formal employment for manufacturing subsectors, and therefore we'll conduct will compute or estimate the model with a larger uh, matrix. And this matrix, yeah, it's obvious that will include formal and informal and gender wise, gender divide. And but also, as I said, while I was describing the model, it will also account for education levels for both men and men, men and women, for both formal and informal employment. Gülay uh, Hocam, uh, can, can you just sum up in a minute if possible? Yes, this is this is the end. This is the last slide. Okay. So uh, we our purpose then is to uh, understand the formal informal divide within the production network in a holistic context, taking account of taking into account of all the uh, inter related networks of uh, transactions in the economic system and therefore hopefully uh, design or provide insight for some policy analysis uh, which will be based on the information derived from this analysis so thank you thank and you very much thank you for your presentation thank you uh, maybe like, you know, very short delay, let me ask any questions, comments, suggestions. Again, I will share emails of all participants later after the workshop. So you can also send your comments, suggestions, and questions to the participants sure. later. Sure, that will be very good. So since we are now on a very tight schedule again, let us jump immediately to session number four, mm -hmm. uh, which is now going to be involving four presentations. And the first presentation will be by uh, Aglaya Batslinero, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, hopefully. <laughs> uh, and the title of the talk is gonna be Comparative Intersectoral Analysis of Formal and Informal Employment. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, Technology and Informality. I'm sorry, Technology and Informality, A Brief History of Their Relationship and Future Intertwining. So the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much. Good morning and good afternoon for everyone. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity to share our um, research. So at the beginning when we started actually um, talking about what could be actually that relationship of technology and informality, it came to us the idea of um, start seeing how this uh, relationship or where actually technology might be a support to informality, how 
technology has changed actually the dynamics within informality. So we have been in the uh, research center and the innovation center, been uh, dealing with uh, the research on, on informality for the last three years. And then we were asking ourselves, technology um, is or drives uh, the evolution of communities or explains actually economic growth and uh, how economies actually develop in the world. And for us, it was very interesting to see what was the impact of technology within informality and how informality or within informality it has been used or adapted. So when we started to research about this, we found out that, that there is actually little to non-existent literature about this uh, relationship. So this, what we are going to present is uh, attempts to be an exploratory study on this thematic, see, seeking to uh, explain a little bit this relationship between technology and informality and understand a little bit how technology is used and or adopted in these different facets of informality. So here I will have to clarify what informality is and what technology is within this study. And since informality has different dimensions, we're going to be focused on the socioeconomic dimension of informality mainly. So informality in this case is referring, and you know, <laughs> because we are doing this for the handbook of informality, that refers to the economic and social activities that are not regulated by the formal rules of, and institutions of a society. And technology has also different dimensions and usually is uh, defined as tools, methods, and processes that are used to create, develop, and improve product services or systems in general. Um, and even when it could be both physical or digital, in our work, we are going to be mentioning technology as actually the digital and communication tools and techniques. So we have two questions to answer within this study. And the first is what has been this relationship between technology and informality? And the second one is how technology has been used and or adopted amidst these many facets of informality. And we um, actually are attempting to answer that by a cohort and applying a cohort analysis um, where we actually first delimited uh, the subject um, and by delimiting the subject, I'm, I'm meaning, okay, the keyword of technology, the of informality within the socioeconomical dimension and the uh, uh, keyword technology within the means of um, digital and communication techniques and tools. So this was a cyclical process where we ended up with this uh, search equation. And this search equation allowed us to find out 455 papers in the database of Scopus distributed as you can see in this graph. So we can see that actually um, merging these two concepts is a new thing within the academia. In the last decade within 10, 2010 and 2019, uh, we have seen actually an, an emergence of applications of technology within in, in regards with informality. And we are expecting actually that in this decade and, and, and we hope actually that this work might um, be worth uh, explaining or actually fostering the development or more and more, and more um, works regarding technology and, and, and informality as well. So afterwards, we uh, applied the cohort analysis. When we had, uh, we cleaned the, 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 the sample of these documents, uh, we find out actually uh, the main corpus with the keywords um, provided by the, uh, the authors of these uh, 455 papers. And afterwards we um, develop, we apply the cohort analysis and uh, um, generated the diagram and the strategic diagram as well. So what we have is this, or where we are in right now is in this. We have found that uh, while merging the, the, the two concepts, technology and informality, we can actually have or identify seven clusters. The first one is regarding actually all those technological applications to study informal settlements. The second one is more um, about how mobile technologies and especially smartphones have changed actually the dynamics within the informal economy. The third one uh, talks about the sustainable development of informal sectors. The fourth one uh, is talking about these challenges in pu public pol policy and informal institutions and uh, how difficult has it been for uh, decision makers actually to catch up with the development of technology and the new business models. 
uh, the cluster five, six, and seven is actually a mo much more narrow thematic. The five is talking about this digitalization in the banking industry or the, those financial solutions in developing, especially in developing economies. Uh, the cluster six uh, talks about the digitalization in transport and uh, all the new transport solutions, let's say, especially again in developing countries. And uh, the cluster seven is talking about those technologies used in, a, in smart cities. And what we have seen is, um, or the, the main takeaways that we have identified is first, uh, geographical information systems, mobile phones and remote sensing are the, the technologies or the main technologies that have been further developing in regards to informality. Second, machine learning and artificial intelligence will actually in the near future start reshaping or shaping actually the dynamics of informality. And the use and adoption of technologies can be observed from the perspectives of the informal workers um, and their occupations, the academy and the research and researchers, and thirdly, the public policy and decision makers. Actually, our concern here and what we have found is that uh, technology um, has been much more used by researching and understanding the phenomenon of informality rather than used to um, better the conditions of informal workers, for example, or informal occupation. We are going to talk a bit uh, about this in the further slides. So uh, what you are seeing here is actually the layout of the evolution of these papers uh, from 2014 and 2020. And you can see here that prior to 2015, um, uh, the technology and this relationship between technology and informality uh, was mainly focused in geographical information systems and uh, studying actually informal set settlements and uh, applying all these technologies uh, related to geographical information systems to understand better those dynamics, how informal settlements are growing uh, and the dynamics inside these um, urban planning situations within informal settlements. But since 2015, um, we have found that, of course, uh, the smartphones reach the critical mass uh, and in the whole society, and this was not actually different in uh, for, for informal workers or for those um, people that are working actually in the informal economy and the informal sectors. Uh, so this has actually opened up uh, some conditions. First, we have found that social media became, became also a sales channel. And of course, informal businesses and informal workers are using uh, social media to promote and sell their services and products. Also, business models around fintech, for example, and the, all the digital platforms uh, on the digital, digital economy are supporting informal occupations. And what we have found is, so, uh, especially these digital platforms and this digital economy are even creating or expanding informal occupations. Um, also, digital platforms have become economic agents uh, and have started to, uh, more and more to challenge uh, public policy uh, on labor and social security. And finally, the last takeaway here is uh, machine learning is increasingly invol uh, involved in the um, detection, monitoring, and characterization of informal settlements. And not just that, but the machine learning and also deep learning on all, all these techniques used for intelligent, uh, artificial intelligence, um, we believe that are going to be uh, very relevant in closing the gap or at, the, at least helping policymakers to react quicker to the changes within the informal economy. So after generated a strategic diagram, the strategic diagram allows us to position all the cluster and identify within the cent uh, showing us the centrality of the thematic, how, how, the, how these clusters are central to the thematic, so the technology and informality, and also how dense they are. This is explaining how developed they are within uh, the thematic. And we can find actually that there is no motor themes in the pattern one, which means that it has highlights really the underdevelopment of issues bridging this informality and technologies, these, these two concepts. In the quadrant two, we find clusters five, six, and seven which are much more uh, related to specific technologies. Uh, this usually means that um, this type of um, concepts or th this type of clusters have tight research and development communities. Um, 
they actually have been developed usually uh, by productive sectors and indirectly end up impacting informality. But here are three main topics that we want to highlight. First, that of the financial inclusion. The second is the transport optimization. And the third one is the cities integration. Uh, those are the topics that are really related with those technologies and informality. In the quadrant three, usually are showed up uh, all those topics that can be emerging or declining. In this case, we identify that cluster four, which is regarding the challenges in public policy and informal institution is an emerging actually uh, topic. Um, that is catching the academic attention, especially actually to uh, better, not just to better understand the challenges and dynamics and changes of the informal economy, but also how to react more quickly to the phenomenon of informality. And finally, in the quadrant four, uh, we have all those topics that are much more central to the informality, to, to the topic of informality. And here we identify three main uh, topics as well. First, technology helping to better understand these informal settlements and not just to understand, but also to monitor now life. It's possible to monitor uh, how settlements are changing. Secondly, technological change has influenced the, uh, the, the, the labor market, created challenges such as e-waste as well, and helped to close exclusion gaps and provided solutions to increase the sustainability of informal sectors. And thirdly, uh, technologies have helped create a new informal occupations as well, as I already mentioned. And especially here, we want to highlight the importance of mobile technologies and especially smartphones today uh, that have changed actually the dynamics of uh, this informal economy. So what we are going to be uh, discussing uh, or our main discussion is, is going to be- uh, Adelaide, please like, you know, if you can sum up in one minute, that would be great. Yeah. That, that's question. actually, so uh, the, the, the main discussion is going to be around, uh, we identify these three, three agents and we have seen actually that uh, for informal workers, for example, um, uh, technology will ch be changing actually the business. We are going to see how uh, new informal occupations are going to emerge and how these actually will uh, fit up all this complex understanding of informality in terms of the academy and researchers. We, th we believe that we have to start researching about the impact and use of technology because Usually technology is not developed to understand informality, but end up impacting informality. And for public policy, public policy will remain reactive rather than, than proactive. But we believe that there are some technologies that could accelerate actually this decision-making decision process. And for us, one of the questions that we want to center is how much technology has facilitated and will facilitate the transition for, from formality to informality. Because what we have seen actually is that technology has uh, promoted actually this uh, change from formal, so in developing countries, even from formal uh, economy to the informal, given the actually wages and the perception of these uh, informal workers to see greater freedom and much more flexibility in their work. So that's actually where, where we want to highlight and pay attention to. So thank you very much for hearing my presentation. And um, I see if you have some questions or comments. Thank you, thank you, Aglaya. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just ask once whether there are any questions or otherwise I will give the floor to Vasileos Vlachos again now for a presentation of a paper uh, with Aristis Pitsinis uh, on the relationship between informal sector size and FDI flows. The title of the paper is Does the Informal Economy Determine FDI Flows? Thank you very much. Uh, can I share my presentation? Yes, be, yeah, Thank you. Okay, I'm going to present to you uh, our uh, work for the chapter on the informal economy and uh, inward foreign direct investment. Um, actually, what uh, I'm going to present today is a review of uh, the literature, which is still at its infancy, and uh, some. Um, some uh, issues that puzzles us on how to approach the relation between inward FDI and uh, the informal sector. Now, uh, one uh, one of the papers that we have reviewed is that of uh, Ali and Bohara, which focuses on data 
for 1999 to 2007 and investigates uh, whether the size of the informal economy in the host economy relative to the investor economy can uh, play a significant role in attractive foreign direct investments. Uh, the informal economy differentials are investigated as one of the independent variables of uh, an FDI gravity model and uh, treated as a proxy for tax evasion. The construction of uh, the informal economy differentials uh, is based on the estimated sizes of the shadow economy by Snyder et al. Uh, some papers of uh, Professor Snyder are frequently published and include uh, a database of the shadow economy for several uh, economies around the world. And the results indicate that an increase in the shadow economy rate of the host economy relative to the investor economy increases foreign uh, direct investment. The implication is that uh, multinationals are motivated to take advantage of uh, these differences in the sizes of the informal economy. Uh, a second paper that we have reviewed uh, indicates that the effect of the shadow economy depends on the uh, modes of uh, foreign market uh, access. So this uh, paper breaks down the foreign direct investment uh, into an economy by mode of access. Uh, they cover 158 countries uh, for the period of uh, 2003 to 2015. And the construction of the informal economy variable again is based on estimates of uh, the shadow economy. Uh, the authors report results for three models where the informal economy is tested with other control variables considered to affect foreign direct investment and uh, cross-border greenfield investments and cross-border emergence and acquisitions. Uh, the results depends on types of entry where the informal economy has a positive effect on uh, greenfield investments and a negative effect on uh, cross-border emergence and acquisitions. Uh, one uh, thing to mention here is that uh, they do not look uh, at differences between uh, the informal sectors of uh, uh, the host economy and uh, the home economy. So this is uh, something to issue uh, regarding the work of Ali and Bohara and uh, this one that we just seen here. And uh, finally, uh, some other papers which uh, indicate that there is uh, another uh, way to see this relationship. Uh, the effect of foreign direct investment on the size of the formal economy, where we see that the uh, inward foreign direct investment uh, can increase the size of the informal uh, economy. Uh, Goel et al. Uh, use panel data for more than 100 countries and for uh, four different years to investigate the effect of foreign direct investment on the informal economy. And their results indicate that foreign direct investment increases the size of the informal economy. And uh, two other papers which uh, investigate this relationship uh, find that uh, actually uh, the FDI uh, has uh, a strong negative impact on the informal economy. Uh, this is because they find uh, that uh, foreign direct investment increases institutional quality and through that uh, uh, improvement actually has uh, a negative impact on the size of the informal economy. And uh, now to uh, discuss about what we are going uh, to do, uh, we want to look uh, at uh, inward foreign direct investment and the size of the informal economy in the host economy relative to the investor economy. So we think to look at, uh, F at uh, differences in the size of the informal economy. And uh, we are going to do that uh, with a panel co-integration model. Uh, data for uh, inward direct investment from uh, OECD countries covering 38 host economies for the period of 2005-2001. Uh, We're going to look uh, for flows and uh, stocks as well. Usually when we use a gravity model, we look, uh, we investigate only inward FTI flows. Uh, however, we're going to uh, investigate stocks as well. And uh, data for informal economy, uh, we're going to uh, get it from Medina and Snyder, who cover also 38 hosts for the period of uh, 2005 to 2017. Uh, the other option would uh, be to follow uh, an FDI gravity, gravity model like uh, uh, Ali and Bohara did, as I mentioned earlier in this presentation, and to see whether uh, the differences in the uh, sizes of the informal sector are uh, more important, if they are important, to uh, attracting uh, foreign direct investment uh, relative to other uh, determinants in the gravity model. Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I would like to hear your comments as well. Uh, I, I have one comment, Vasileo. So yes. since I have published a paper, I think in 2021 in review of development economics on not the effect of FDI on informality, but it was more a paper on the effect of informality on FDI or on type of FDI. In that paper, I have showed that, that in countries where the informal sector is larger, the technology transfer effects of FDI are different. So uh, the, the, the presence and the size of the informal economy basically determines the type and the effect of FDI. So which basically means that also you may want to look at that, you know, you are looking at the effect of FDI on the informal economy, but you may also want to take the fact into account that the relationship might be bi-directional. So, and, you know, the informal economy can also influence, affect whatever the, uh, the level of FDI. So, I guess, sorry. Uh, I must say that I have uh, taken into account your paper. It was about the transfer of technology, as you said. So it was the impact of uh, FDI on uh, economic growth, let's say, of uh, the host country. So um, you took into account whether the informal sector has uh, a role in that relationship. Uh, as I said, this is uh, a bidirectional relationship, and this is what puzzles me. And, the, uh, and maybe I, and I thought that we could approach this relationship with a co-integration model. So we could look at different, uh, really at simultaneous relationship between these two variables and whether they co-integrate in the long term. And uh, the reason that I didn't mention uh, your work is because it was uh, on the impact on economic growth. Now, I don't, I, I, I don't think that I should uh, look uh, into this relationship, uh, further variables like the economic growth of the host. Because mm -hmm. then I would have to make it more complicated and uh, discuss uh, further relationships like you do in your uh, work uh, that you mentioned. But of course, I understand, as I mentioned earlier, that this uh, relationship is uh, bidirectional. And uh, one other thing that puzzles me is uh, the work of uh, about the modes of entry. Because if it really, if if, if there is a, really a difference, then. Uh, maybe another approach would be necessary. Of course, it would be very different from the data that I have uh, considered that I am going to consider here and everything else. But uh, considering that uh, there is proof from earlier studies that there is a relationship, either by directional or not. So I think that I could uh, rely on uh, foreign direct investment uh, data on the country level rather than uh, looking on the firm mm -hmm. level on the modes mm -hmm. of entry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vasileos. Any other questions or comments? As we have time, some time at least. Okay, then uh, the next speaker is going to be Gökçer Özgür. <coughs> um, and he will be presenting a paper on informality in a stack flow consistent model. The floor Hi. is Gökçer. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I will present our joint paper with Jay Hun on uh, stack flow of consistent modeling for a developing country with a large. Okay, just a second for a uh, for a developing country with an informal sector. Okay, so what's our motivation and aim is. Everyone in this uh, workshop are familiar with informal economic output is responsible about 15% of GDP in advanced economies, 35% uh, uh, of total GDP, but uh, more than 70% of employment in developing countries. Uh, SFC models uh, uh, without an informal sector uh, may be misleading for developing countries. So in the SFC literature, stock flow of consistent literature. There are some studies focusing on developing countries, but they lack informal sectors. And I think this will be uh, a misleading factor. And uh, our main research question by including uh, informal sector to SFC models, what constitutes the share of informal sector? So is it taxation policies? Is it 
something else? Is it uh, government some or institutional structures? What's really causing and can we model it? And in order to do that, we define informal economy as all firms, workers, activities that operate outside the legal regulatory framework, which is more or less the standard definition and the output they generate. Uh, in terms of uh, the methodology, why do we choose stock flow of consistent modeling? Because it shows the interaction between real and financial markets. And it's uh, based on one accounting principle. Uh, once income is someone else's payment. And it also shows everything comes from somewhere and goes from somewhere. So it's an alternative macroeconomic modeling system without using uh, general equilibrium computer or uh, models based on compute, uh, computable general equilibrium uh, framework. And in this literature, there are some studies focusing on the informality. And uh, in these examples, uh, there are cases like uh, multi-sectoral production, such as agriculture, non-agricultural, and intermediate fact sectors in Argentina. That's one example. Another example is focusing on the functional income distribution, uh, such as low-skilled and high-skilled workers and entrepreneur households. Uh, another one is also recently focusing on informal employment in Argentina. Uh, th uh, there are some open economy models which we depend on in this study. And uh, there are also uh, studies explaining investment functions. So following these uh, models in the literature, we try to build a, an informal economy model in this SFC framework. So what's an SFC really? It's actually showing the, it starts with the balance sheet position of each sector in the economy. And then following the transactions, it shows the changes in this balance sheet and then moves to the next position in the balance sheet. And by defining the uh, behavioral factors in terms of the changes in balance sheet transactions, it shows whether this, uh, whether some of the activities are sustainable or not, or there are cases for debt accumulation, instability, and things like that. And uh, following a standard uh, stock flow model, we have households, firms, governments, central bank, and banks. This is a closed economy model. And in terms of households and firms, we divided them into formal and informal. So we have formal households and informal households. We have formal firms and informal firms. So both formal firms and informal firms are making on uh, fixed capital, households on high powered money or cash and deposits, uh, informal households also on uh, cash and deposits in terms of their wealth. Central bank finance, uh, central bank is issuing uh, cash, of course. Uh, banks uh, collect deposits and both informal and formal households uh, have deposits. So in the balance sheet, if there is a plus that represents assets, if there is a minus that represents liabilities. So deposits are households, assets and uh, banks liabilities. Similarly, banks also, uh, issue loans and households borrow from the banks. Government ha may have a deficit, which is in this case for the sake of simplicity, is financing deficits through issuing uh, treasury bills. And for the sake of simplicity, central banks are buying these treasury bills. And there is a, a balancing item in for the for each sector and that balancing item shows the net worth so if we add all the assets of a sector uh, plus its uh, net worth then we get uh, the sum as zero and how does informality plays a role here uh, in this model, we should look at the transaction flow. So what causes changes in uh, balance sheets? Both uh, formal and informal sector are responsible for consumption. And in this uh, transactional flows, plus signs represents payments, 
no, I'm sorry. Plus signs represents uh, income, uh, revenues, and minus sign represents expenditures. So both formal and informal uh, households are making consumption uh, expenditures, and both formal and informal sector supply these goods and services to them. Similarly, both formal and informal sectors make investment spending. Some of the government purchases go to formal and informal sector as well. And uh, maybe the contribution of our model or how we design it is formal sector and informal sector are buying from each other. This is an important factor we see in many developing countries. So formal sectors, of course, maybe may have better access to credit or um, engaging international trade, but they subcontract some of their activities to informal sector. And in this paper, we argue that subcontracting activities are an important factor feeding to and uh, sustaining the existence of uh, informal sector. So these are the expenditure transactions. We also have uh, income uh, flows. Again, plus signs represents revenue. So there are people working in uh, formal sector and informal sector. Both formal and informal sector generate profits. Uh, and uh, maybe the difference is uh, so they, once the profits are generated, some of them are retained in the firm's capital account as undistributed profits, and some of them are going to distributed profits. And of course, uh, formal firms are paying taxes, income taxes out of their activities, and informal firms uh, do not pay because they are not registered. Following these transactions, there are changes in uh, uh, balance sheets in terms of cash holding, deposits holding, uh, loans. I'm going to skip these parts to save time. Okay. And what are our behavioral equations? Uh, Output in an economy, in this economy, is the sum of both formal and informal sector. And in a formal income is made of formal consumption, formal investment, government spending, sales, and purchases. Similarly, informal sector has similar things. What's really important here, maybe in terms of establishing the connection between formal and informal sector, formal sector's purchases is a share of its output. So as it produces in the formal sector, it make purchases, uh, purchases from informal sector. Informal sector has uh, a share of purchases as well. And informal sector is buying, purchasing goods and services from the formal sector. And its uh, purchases, is a share of its uh, output as well. And uh, formal sector sales equals to its purchases. I'm sorry, formal sector's purchases equals to informal sector purchases and informal sector's sales equals to formal sector's purchases. So this is a demand-driven model. Uh, purchase of informal sector determines sales of formal sector, and same thing applies to informal sector. And uh, we have some standard definitions for disposable income. Disposable income is income minus tax. Taxes are collected from uh, both deposits and uh, income. Uh, we have profit and uh, wage definitions. Uh, again, uh, distributed and undistributed profits. And finally, households uh, allocation of uh, wealth. I'm going to skip these parts just to share our results. Uh, and here we also use for firms a standard investment function. Investment is a function of uh, undistributed profits. 
uh, cost of uh, finance, financing uh, through loans, and also output. So that's the standard uh, accelerator principle. So both uh, formal sector and informal sector are making investment decisions based on their profits, they, uh, based on cost of borrowing, and based on the overall state of the economy. Uh, and finally, uh, once we uh, have this model, we ask uh, what constitutes the share of formal and informal sector. What are our main assumptions? Our main assumptions is formal sector pays tax out of uh, wage, profit, and interest revenue, but informal sector does not pay tax out of wage and profit, but only for interest and revenue. So households in informal sector do not pay tax out of uh, those unregistered activities, but their deposits are registered in the system, so they are paying taxes for that. Formal sector has a higher wage profit ratio, uh, and this is uh, something we see in, again, many developing countries. However, com uh, compared to that, informal sector has a higher profit wage ratio. Uh, formal sector has a higher undistributed distributed profit ratio, and informal sector has a lower investment profit ratio. And once we have these connections, we look at what if their interaction, uh, interaction between these two sectors are low? So informal sector operates mostly within itself and has uh, a small share of purchases from formal sector. And similarly, formal sector has a low share of activities vis-a-vis -vis informal sector. If that's the case, if both sectors are more or less separated and they both operate in their own demand, uh, in their own domain, uh, the, share of inf the share of informal sector in our simulations with this model seems to be around 20%. So 20%, 25% of uh, the sec uh, economy is in informal sector and the rest is formal. And in terms of the growth rate of capital stocks, formal sector seems to be growing faster and eventually they converge. And in terms of household wealth, formal households have a significantly larger wealth. And then the next question is, what if they have high and high interaction? So formal sector, is uh, buying a significant amount of goods and services from informal sector. And same principle applies to informal sector as well. If that's the case, the share of informal sector significantly increases and contributes more or less around 70% of the economy eventually, and it uh, stabilizes there. In terms of growth rates of capital stocks, <clears throat> even though at the, uh, it, in initial years, formal sector has a, a greater growth rate, informal sector replaces it. In terms of household wealth, again, uh, informal sector households have a significantly larger uh, household wealth. Then the next question is, what if formal sector has a low uh, share of purchases from informal sector, but informal sector has a high purchases from formal sector. In this case, again, the share of informal sector uh, remains low for a long time, and formal sector has a higher growth rate in the economy, and household uh, wealth, formal household wealth is significantly larger. So these, uh, uh, this model and our simulations based on this model shows we tried different tax rates, different initial shares. Uh, I'm not showing all of them to save uh, time. Uh, regardless of tax rate and initial shares, the sales of informal sector determines its share in this model. Higher the interaction, higher growth, higher shares, and wealth accumulation. And eventually, the growth rate of formal and informal sector converges. So if we are looking at uh, the growth of informal sector, we should also look at 
uh, formal sector and the interaction between these two. Uh, this part of this uh, work is completed and for feature we also want to look at estimation of parameters for different uh, economies, especially different developing economies of course, first with an economy uh, with a developing for a developing economy with a large informal sector and for an economy with a medium sized informal sector. Thank you very much uh, for your attention and participation. If you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to send me an email. Thank you. Thank you, Gökçer. Uh, any questions from the audience? Let me just ask. Okay, so um, we have one more uh, paper left here in this session. That's gonna be my, uh, a paper that I have co-authored as well. I will not make the presentation because you will see that I'm continuously coughing here right now since I am really sick. But let me just tell you in one sentence and then we can use the remaining time for break at least because we couldn't give break in the last two hours or so. Um, so this is a paper, Informality and Stimulus Packages in the Pandemic, based on a joint publication of mine with uh, Abdullah Yalaman, Gamze Öz Yalaman and Colin Williams that was published in Journal of International Development. But here we are gonna be doing somewhat differently. We are gonna look at the relationship between informal sector size and all kinds of stimulus measures adapted in the pandemic. In the published paper, we are only looking at the relationship between informality and fiscal stimulus measures. In this paper, we are gonna be using a more comprehensive data set where we will be looking at labor market measures as measured by ILO as well as uh, monetary policy and macrofinancial measures, uh, particularly implemented by uh, monetary policy authorities. So that's the paper, uh, or that's the chapter, uh, which will be published as part of the handbook, hopefully. So we have a new session, upcoming sanction in 15 minutes. So let's give, let's use this opportunity to give a 15 minute break. And we'll be back here in 15 minutes at 5 p.m. GMT plus three uh, or uh, depending on your time zones, uh, it can be corresponding to different times. But so we are going to be here at uh, in in fifteen minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Okay, so welcome to session number five. Um, and here we'll have three, or under this topic, we have three chapters that are going to be published in the book. One is going to be by me and Kerem Jantekin, which is on measuring informality using social media or Twitter, actually. Um, but as I said, like similar to the previous session, I will not present, but let me just give you very quickly what this chapter is going to be about. Uh, as you already know, that tax evasion is one of the main sources of informal economic activity, and it has drastic effects on different macroeconomic variables. But of course, due to various reasons, it is difficult to directly measure the extent of tax evasion. Of course, informality is more than tax evasion, but here we are focusing on tax evasion aspects of informality only. Um, and in this paper, we basically try to develop a novel way. Uh, of measuring aggregate tax evasion in national economies using Twitter feeds. <laughs> you might already have heard that IRS, for example, the Internal Revenue Service of United States is um, sometimes trying to use social media to uh, issue fines on taxpayers, you know, if they are evading taxes in different ways. Um, of course, they are right now very much underfunded. I don't know how much they are continuing doing that practice, but they have been doing that for a while. Uh, and so what we are trying to do here is that to this end, using uh, a carefully selected uh, list of keywords in different, national, in different national languages, we will collect country and regional level data from Twitter feeds in different frequencies for a large cross-section of economies and then construct basically a um, measure of tax evasion using the collected data. Uh, that's basically the idea here. Uh, 
But now I will give the floor to, I think Edward Mihai Manta is gonna be, or Christina Maria Gamba. So I don't know who's gonna present which paper. Uh, I see that Adriana, uh, Miss uh, Professor Davidescu, Adriana Davidescu is not here now. So Edward Hello. Mihai, are you gonna yeah. be presenting the second paper in this session, the text analysis paper? Yeah, I'm going to present that paper and my colleague Christina will present the other one. With okay, the perfect. And so I already give, gave you co-host privileges. So the second paper is a joint paper by Adriana Ana Maria Davidescu, Eduard Mihai Manta, and Christina Maria Gambasu. The title is A Text Analysis of Research Publications Navigating Through Informality in the Age of Pandemics. And then the third paper is going to be, that's going to be presented by Christina Maria Gambasu, uh, has the title of Exploring the Regional Shadow Economy Research Field to, Through Bibliometric Analysis. And that's a paper that's co authored by, uh, again, Adriana Ana Maria Davidescu, Eduard Mihai Manta, Christina Maria Gambasu, but also additionally, Margareta Stella Florescu, if my notes are correct. So please, the floor is yours, uh, Eduard. Okay, thank you. So uh, basically, our uh, first paper is a text analysis approach of research publication that navigates through informality in the age of pandemics. Uh, as the main uh, research motivation for this paper is basically to discover an appropriate solution and create economic strategy, um, uh, somehow to estimate the level of the shadow economy um, worldwide. <clears throat> And uh, basically, in order to prepare shock re responses, it, it, it is also necessary to investigate the main topics that are correlated to informality, especially in uh, the age of pandemic, pandemics, uh, namely the COVID-19 crisis, the sanitary crisis. And uh, basically for that, our study aims to perform a text analysis to investigate the academic area delimited by uh, basically informality and uh, the informal sector and economy in times of COVID-19 pandemics. Uh, we have some uh, research questions. Um, the first one would be, which are the most used words within research that cover the informality and the informal economy? Uh, which pairs of words are the most correlated in the body of the literature and which are the main topics covered by this area. So basically here we have done a clustering approach to reveal the main topics. <clears throat> in terms of uh, data and the methodology, uh, we have manually selected for the periods 2020 to 2022 uh, uh, papers treating uh, having as the main subject uh, informality and also COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and we retrieved a total number of uh, 52 documents from Google Scholar. Uh, we have used the R environment. And um, for the, the analysis, we have um, five main steps. Uh, the first one uh, is the one that we created, uh, we imported the files. Um, then we created a corpus for the analysis where we cleaned and pre-processed the data. Then uh, we transformed our data into tokens, meaning that we filtered and weighted the words uh, in, uh, in the corpus. We use the DTM approach to analyze basically uh, in the final step the results. And now uh, uh, talking about result, uh, re the results, here we have uh, the work cloud uh, for the 52 documents. Uh, so basically, these are the uh, most common words uh, in the body of the literature. Um, of course, informal, informality, and pandemic uh, COVID-19 are the most uh, frequent words used in the papers, but also uh, some other words like policy, health, market, wages, government, employment, lockdown, uh, immigration, social, and so on. Then we explored the same, almost the same thing, but this time using the bigrams approach. So basically a pair of two words that are the most frequent. And uh, for that, we have uh, in our uh, corpus um, um, 
the COVID-19, the labor market, informal employment, social distancing, the informal sector, developing countries, minimum wages, low income, and so on. Then we approached the word network. Uh, what, uh, what does this word network do? Basically, it measures the coherence of words through the intensity of uh, the lines linking each pair of uh, two words. And as a cutoff point, uh, we have uh, uh, extracted the um, pairs that had a coherence of at least uh, 10. Then uh, we found out that the nodes with the highest measure of uh, centrality are informal, pandemic, and COVID. And then um, uh, as pairs um, being formed, we can mention pairs such as informal sector affected employment, labor, social policy, pandemic, COVID workers, and impact. Then in the next step, we have done a correlation network of words. Uh, here we used as a threshold uh, 0.6, and we have studied uh, the most encountered uh, combinations of words in terms of correlations. So we see that we have some sub networks in our main networks, and uh, for that, the most uh, common combinations are, for example, shop migration, Venezuela's immigration, Colombia minimum uh, and wages. In one of the subnetworks, in the other one, we have Latin productivity decline shock, and uh, we can also uh, point out society researches people distancing and affected. And then uh, in our last step of uh, our research, we basically created uh, some clusters using the um, LDA topic modeling approach. Uh, we found out that the um, uh, best number in terms of uh, clusters uh, would be uh, four clusters and uh, the first topics um basically is um is having papers that are treating the social impact of workers and uh, the policy responses and implications of workers during the covid-19 uh, pandemic period and then the second um, the second um, cluster is formed uh, by words such as so basically the the main topics are the social side of uh, poor urban economies then the third one um is formed by uh, economic crisis in relation with social with the social workers and then uh, the fourth topic is made of the formal sector uh, immigration market and market and the uh, uh, wages so basically, we with this um, analysis, our main objective uh, of uh, the research was to examine the academic area delimited by the informality and the informal economy in times of COVID-19 pandemics. Um, basically, the word cloud analysis pointed out that the most important words in the body of the literature that treats our uh, subject were informal, pandemic, employment, social, immigration, and formal, then the most used pairs of words, call, calling them uh, bigrams, are COVID, are the COVID nineteen labor market, informal employment, social distancing, informal sector, developing countries, and minimum wages. In terms of uh, correlation network, uh, the nodes with the highest uh, centrality measure uh, are informal pandemic and COVID, and basically the uh, pairs that are covered uh, being formed are informal sector affected employment, labor, social policy, pandemic, COVID workers, and impact. And uh, finally, the um, topic modeling shown that um, we have identified four main topics uh, that are around the social impact, the urban economy, um, the workers, the social crisis, and the immigration during COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, that was our first uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, Thank if you, you have any questions. Edward Mihai, thank you very much. Uh, again, like we can open the floor for questions if there are any, or you can send your questions via email to the authors. I will share the emails later, as I have told you. Um, 
Any questions? <clears throat> okay. So I very much believe that these kind of uh, review studies uh, are bibliometric studies are needed. So we can give the floor to, um, the, to our next next speaker in this session, uh, Christina Maria Gambasu. Hi. Hi. You must be able able to share your screen. Uh, I gave you co-host privileges already. Okay, we can see it perfect. Yeah, we can. See Thank you. Uh, so our study is uh, based on a bibliometric analysis uh, in order to explore the field of uh, regional shadow economy. Uh, to, it's important to estimate the informal economy uh, in order to find suitable solutions for tax fraud and to um, develop economic policies. And it's also important to look at both uh, regional and national level due to the fact that the uh, European Union imposed that the informal economy to be included in the GDP for um, financing programs. Uh, this study's objective is to give an answer uh, regarding uh, questions like which are the most uh, prolific authors in the field of uh, regional shadow economy, uh, which are the most significant research publications, how the um, production of scientific papers evolve in time, which are the most frequent keywords, and uh, which are the most influent papers through time. Uh, as for the data and methodology, we have used the R environment uh, and uh, bibliometrics and uh, biblioshine packages. Um, we uh, have included uh, 324 documents and the documents were split into data sets. The um, Web of Science uh, indexed uh, papers and Scopus papers. And the keywords used in order to find these papers were regional shadow economy, regional hidden economy, or any other synonym for the regional shadow economy. Uh, the analysis has three main steps, creating the database and choosing the um, tools that we want to use. Uh, import the data into the chosen environment and obtain the first results. And finally, analyze the um, intellectual, conceptual, and social structure of the papers. Uh, now we'll have a look at the results. First, we have some um, basic information about the papers, like the time span, like it, which is from 1992 to 2022. Uh, the number of documents, which for Web of Science data set, we have more documents. We have 205, uh, while for Scopus, we have 119. Also for the sources, we have more in the Web of Science, 154, while for Scopus, we have 99. As for the scientific production over time, uh, in the first years of the analysis, uh, the numbers aren't that high, but starting with um, uh, 2013, the interest through this file uh, increased and had for the both data sets their peak in 2019. Uh, the most relevant sources for um, Web of Science are papers in uh, regional science, regional studies, and analysis of uh, regional science. And for Scopus, we have internal journal of urban and, uh, and regional research, entrepreneurship and regional development, and cities. Uh, the most uh, relevant authors for both data sets are uh, similar names, like we have Brock, Williams, uh, Herwards, uh, and Schneider. Uh, this is based on the number of documents that were found in uh, both data sets. 
but if you look at the hash index, the index that uh, measures uh, both the productivity and the uh, citations of each author for the web of science, none of the authors stands out. While for Scopus, we have uh, Williams with the highest uh, hash index. Um, for the Web of Science dataset, the most cited uh, documents um, are the effects of spillovers in Boston, biotechnology community, and uh, universities and regional economic development, the Entrepreneurial University of Waterloo. And for Scopus, we have uh, Slumdog Cities, Rethinking uh, Subaltern Urbanism, and uh, mapping the invisible and real African economy, your one U.S. circularity. Uh, the most uh, used keywords by the authors in the, uh, their work are uh, informality, innovation, institutions, uh, entre entrepreneurship, corruption, urbanization, um, and uh, transition economies and regional development. Uh, for the conceptual structure, we look at the, um, the main topics that are discussed in the papers. So for both um, data sets, we have two, um, two groups formed. So for Web of Science, the four groups, um, it's around business and um, labor market file. And the topics in the second group are reforms, informality and uh, inequality. For the Scopus dataset, in the first group, we, uh, we are discussing about uh, Eastern and Southern Europe. And in the second group, the topic is uh, centered around uh, urban development. Uh, also for the con conceptual structure, we can look at the occurrence network uh, between the author's keywords. Here we can also see the, the topics. Uh, for Web of Science, we have six groups formed, but the most important ones are uh, the, the red one, uh, where the topics are around business, impact, and performance. And the next important one is the brown cluster, where uh, the topic sits around size uh, of the shadow economy and giving the empirical evidences. In the Scopus data set, we have three clusters, but the most important ones are the, um, uh, the red one, where the topic is uh, around urban de development, and the blue one, where the topics are informal sector and the uh, regional development. Now uh, we'll look at the intellectual structure. Uh, here we can have a look at the co-citation network between authors. Uh, so for the Web of Science, we see that there are four groups formed, but the most important one is the red one, where you have authors such like uh, Schneider, Williams, Maloney, and uh, Laporta. And in the Scopus data set, we have six groups formed. And the most important one is um, the yellow one, where we have um, authors like Hart, De Soto, Portes. And uh, here we find again Schneider and Williams. Uh, uh, now we are looking at the co-citation uh, network uh, based on the sources. Uh, we have uh, two groups formed for the Web of Science data set. Uh, the blue one, where we have uh, uh, sources like American Economic Review, World Development, Journal of Political Economy, and the red one, where we have uh, journals like Regional Studies, Journal of Economic Geography, or Journal of, of Economic Perspectives. And for the Scopus data set, there are three clusters formed. The green cluster, where we have the small business economics and uh, entrepreneurship theory and practice. The blue cluster, 
where we have journals such as World Development and European and Urban and Regional Studies, and finally the Red Cluster, where we have international organization in the Pacific Review. As for the social structure, we analyze the um, uh, authors collaboration network. Uh, here we have many groups formed, but uh, most of them are pairs of authors that are usually writing together. So for Web of Science, we have eight groups found, but the most important ones are um, the yellow one where you have Schneider and uh, Herwards and uh, the next uh, important uh, cluster is the red one where we have Gonzalez Fernandez and Gonzalez Velasco. And for Scopus, we have 10 groups full form, but the most important one is the uh, red one where we have Williams uh, and Windbank and also the blue cluster where we found again Schneider and Herwards. Uh, as in conclusion, the most significant sources are uh, papers in regional science, regional science, uh, international uh, journal of urban and regional research and entrepreneurship and uh, regional development. Uh, the most prolific authors were found to be uh, Williams, Schneider, Herward, uh, Brock, uh, Gonzalez, Fernandez, and Gonzalez Velasco. Uh, based on the number of citation, the most uh, impactful papers were um, the effects of spillover in Boston biotechnology community and slummage cities rethinking the subaltern urbanism. The most prevalent keywords were entrepreneurship, regional integration, informal settlements, and regional economy. And thus, uh, for the collaboration between the authors, um, the most important one, which is found in both data since it's between Schneider and his collaborators. This is all. Thank you all for the attention. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions uh, for this presentation as well as maybe the previous one as well? Again, you can send your questions and comments via email as well when I share the emails of all presenters. Okay, now, so we have now 20 minutes left uh, before the next session starts, session six starts. So let's give a 20 minute break. And after 20 minutes, we'll continue with session number six where we will have three presentations. So let's give a break until 5.45 p.m. Uh, in GMP plus three. So let's wait two more minutes and then we'll start in two minutes, hopefully. Uh, Brenda, uh, when you start sharing your screen, we can't see your screen. So it says that you have started screen sharing, but for some reason, okay, now it's started. Okay, perfect. Perfect. <clears throat> Can you confirm? Can you also see when I change the yes, slide? Yes. yes, we can see. Okay. After. No worries. Great. <laughs> okay, I think we can start now, Brenda, if you are ready. Um, yeah, so I'm going to jump right into it, given the time limitations. 
So this project is um, essentially about labor flows in, in Vietnam and specifically about uh, inflows and outflows from formal employment and how it relates to the dynamics of the formal wage premium. So um, we, I'm gonna describe the data that we use, but just as a primary, like why is Vietnam an interesting case to study formality in? Well, Vietnam has had an important transition in recent years. And uh, as part of that transition, one of the things that we observe is that over the past decade, there was an important uh, rise in formality. So the, as I'll show you in some graphs, the share of formal employment went from around 20% to 30% in less than a decade. So they had a like, large 50% increase. I want to study what that's about. So to do that, we are gonna answer we do a lot of things in this project, but I want to focus today on three of the things that we do. The first one is we're going to show you some like basic facts about Vietnam's labor market with a focus on a flow approach to studying um, labor. So we're going to estimate inflows and outflows rates across various labor market statuses. So we're going to look at inactivity, employment, unemployment, formality, uh, and then also different industries, cross-sectoral um, changes uh, of workers that transition across occupations as well. Um, so we're gonna show you all of that. And then um, after looking at that, we're gonna say, well, what drives, which of these transitions is what matters for both unemployment rates and specifically for formal employment. And we're gonna decompose this increase in formality that we observe in Vietnam into three um, channels. One is, you know, changes in the job finding probability, changes in the job separation probability. And the last one, the last channel that we'll explore is just changes in the composition of the workforce. And finally, and this is still uh, preliminary work, we're gonna look at what explains the dynamics of the formal wage premium, right? So we see that that declines over time. And we're gonna look at whether, first of all, workers seem to be transitioning towards jobs that have more or less wage growth. Um, we're gonna look also at whether those are the type of industries or occupations that uh, tend to have a higher or a lower wage uh, premium. And finally, we're gonna use a model. We're gonna uh, implement the Inver 2012 model uh, into the formal sector to study the wage, this the wage gap dynamics. So we're gonna decompose the wage gap um, changes into changes uh, due to sorting and changes due to comparative advantage. So that's, uh, that's, that's everything that we do. The data that we use, um, which we got access to uh, thanks to the statistic office in Vietnam is a two quarter panel. So there's approximately 60 to 70,000 households on an average quarter, and we're able to track um, them for you know two, two panels. So it's a two period panel, right? And this data has a lot of information about the household. So we are able to see for each household member, what is their current labor force status? So we uh, see Brenda, they're employed, uh, unemployed. Brenda, mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt. We can't, if you are changing okay. slides, we can't see you are changing slides, so. Oh, yeah, I was, uh, what I was asking about, let me see. Uh, hold on. I was changing slides at least. Uh, no worries, let's see. How about now? Can you see it change? Yes, now it works. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me know if that happens again. Um, if I seem to be stuck in the same slide. Um, okay. So those were the questions that I was going to answer. And now we're on to like the data. Um, so the type of things that we see, we see labor for starter, like I was saying, we see what type of firm the worker is at. So as you all know, I don't need to explain this to this audience. There's this distinction between whether the firm or the you know, employer is formal or not and whether the job is formal or not. So we're able to see both of those things. We're gonna focus for this project on whether the job is formal. Both of this uh, follow the International Labor Organization definitions. So we're able to see industries in, in great detail and then also occupations among many social demographic characteristics for the individual, like their gender, their age, their education, and, and so on. All right, so um, did you move slides with me? You should be seeing a graph right now. Yes, it works. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Just, just trying to make, make 100% sure. Okay. 
So this is what I was telling you about. So the blue line in, in the graph shows this increase in uh, formal jobs. So the rate of formal jobs goes around from 21% all the way up to like 32% uh, by 2020. Um, so we're trying to explain this. Meanwhile, we look at as well like, as, like changes in the unemployment rate. We can uh, explain both using inflows and outflows. And traditionally, like literature in developed countries tends to use this flow approach to explain changes in unemployment rates. Uh, for us, uh, it's what well, we're going to focus on is formal employment. We want to explain this, this rise. Um, and then similarly, what I was mentioning earlier, this is the formal informal wage gap. And what we see is that through time, this has been declining. In other words, the difference between uh, how much a formal job pays and an informal one pays has been decreasing. So to the extent that we see higher inflows or lower separations of workers from formal jobs, combined with the fact that we observe this decline in the difference in wages between formal and informal uh, employees, this would seem to indicate that inequality across sectors um, could have declined. Okay. So finally, here we look at the distribution of uh, this formal informal wage, um, of formal and informal wages across time. So what we see is that informal wages have lower means, which is something that is observed in, in several uh, settings. Um, and importantly also that uh, formal wages seem to be more dispersed. So it tends to be the case that there's more a higher variance uh, for formal wages that changed by 2020. So by early 2020, this is for the first quarter of 2020. So before the bulk of the pandemic had hit, uh, we see that the distribution uh, for formal wages seems to be uh, more compressed and the mean of both sectors seems to be um, closer together, which is again consistent with the gap being decreasing through time. Um, the next thing that we do is we estimate inflows and outflows rates. Again, we do this for many possible labor market states, many combinations. Uh, we do it by gender, by age, by educational groups. Uh, and this is just like one of the many graphs that, that, that we generate. And the main takeaway from these graphs is that the rise in um, formal employment is mainly attributable to a decline in job separation. So formal jobs are becoming more stable. Now, we also find an increase in job finding rates. And importantly, most of this increase in job finding rates is driven, driven by um, more educated workers, younger workers, and um, it's driven by people who previously had an informal job. So these are not people who are unemployed or not active and now all of a sudden have a higher probability of finding a formal job, or rather it tends to be folks that already had a job, just it was an informal job, and now have a higher rate of transitioning into the formal economy. So in this sense, this is indicative of um, informality now being more likely to serve as a stepping stone for a formal job than it was before. Right. So another one of the things that we do is we do a decomposition analysis. We want to understand if this increase uh, in job finding rates for people that were previously informal and this decline in job separation rates uh, by people who are now formal is driven by a change in the finding rates themselves, or if it's driven by a change in the composition of the labor force. So perhaps there has been an increase in a particular group of workers that were more likely to have a formal job to begin with, right? So younger, more educated, maybe education increased, and that's what's driving the increase in, in um, formality. So for that, we split the labor force into groups based on age, education, and gender. This is just a snapshot of the full table. So of course, just every group is in there. Uh, this is like a, a basic decomposition. And what we find is that most of the effect is driven by the what we call coefficient effect, which means the probability of uh, finding a formal job has increased across all groups rather than there's been this change in the composition of the labor force. That's, the, that's this finding, which makes sense because the, the time period is fairly short to observe a large um, modifications in the labor force composition. Like it's not like over 
seven years, you're going to see this like shift, demographical shift towards younger workers or more educated workers. So it's a relatively, it's, it's a um, you know, reasonable result, I would say. All right. So this is, let me see how much time I have, uh, five minutes. So maybe rather than talking about this, um, you know, this is just, we do it by, we also look at sector transitions. We look at the correlation between the change in wages and outflow rates to different sectors. And we find that the sectors that people are moving towards tend to be those that have uh, a smaller change, uh, sorry, moving out of. The sectors that workers are moving out of are those that experienced um, a smaller wage growth. So there's a negative correlation between moving out of your sector and, and wage growth, which again, which seem to indicate that they're potentially moving towards better, better jobs. Um, okay, so the last thing that I wanna talk about is, uh, and this is um, a part of the project that is still in the works, but we have some preliminary results. So what we want to do is we see that there's this change in the formal uh, wage premium. It has been declining and we want to explain it. So what we do is we write down a simple model uh, following invert 2012. So this is following invert very closely. We're actually just applying their model to the formal informal uh, wage premium. So what they do is they split earnings in any one sector into a worker's comparative advantage. So this is a worker fixed effect that returns to those skills. So on the one hand, a worker can see a higher wage because they're better at a, a, in a formal job, for example, or perhaps because the return to being better in a formal job has changed with time. Um, we also include just like a formal sector time varying wage premium, a time fixed effect and a losing character. So the equation there on the slide shows what, what will determine wages, right? So we're gonna, this, this model is identified from those workers that switch from one sector to the other across the panel that we observe them. So of course, being able to have panel data is crucial for, for the estimation of this model. And then also a key assumption that I wanna highlight is that in order for um, these estimates to be unbiased, and to actually reflect comparative advantage and selection, we would need the residual the idiosyncratic term, UIT in the equation, to be um, exogenous once we control for the worker fixed effect and the employment sector. So that means that your idiosyncratic shock doesn't affect your sector of employment after controlling for your fixed effect, for your comparative advantage. So that's a strict assumption However, I want to point out that this is um, time varying, the discretion of time varying, as is the sector. So what this really means is that if there's frictions to transitioning from one sector to the other, it might well be that even if you get a really high idiosyncratic shock to your earnings in a particular sector, then that won't affect your ability to immediately transition to a different sector job. So in that sense, if there's frictions, maybe the assumption is not too, too terrible. Um, so we estimate this model using these transitions. Any worker has four possible employment histories. So you, they were either formal all the time, informal all the time, or they switch across the two. Um, so we use a nonlinear least squares estimation to um, estimate the parameters in the equation that you see in this slide, subject to the constraint that the average uh, earnings um, have not changed. So this, this is the, the, the idea, that we normalize earnings in that sense. Um, and finally, in my last minute, let me just you know, summarize what we get out of this and what, what I have shown you so far. So in terms of the basics, basic facts on informality and its transitions, informal employment is persistent for any one individual, even though the probability of finding a job from informality uh, to a formal job has increased mainly for young, um, workers and for educated workers. Uh, sectors and occupations are also highly persist persistent. Once you start in a sector or occupation, you're likely to remain in it. However, if you do leave, it seems to be correlated with wage growth. Um, the rise in formal employment is again attributable to job to job transitions. So formal jobs are becoming more stable and people that already have a job in the informal sector are more likely to move to formality. And finally, from the results from this uh, formal gap selection model, 
are consistent with an increase in uh, the use of informal jobs, again, being used as a stepping stone, in the sense that this worker fixed effect, the comparative advantage that we estimate, seems to be a key driver in the decline for the formal informal wage gap. So again, it's consistent with there being a different set of workers now in, in the formal sector, which, which is driven down the difference between the two um, wages. So um, I think I am basically right on time. So um, with that, I conclude. Thank you. There's our emails if you want to email us any of your comments or questions. Thanks. Thank you, Brenda. Um, yeah, so again, I will share emails so you can send your questions and comments to Brenda and Christian later. Uh, we do not have the second presenter here yet, so I don't know why, but Anna did not show up uh, even though she has confirmed. But let me just read her abstract anyway. Uh, Anna Kovacic from Chile. Uh, the title of her paper was Formalization of Informality in Latin America. And she was basically evaluating some policies towards uh, informal employment reduction in Chile uh, and uh, who bears the cost of those kind of policies. That, that, was, that was what her chapter was about. And he, what she finds out is that, that some of the most recent measures related to informal employment involved criminalization of self-employed informality and the incorporation of workers into precarious formality where it is expensive and time consuming to enforce employment contracts and most of the costs of formality are borne by workers. That was her contribution. Okay, so now I think we can continue with the third presentation of this session, uh, the paper by Gorana Kristic and Branko Rodlovic. The floor is yours. I think Branko is gonna be making the presentation. As far as uh, Thanks for your attention. I don't know whether you see the presentation or not. Yes, you can see it perfectly. Okay, yeah. let me just start from the beginning. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is uh, close to the, the first paper in, in this section, but this time we are dealing with the businesses, not uh, with the labor force. So the title is The Propensity of Businesses to Participate in Shared Economy and Transition Between Formality and Informality. Uh, I, Similar to the previous paper, this time case is the country uh, that the paper is about is Serbia, that we are both Goran and I am coming from. So, uh, to, we, without the further ado, let me just say what are the three aims of the paper, what we'd like to, to, to discuss. The first is we would like to see what are the determinants of participation in formal economy. So, basically, the question is what kind of companies, what kind of attitudes are drawing uh, companies into informal economy? whether they are uh, participating or not. The second question is not only about whether they participate, but what is the level of involvement? So uh, what share of their total business is uh, related to informal economy? And finally, we also look at the transition from formal to informal and vice versa. So we are also looking at transition matrix, but this time uh, from the business perspective. Uh, I like, we don't have too many data points. This is not a labor force survey. So, but however, we do have a survey and uh, we conducted three uh, company surveys in 2012, 17, and 22. So we basically designed a questionnaire to elicit information in order to measure the shadow economy or formal economy sharing in uh, gross domestic product. But we also tried to see what are the factors that are uh, uh, drawing companies into uh, uh, informal economy. So we have representative samples. So it's over 1,000 business entities in Serbia. Uh, and we do have a panel component. That means that we do have a section of, of these companies which we track uh, throughout these surveys. So we used face-to-face uh, uh, -face interviews. The same frames, as I mentioned, uh, is, is based on all registered businesses in Serbia. And uh, everything is represented at a national level by region, sector of economic activity and business entity size. So we do have quite a lot of questions. Um, I, Goran, I think, is here, so so uh, uh, we may you may also share this with, with uh, the rest of our researchers that are interested in it. But we have uh, questions that are related to involvement of surveyed enterprise in various forms of informal economy, but also what are the attitudes, what are their perceptions about the involvement of the other enterprises in the same industry in such activities. So. Um, 
with respect to this first uh, goal of our paper, would, that we would like to, to explain what are the demands of participation in the formal economy. Basically, we, we use a simple uh, logic model that's uh, uh, shown here, and we use a question on whether the company has unreported profits, unreported wages, so remuneration of workers, or unreported uh, uh, VAT or some business transactions that are out of uh, uh, business uh, statements that are not represented in, in, in business books. So we have a literature review uh, that we uh, uh, use to uh, establish all these variables that uh, should explain this propensity of companies to uh, be involved in informal economy. And basically we have, uh, to cut a long story short, we have a four groups. First are communities of business entities. So uh, like type, ownership, size, but also something which is rather important that we believe it, uh, whether they are connected entities, whether uh, these are zero uh, employee companies. So basically, we saw that this is rather important in our previous research. Also, we have a portion that deals with perception and attitudes. We again uh, observe, for example, that uh, tax morality, uh, when we ask using liquor scale, uh, whether this is uh, acceptable or totally unacceptable. So basically, we ask questions uh, on whether and to what extent uh, this is uh, fine with, with companies to be engaged in the shared economy. And also a portion that deals with the business results because uh, when uh, if they face dire straits, then companies are much more prone to, to be involved in, in uh, shared economy. So this is just uh, uh, things that we are, we are uh, looking at. And we do have uh, uh, results. Uh, this is just, we have quite a lot of models, but basically what we see is that uh, if you have uh, uh, companies, for example, with a lot of connected parties uh, that are not having employees, uh, those are extremely prone to be involved in, in the shared economy. So this is also something that we believe it's rather useful for tax authorities, for example, because this would help them to, to better focus their, their uh, supervisory activities and, and look at uh, the exact portion of economy and the types of companies that are much more involved. And also there are several other uh, significant results uh, that uh, we see that de depends on specifications, et cetera. So basically just to, to uh, go back uh, on, on the left side, we basically say uh, there is it's a binary. If, if you have unreported profits, unreported wages or unreported VAT, whatever, then you are uh, uh, you have a presence in informal economy. The second portion deals with the uh, level of involvement in, in shared economy. Again, here we use uh, uh, regression, and uh, we here uh, look at unreported proportion of production of enterprise. So basically, uh, on the right side, pretty much same uh, uh, variables are are involved, but what's a bit different, we try to uh, estimate this. Uh, uh, intensity of, of shared economy, for example, company based on methodology suggested by Putnich and Soka. So uh, uh, these researchers are uh, basically produce methodology to estimate uh, uh, intensity of, of uh, businesses involvement in, in shared economy. And this is what's on our website. This is basically based on income approach uh, when we measure gross domestic product. So we again use data from enterprise survey. However, this time we use indirect questions on unreported profits, uh, profits and unreported wages relating to uh, other enterprises that operate in the same sector instead of direct questions relating to enterprises of the owners and managers. Uh, I'm not going to go into details because this methodology is, I, I guess, uh, uh, so sort of well known. So these are some uh, 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 formulas that we use to derive this uh, proportion of shadow economy in, in uh, and, and magnitude of shadow economy in, in uh, terms of business entities. And again, we derived a, a, a number of, of results uh, for, for the sake of simplicity. It would be really hard for us to present all these regression results in, in a presentation because this is a rather large table. But basically here you see what are the key uh, uh, Bindings. Uh, here we also look at some uh, specifics of, of Serbia because we had recent uh, introduction of fiscalization requirements for additional portion of companies, so that turns to be uh, uh, rather important. But we also look at uh, sectors which are more, much more prone uh, uh, in, in doing business in, in shared economy, like construction, agriculture, and manufacturing. Uh, also, we saw that companies that are smaller with lower turnover are more prone 
uh, uh, to be in, in the shared economy. So uh, we basically then compare also the results of the first uh, uh, two uh, uh, econometrics approaches. Um, third part deals with uh, transition uh, probabilities. So here we assess transition probabilities of companies moving from one status like uh, in the previous case uh, here, you can be in a formal economy or uh, uh, move to formal or stay formal. So they're basically again for uh, statuses that, that we look at. So we also look at the flows and that's what we are trying now. This uh, portion of paper is still under development. So this is what we are looking at. So these are uh, results uh, that show transition matrix. So basically showing uh, what uh, uh, number of, of uh, share of, of companies stayed in a formal. This is the first uh, cell. Then uh, how many of those formal moved to informal compared to 2017 to 2022. And also we are doing the same things for uh, companies that used to be in formal sector, how much of them stayed and how much of them moved to uh, formal sector. So approximately what we saw it's, uh, and this is completely in accordance with the macro situation in, in Serbia, uh, companies tend to now move from uh, informal to uh, formal sector. In, uh, it's much more intense uh, a movement in that respect than vice versa. Uh, and only two out of 10 companies that were in the informal economy uh, remained there. So basically we saw that there is this effect that companies basically, they are starting, they are, they are uh, uh, using this informal sector as a cushion because they cannot maybe sustain uh, tax burden or for some of the other reasons. And uh, this is just a simple illustration, I'm not sure whether this uh, should be inserted in, in a handbook once we get there, but it's, it's a nice way how you can basically simplify and look, uh, show this, uh, this moment in, in, in concrete example. So what uh, uh, we are uh, currently intend to do is basically probably do some sort of uh, multinominal uh, a logistic regression and, and try to see what are the, the, the statuses here and how we can explain uh, these movements uh, based on our, our data. So uh, thanks for the presentation. Again, uh, uh, these are our emails. So Goran is also present. So if, if she wants to add something, uh, I would be really happy to, to hear. Thanks. Uh, there is a question for you, uh, Branko, uh, from the yeah. chat box by Brenda. Yeah. Uh, can you identify new firms and firms that exit? And if so, wouldn't it make sense to include entry and exit in the transition matrix? Uh, new firms, well, we are dealing with the registered companies only. So for this uh, uh, transition, we are only uh, have companies that used to be in the pre in the panel. We have companies that are uh, uh, that were in in, uh, in uh, registry in 2017. And that are still now. We also have a portion of uh, survey which is not panel because we have a new uh, company, so we have newly registered. So this we, we can deal with this only in the first section of our paper. So I'm not sure whether I I, I, I provided an answer. Okay, thank you, thank you, Branko. Um. Okay, so. Unless there are any questions now, actually, we can now give a break until 7 p.m. So a 45 minute break now, actually. It was supposed to be a 15 minute break, but now that we have ended early, so we can now uh, give a break until 7 p.m. So we're gonna, we are gonna start with session number seven, right at seven, that is in about 47 minutes. Maybe you can have some lunch or dinner, depending on where you are. Or maybe breakfast, I don't know. Thank you and bye-bye. See, see you in 47, 46 minutes. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you.
Okay, we will start in one minute, <clears throat> but in preparation of the session, let me just uh, mention that there are four presenters here, and all are here right now. The first presenter is going to be Cristina Fernandez, who will be presenting a paper titled Firms, Informality and Institutions, the case of Colombia. Then comes Anastasia Litina. Uh, her paper title is Corruption, Tax Evasion and Social Values and Immigration-Based Analysis. Then we'll have a joint paper by Adriana Ana Maria Davidescu, Friedrich Schneider, Eduard Mihai Manta, Monica Orliana Petku, and Christina Stefania Curea. The title of the paper is Exploring the Relationship Between Informality and Sustainable Development Goals, a Bibliometric Analysis. Finally, we will have Fatih Kırşanlı, who will be presenting about institutional quality and informal sector in MENA countries, if I'm not mistaken. So um, let's start with uh, the first presenter, Cristina Fernandez. So please, the floor is yours, Cristina. Uh, we can't hear you, you are muted. Okay, okay. So I hope that now it's fine. Uh, yeah, so on the program it says that in uh, Universidad Rosario, but in fact, I'm from Universidad, uh, Universidad Los Andes, but in fact, I, mean, I am from Universidad del Rosario. Um, and this is a paper named Firms, Informality and Institutions. And first, I'm going to present you very briefly an introduction, the data, the model, the comparative study, statics, and then the conclusions. Well, and well, let's start by the introduction. Um, the, tra the traditional analysis has pointed uh, to the payroll taxes as the main cause of informality, particularly in Latin America. However, most studies have found limited effect upon the reduction and even no effect in the case of Peru, where the reduction in payroll taxes was huge. Then some authors claim that the lack of enforcement may be the reason um, for this, um, for having found enough uh, impact and, and that we have to concentrate in, in enforcement. However, thinking, for example, in uh, Colombia and many of our countries with several institutional weakness is unlikely to have enforcement policy as the main driver of informality. Additionally, I always have problems with enforcement policies because they, they can be very ineffective and they can be very in, in, inequitable um, if applied if, uh, over small and less productive agents. Then the employee mission of Colombia done by Levy and Maldonado signaled that the behavior of uh, informality was mostly due to the complicated labor and social security system, but did not elaborate much in their interaction with the tax system. And that's what I'm going to be do here. And particularly, um, so having this in mind, the research question is, and the uh, under the local institutional arrangement, what are the main characteristics of the firm's universe in Colombia with emphasis in size, business, and labor informality, and particularly to estimate a model that allows to understand the relationship between labor informality, firm informality, and firm size under an institutional arrangement with minimum wage, labor cost deduction and tax waivers for small firms. So there, are, the complexity of the institutional framework is uh, large, but I'm gonna concentrate in these three types of institutions that in, in Colombia, we have the three of them. And I think that a lot of countries have the three of them and one of, with more or less emphasis. And um, why these three uh, why these three institutions? Firstly, in Colombia there is a yearly income threshold on which firms are not obliged to pay taxes. It's around forty six million pesos. That it's about fourteen thousand um, dollars. And uh, there is another threshold for the VAT. And uh, what happens that? Um, there is also a formal labor cost deduction from the income database. And it seems it, it is not only that you can deduct the social security, but all formal labor costs. That's a huge deduction. 
So what happens that um, the firms that are bigger than $14,000 a year um, um, are, has this deduction. So for them, it's almost indifferent to hire uh, workers formally or informally because the cost is very similar. However, the, the um, business that are below the tax treasure uh, have to pay um, the, the total amount of the social security. So for them, the difference is huge. And I'm gonna show you this in number. And with the minimum wage, it happens more or less the same. For with this very small companies, um, they have to um, face all the increase in the minimum wage, whereas large countries, large companies, because of the cost deduction, um, can waive a lot of this cost. And here is numerically what happens if the, the firm is very small, um, they have a social security of almost 50%, and that's the difference um, to hire someone formally or informally. Whereas if the firm is larger, they have a tax deduction of 42%, and they only have to, file to, to pay 5% to hire a formally instead of informally. So it's a, it's a huge difference between, between small and bigger firms. Um, and you will think that this is very marginal because $14,000 is not much, but at least in Colombia, this amounts uh, to um, a, almost 80% of the firm's universe in, in the country, 80% of the firms that have more than one employment, uh, employer. Employment, uh, so 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 it it really matters. Um, well, first I'm gonna tell very quickly about the data. Um, in Colombia, we don't have a recent census, and as happened in many other countries. Uh, so what I did is I put together a lot of um, of several uh, surveys that we have in the country for small firms, for trade firms, for service firms, for manufacturer firms. And I fill the gaps using the household survey by the, under the assumption that one independent worker is one firm. So one, one boss is equivalent to one firm. And if the total number of employers is representative of the total number of employers in the country, it, it will be representative of the total number of firms in the country. Um, and I get um, all my estimates, I, I, I almost get like 70% uh, of the total number of firms estimated by other means. So I think that is uh, quite, I mean, it's, it's not great, but it's good enough. Um, and the model, well, the model I'm based on uh, Ulysses model. Um, where the firms have to, to face an extensive margin of paying taxes and intensive margins uh, where they have to pay the health and pension contributions. And on top of that, the um, firms have to pay um, taxes, but if they are below the threshold, they don't have to pay those taxes. Um, the production function is the same for formal and informal firms, and there is a cost of being informal of or of hiring informal people. And this cost is quadratic in the number of firms, in the number of workers of each firm. Um, so here I'm gonna jump to this. Um, so here we find like the, the maximization problem from each of the firms for the informal firms. Then there are some formal firms that only hire informal workers. There are some, um, formal firms that hire some skill formal workers and some formal firms that hire uh, some skill and skill um, formal workers. And what you see is that it's very important this term um, that uh, in the cost of um, being of hiring formal, um, it not only includes social security, but also the tax deduction as well as the minimum wage. And that's I think that that's important. And the other thing is that, of course, these, the, there are these thresholds where um, small firms do not pay taxes. And 
So I'm gonna jump, and this is um, estimated by to a stage minimum distance indicator that what it does is to take the distributions that are shown in the data and the distribution that are generated by the model and it minimizes the distance um, adjusting some parameters that you are not sure about it. And what I got is that the parameters are very much what I thought they were going to be, except in the case of um, the enforcement. And what I found is that the enforcement is much slow, much lower than in the case of Brazil, for example. Uh, and uh, and um, and Mexico, and and my hypothesis that this is due to the uh, institutional constraints. So what it says is that it's not what shapes informality over the number of uh, workers in a firm. It's not enforcement. It's not that if the firm is bigger, is more prone to be um, um, fined by the authorities but the institutional constraints that it makes for bigger firms, it makes cheaper to fire or at least not expensive to hire formal workers, whereas for small firms is quite expensive. And the model fits very well. Here is um, what I found in the data and in the model. And here are the, here are the fit of the model in the extensive margin, in the intensive margin, and the skilled workers share. And then I did some comparative statics. Uh, there are policies on the extensive margin that is reducing the entry cost in 50%, double the enforcement and the extensive margin, reduce the income tax in 50%, and reduce the VAT tax in 50%. And what did they found? Well, there are a number of firms that with the formal entry cost reduction of 50%, um, a number of firms enter the market, and particularly the small firms that do not pay taxes. And this general equilibrium impact, um, this has a general equilibrium impact on always formal and always informal firms. That the value of informal firms decrease because it's more costly to be form informal. And this is particularly big, uh, true in big firms, but the most affected ones are the small ones that do not have to pay taxes. That with the reduction in taxes, um, is positive for formal and negative for informal firms because of competition. And particular informalization is easier, particularly in big firms that are the ones more affected uh, by taxes. So in general, it's found that the policies on the extensive margin are effective in reducing the number of formal firms, but they don't have much impact on reducing labor informality. In fact, they can increase labor informality because if the firms that enter the market are a very small firms or if the income tax is reduced and therefore the tax reduction is reduced. Um, and taxes in, get lower in the taxes scenario or if the entering firms are small and get higher in the enforcement scenarios. In the intensive margin, I have in a lower payroll taxes, double labor enforcement, and a flat rate instead of the tax break that we have. And I found that the reduction in tax impacts big firms that are the ones that are higher formally and small firms because of competition, that enforcement has a bigger impact on big firms. And the flat rate has very in fact in very similar impact at the lower in payroll taxes, but has a negative impact in the small firms and a more positive in, uh, impact in the bigger firms because you 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 make the small firms to pay um, taxes. Um, also, you find that the, those policy, in, in general, the policy to reduce the intensive margin are not very effective. They are consistent, but not very effective. And this is consistent with what the literature found. And uh, the enforcement on the intensive margin has limited impact because it becomes more profitable to become 100% informal uh, and higher informally and don't be subject to the authorities look. And uh, it does not have any impact on business informality. 
And of course, taxes increase in the flat rate scenario and decrease if payroll taxes are reduced. So two well-intended policies to reduce informality as the income tax waiver for small firms and the income tax deduction of labor costs end up generating a large amount, amount of small firms hiring workers without a formal work uh, contract. And also find that there is no a single policy that can magically reduce informality by itself. And this is plain so much many decades of unsuccessful efforts. Uh, that the reduction in payroll taxes has a moderate impact on informality and uh, ties the fiscal accounts. Uh, that the policies and the extensive margin are more effective, but do not necessarily increase labor informality. And this leads to the question of the importance to formalize small firms, small for business, because why do you want to formalize them if they are not going to pay taxes and um, they don't are, are they don't have the intensives, the in incentives to uh, hire with a formal contract? Um, and policy recommendation is. Being that the small that the bigger firms are not paying really the social security because of the tax deduction, it very it, it shouldn't be that hard to move to a system of general taxes to finance social security. Um, and well, there are some also partial uh, solutions as to generate vouchers of social security that the firms have to start paying. I mean, have can redeem once they start paying taxes and that it will be good because it's an incentive to grow. Um, and also in the single tax scheme, you can um, charge it not over, um, not over um, gross income, but gross income net on formal labor cost. And in this case, like the small firms will have uh, a similar uh, treatment as the bigger firms. And um, well, this is the paper. Thank you, thank you, Christina. Um, thank you for the presentation. Since we are again strict in time, and now we have four presentations of this session. So let's immediately continue with the next presenter. And again, comments, suggestions can be sent to the presenters via email. I will share all of your emails with you after the workshop. Uh, the next speaker is Anastasia Litina, uh, if she is ready. Uh, Anastasia, can you hear us? Uh, maybe not. Okay. Then maybe we can continue with the third presenter for now. And when Anastasia is back, we can continue with her. Uh, Edward, are you there? Or I assume Edward is going to present, but I don't know whether. Maybe, okay, he's also having dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and then let's continue with Fatih. Fatih is there. I can see Fatih. So Fatih Kirshanlı. Ah, Edward is also back. <laughs> but let's, let's continue. Yeah, sorry. Anyway, let's continue with Fatih first. Uh, so sorry. if possible. So uh, Fatih, the floor is yours. I, I made you co-host so you can share your screen. Sure. Sure, thanks very much. Uh, can you hear me clearly right now? Excellent. Okay, let me share my screen. Um, <clears throat> all right. Um, um, thanks very much, uh, Professor uh, Jayun, giving me this opportunity to actually contribute to the handbook of uh, informal economy. Uh, the chapter that I actually propose to uh, contribute is titled The Institutional Quality and Informal Economy Nexus in the Middle East and North Africa. So the motivation of me is coming from the idea that both institutional quality, in fact, the lower institutional quality and higher informal economy or informal sector as quite common in the Middle East and North African context. And I think that this is going to be uh, some sort of uh, good contribution uh, to the book. So um, the framework that I have in my mind is first to give some sort of uh, understanding of lower institutional quality in the Middle East, and then talk about with the same context in the informal economy, uh, why we are having, let's say, a higher informal economy sector 
um, or why informal economy constitutes a big or large uh, share of GDPs in the Middle Eastern and North African uh, economies. And then lastly, talk about the relationship or intertwined relationship between institutional quality and informal economy. So um, uh, according, to, uh, <clears throat> according to Douglas North, uh, the actually who is the who is one of the forefathers of so-called new institutional economics institutions are defined as the rules of the game in a society or more formally are the humanly devised constraints that shape human interaction so by uh considering this definition um the world bank has classification under the world governance indicators which measures the institutional quality in six categories. And these are uh, voice and accountability, political stability and absence of violence and terrorism, government effectiveness, regulatory quality, rule of law and control of corruption. Although I'm thinking to actually touch upon each and every determinant of these institutional measures, uh, the main concentration will be on the control of corruption because I think I believe at least <clears throat> with my own reading and then the literature that the control of corruption or the corruption measurement uh, is actually a big part of institutional quality, right? So um, corruption in, uh, in the context of prominent international institutions such as World Bank or Transparency International is defined as the abuse of uh, public office for private gain. Uh, although there are critiques against this definition, Right, because the definition concentrates mostly on the public office, the critiques, one of the critiques, for example, what about the private co uh, corruption, et cetera. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna to spend too much time explaining these, but uh, at least I can say there's a consensus on the corruption literature in the definition of corruption as the abuse of public office for private gain. And when we look at the, when we look at the institutional deficiencies, uh, these are mostly uh, are the outcome of uh, uh, prevalent uh, corruption. And in the corruption literature, we see that the overwhelming majority of the studies find or show the negative repercussions of corruption on macroeconomic variables, starting from Mauro 1995 and others. Um, and on the other hand, we see some other studies they find the positive effects of uh, corruption. Uh, although these are uh, like um, less number of studies, we can say that the most of the studies concentrate on the negative out, uh, um, consequence of corruption, at least uh, in the in the long run. And the points that uh, I've counted so far here uh, can be said likewise in uh, about the informal economy uh, that constitutes a large part of the GDPs, especially in the developing economies. And according to Schneider. Uh, the informal economies is a big portion of GDPs in the Middle East and North African countries as well. For example, in 2019, 32% of the Algerian economy, almost 31% uh, of the Egyptian economy, 29% of the Lebanese, 38% of the Libyan, 30% of Moroccan and 35% of Tunisian economies are actually uh, um, uh, um, uh, obtain their total GDPs from the uh, informal sector. And when I look at the basic correlation between corruption and informal economies in 2017, I find like 44% correlation between two, although there are some econometric, of course, disadvantages by looking at the raw correlation, but I just wanted to uh, emphasize the, the relationship between corruption and informal sector here, and particularly uh, within the context of the Middle East. And, um, and of course, uh, when we look at the, the reasons or the determiners, trigger point, triggering points of the informal economies or corruption in the Middle East and North Africa, this is mostly from the governmental issues, right? Um, I'll touch upon in the paper also how chronic capitalism plays a role in explaining this type of economy um, uh, in the Middle East. Also, of course, we see some sort of different version of chronic capitalism in the Gulf, but when I make an, some sort of political economy analysis, I'll explain these detail uh, in details. Um, and uh, last point about the informal economy, what we can see say is due to the government efficiencies and time consuming rules and regulations, informal economy actually may be helpful fostering economic growth in developing countries. 
However, the negative side of it is that it's it's not taxable, and then the government revenue seems to be lower due to informal economies. But then it comes to Latin American context, for example, although it's not, it's not uh, in the MENA, but it can the same thing can be said about the MENA is that informal economies may be helpful in economic development uh, due to the uh, bureaucratic impediments. Right? Does the uh, uh, the quality institutional quality improvement is required within the uh, for for the Middle East and North Africa? Uh, however, there are some sort of uh, political trade-offs here. For example, it may create some sort of unemployment because when we look at the demographics of the informal economy in the Middle East and North Africa, we see that the people who are in the labor force of informal economies are either uneducated or they have very low educational attainment. This is why while improving the institutional quality and lowering the corruption, governments actually should pro improve the educational quality for the long run. And also we need to have uh, some sort of improvement in the local, regional, and national uh, institutional capacities uh, when it comes to other uh, policy recommendations. And uh, also improving the awareness is one of, one of the uh, components of uh, eliminating or alleviating negative reverberations of a low institutional quality or higher uh, informal sector. Well, this is why what, uh, 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 like, uh, what I want to do as a summary in this paper is to provide some sort of political economy perspective on the relationship between institutional quality, more particularly on the corruption and informal economy in the MENA. And as I mentioned at the beginning, since both institutional quality or lower institutional quality and higher informal economy are important phenomena within the context of MENA, I think this will be a, a nice and significant contribution to the literature of um, uh, uh, the informal economy. Um, uh, this is this is what I want to do at least uh, um, for the next couple of months in this in this book chapter. Um, thanks very much. Thank you, Fatih. Um, so let me call again Anastasia. Maybe she's here. Anastasia, are you back? <clears throat> well, otherwise, we'll continue with Edward. Yes, Edward, or I don't know who's going to present, but uh, will you present or Mr. Davidescu? Uh, I think I will present, but... Uh, Good evening. Um, I'm so happy to be here with you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and uh, Edward, one of my co-authors, will, will present okay. our paper. Okay. Uh, he's already the co-host, so he can uh, share his screen if he's ready. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, this time uh, our paper is called Exploring the Relationship Between Informality and Sustainable Development Goals Through a Bibliometric Analysis, and uh, the authors are uh, me, um, uh, Adriana Davidescu, Friedrich Schneider, Monica Aureliana Petku, and uh, Stefania Cristina Curea. Uh, basically, the objective uh, and research uh, for this paper is to investigate the relationship between informality and the SDGs and highlighting the dynamics of the uh, literature and the future research directions. Um, this is different uh, from the previous um, bibliometric analysis uh, because this one take, takes into consideration the sustainable development, while the other one, the previous one, was uh, focused on the regional shadow economy. And for this paper, we used a bibliometric approach, exploring 256 documents from Google Scholar da database covering the period 2015-2020. Uh, for uh, this paper, the research questions were what is the trend of publications in the impact of informality on the SDGs, which are the most active journals, who are the leading authors, which are the key research topics, what is the intellectual structure of analysis in the impact of informality and the SDGs, and which are the relevant keywords clusters. Um, Basically, to improve uh, uh, the selection of the scientific uh, publications, the period between 2015 and 21, uh, 2021 was um, defined as a time span. And we used the keywords such as sustainable development goals, SDGs, and informality, as well 
as the phrase, the impact of informality on sustainable de development goals. Um, we have extracted um only articles written in english and um, our final sample uh, comprises of a total of 256 um, pub papers um the research structure is divided in three main steps the descriptive analysis the content analysis and the network analysis and for each we have um other three main steps like uh, yearly trend in the descriptive analysis, the most active journals for also for the descriptive analysis and the leading journals. While for the content, we have uh, the biograms and the correlations uh, work clouds, um, the topic modeling. And in the network, we have uh, approached the keyword uh, analysis and the co-citation analysis on both journals and authors. Uh, in terms of empirical uh, results, in accordance with our first research question, um, it can be observed that the most uh, articles exploring the implication between the informality and the SDGs were published in the period 2019 and 2020 with a clear uptrend. Um, in terms of sources with the highest number of articles, we have sustainability with 19 documents, uh, followed by the Overseas Development Institute with 12 documents, and so on. While in terms of citations, on the first place, um, there are the journals of sustainability, uh, sustainability and cities, followed by Overseas Development Institute. Um, in terms of authors with the highest number of articles, um, we have Tolu Oni with four publications, um, also Nu Sepal and Martin Goten Ababio. Uh, and this, um, actually, with this uh, table, we uh, answered to the third, our third research question. Uh, in terms of the most common words in the body of the literature, um, we have words such as informal, urban countries, economic, labor, health, work, services, sector, water, access, data, SDGs, and so on. Um, now, we analyzed also the most common words from the uh, perspective of the type of the document. Uh, and we have uh, three um, clusters, the words that are uh, the most common in the core economic uh, uh, type of papers in the multidisciplinary type of papers and the reports of institutional uh, in international institutional uh, and academic documents and um, basically in uh, the core economic uh, journals we have um, words such as employment informal sanitation being the most uh, often used then in the reports we have um, words like ecd early childhood childhood um, development uh, also sustainable in trade and energy and while in uh, terms of multidisciplinary paper, uh, journals the papers from the multidisciplinary journals we have informality water and tax as the most common words um okay um here we have the word uh, network in the scientific publications uh, con uh, content. Uh, we have considered the co-occurrence rate of at least 200 times as a frequency uh, for the word network. And we can highlight um, uh, pairs such as development, financial resources, uh, countries, income, growth, poverty, services, sport, public goals, informality, poor conditions, um, access, sustainable economic uh, or human challenges. And then in terms of um, the correlations, um, we used the value of 0 0.7 as a threshold in this case, and um, the most encountered uh, pairs in some of the subnetworks of the main network of correlation of words, we uh, encountered uh, pairs such as Latin American, Caribbean, civil society, tax, fiscal taxation, taxes, revenue, 
um, financing words such as uh, street vendors, uh, then government uh, implement agriculture, food, and so on. Now, examining uh, uh, which topics are uh, associated with the description fields, um, we have used an LDA approach and we discovered five main topics. The first one is composed by words such as um, or, uh, water, urban, informal services, axis, and uh, we called this topic as urban sanitation. Then the second one is uh, composed by words such as social countries, employment, income, and woman. And um, um, we, um, we discovered that uh, this topic is related mostly to women's agenda. And then we have informal workers, sector development, employment, the topic being uh, decent work. And um, uh, also we have development for forest, urban, sustainable countries. And uh, we called this topic sustainable, sustainably manage, managed forests and cities. And the last one um, uh, is uh, composed by words such as urban informal waste health development. And we defined the topic as healthcare development. Then in terms of journals co-citation, uh, the highest um, measure of uh, the highest degree of centrality was given by uh, the Journal of the United Nations, followed by uh, International, International Labor Organization and World Development. Um, and um, here we have the network um, analysis for the co citation of the journals. We can see the United Nations and uh, International Labor Organization. Um, then in terms of authors co-citation, the notes with the highest degree of centrality uh, are composed by authors such as Catherine Leonard, Helen Elsie, and Thais Grippa. Um, and in terms of co-citations, uh, the highest values are Beatrice Hattie, um, Caroline uh, Cabaria, and uh, Catherine Kyobutungi. Um, the most preeminent uh, keywords um, in the network uh, are informality, which has the highest degree of uh, centrality, uh, followed by Africa and employment. While in terms of frequency, Africa is the most frequent, uh, then uh, informality, and then poverty governments and informal settlements, and also SDGs. And here we have the network uh, of the keywords used by uh, the 256 papers. And basically, our, our, um, as a main conclusion, this study has uh, several significant contributions in the field. It's basically the first bibliometric analysis of the relationship between informality and SDGs using a mining approach instead of an automatiz automatization approach uh, using data um, um, taken for, from uh, databases such as Scopus of Web of Science. And the results of the studies uh, of the study are uh, of interest to government officials, companies, academia, and research organizations, allowing basically the understanding of the importance of the phenomenon, uh, noting the causalities and interdependencies between them, and providing decision makers with useful information and so on. That was our uh, presentation for the paper. Thank you, thank you, Eduard. Uh, any comments, suggestions, uh, questions? Again, you can direct those questions again directly to the authors after the workshop as well. Once I share the email information of everyone. Uh, Anastasia, are you back? I sent messages to her, but maybe she's not. So let me also try to not sure one more time without success, it seems. She's here, but for some reason, maybe she's away from her computer. Uh, okay, that's fine. Uh, so our next session is gonna be in about 20 minutes at 8 p.m. GMT plus three. So let's give a break until then. So we'll meet here again.
with those of you who have survived the whole day um, in about 20 minutes. Thank you. So we are in a break now. We'll be meeting again in about 19 minutes. But I made Philip, Emmanuel, and Patricia already co-hosts because, you know, so that they can share their screens once we start with the session. So we'll be here back in 19 minutes. Okay, I think we can start the preparations for uh, this session, session number eight now. Um, uh, Anastasia, I think you are back, but we have concluded session seven. So maybe in session nine, if we have some time left, you can present your paper. I think there was a misunderstanding about timing. All times were in GMT plus three. So uh, that is why I think uh, there was some confusion maybe, but uh, so it's already 8 p.m. now in GMT plus three. So session seven has concluded. Now we are in session eight. Um, that is why I called hi. your, I send you messages like whether you are ready Hello, to Yes, I saw it, but I was on my phone. Sorry. Yeah, for, yeah. Yes, I it was not an early presentation request. Like it was, you know, that was the time of your session. But if we have time, we can put you to the next session. Okay. Let's see mm -hmm. if we will have okay. any time left. Not okay. for that, but when calculating, uh, my impression was, uh, no, I, I'm confused. I need to re... It's all but like... My, my understanding was that it was at eight Greek time for no, some no, it, reason. There is a one hour difference between Greek time and the Tur Turkey time, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, I, I am. Yeah, I'm completely confused. I got it completely wrong. Sorry for that. Oh, so, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, no but, uh, okay, so, thanks. Okay, now let's start the session for the sake of time. So this is session number eight. We have three papers, or three chapters, so to speak. Uh, the first one is the scope and impact of policies formalizing informality in MENA countries by Philip Adair and Vladimir Vlasny. Then the second paper is by Emmanuel Umoru Haruna. The title is The Impact of Formalization Program on Informal Household Enterprise Performance, Evidence from a Micro-Level Quasi-Experiment in Nigeria. <laughs> then the third paper is by Patricia Costa Restrepo. The title of the paper is Informal Urban Development Management Schemes. So now the floor is yours, Philip. Uh, and uh, please, uh, if you okay. are ready. Fine, thank you very much. Thanks again uh, to those who organized this workshop, which is very welcome, uh, and to the participants, of course. Uh, can you see full screen my paper? Yes, yes, perfectly. Great. Okay. So I will skip page one. You know what it's about. Here is the outline uh, of the narrative, definition and theories of informality, occupational mobility, segmentation and gender, and ending with the formalizing informality in terms of issues and policies. And if I have time enough, I will say a few words in the conclusion. There are some uh, tables in the appendix. And once again, if I have time enough, I may put these on the screen. But it's mainly a narrative. So we address in this uh, presentation two research questions. One is a theoretical issue regarding the formal informal divide uh, as the following. 
why is there persistent labor market segmentation, which is, of course, already a, a theory in its own, and it unfolds with segmentation, gender pattern, and weak occupational mobility. Now, the policy issue is the following. What is the impact of the various formalization policies? So to cut a long story short, regarding definitions and theories of informality, uh, informality has been uh, studied, investigated for over half a century. And this is a very uh, strange but useful concept. And it, on the one hand, aligns with happy heuristics, but it also encapsulates distinct uh, theories and methodologies that are lacking consensus. Therefore, informality, starting right from the beginning in the early 1970s, that was 50 years ago or so, informality is a kind of fuzzy set standing at the intersection of multi criteria assessments, for instance, uh, enterprises on the one hand and households on the other hand. So we can think of informality using the Russian doll's definitions. That is to say, we have three components. One is informal employment in the informal sector, the other one is the overall informal employment, including the formal and the informal sector. And the last one would uh, aggregate uh, employment in the households. So you have distinct uh, lovely colors, uh, red, uh, gray, and uh, I don't know, vaguely uh, should be uh, uh, green, I suppose, ending with uh, blue. So we have an enterprise-based definition that was first set by the ILO uh, 30 years ago. Um, yes, that's it, uh, 30 years ago. Then we have the definition that is based on job. And this is the ILO also that presented this, um, that coined, I should say, this definition. And then we have... Uh, an overarching uh, definition that would include all those who are uh, domestic workers as well as family members that are providing services for their own final use. So it is quite large and we must be aware that it is difficult to make sure these definitions are uh, consistent with one another. Also as we uh, look at theories, we have a large spectrum, actually a threefold spectrum. And if we follow, which is our favorite, the pessimistic interpretation of dualism that was coined by Lewis a long time ago, which seems to be the most relevant theory according to Laporta and Schleifer, persistent informality comes from labor market segmentation and therefore, it would be due in the first place to the existence of barriers to entry to the formal economy within the context of weak job creation. And labor market segmentation is not congruent with either the institutionalist or the structuralist uh, theory, because uh, it is not... Uh, investigating the same side of the market. For instance, if we look at the labor market, dualistic theory is on the supply side, whereas the other two theories are on the demand side. You can put it uh, in another way, households versus enterprises. And if we look at goods and services, it is right the opposite, demand side in the dualistic theory and supply side in the two other theories. Labor market segmentation does not mean people move. Actually, there is some limited occupational mobility between segments, including from informal to formal employment. Uh, last, we are uh, insisting on the fact that if we look at status, income, and gender, 
And if we take into account the vulnerability to poverty risk, then there is also a gender issue, which is uh, important. In blue, you have mainly male workers, and in red, you find mainly female workers who are uh, absolutely at the basis of the staircase. Here are a few uh, descriptive uh, statistics. Maybe I don't want to uh, discuss these in detail. I just want to make sure that uh, it is different according to the status if we look at self-employed versus wage employees, and also if we take into account gender, main difference between male and female according to countries. So I don't want to give the impression that this is all uh, consistent across countries. There are some specific patterns. Now, turning to occupational mobility, segmentation and gender, there is weak uh, mobility, persistent segmentation and specific uh, gender patterns. For instance, uh, what we may find investigating the uh, transition matrices is that uh, in the past uh, decade, we can observe three distinct patterns. One is that young male workers are less mobile than females uh, are, and this is probably quite surprising. But if young females are more mobile, they eventually exit the labor force. Second, regardless youth starting as formal and informal wage earners, mobility underpins persistent labor market segmentation because formal employees obviously cling to their favorable uh, status while uh, informal uh, uh, applicants are queuing up to overcome these entry barriers to uh, formal jobs. And there is also some specific uh, behavior regarding self-employed in Egypt who seem to be more mobile. Second, uh, what we may observe is that job creation is favoring informal workforce. So there are two uh, main um, constraints. One is the mismatch between labor supply and labor demand. And of course, job creation does not fill in labor supply for skilled services in most cases. And second, job creation is biased towards manufacturing, building, and construction. And these uh, industries are hiring an outsized share of informal workforce. Now, let me jump to uh, section three. I have still a few minutes left, I believe. Just uh, let me know. I don't want to overshoot the target. Yeah, you have about five minutes left. Oh, great. That's generous. Thank you so much. So formalizing informality is uh, taking into account the issues and policies. As regards issues, it looks like a free player game with distinct targets and potential conflicts. First question is why formalize? And there are some prospective improvement for working individuals. For instance, they would like probably to benefit from social protection. There are also businesses who may wish to access to credit markets and public procurements. And of course, there is the society and the state, which uh, may be uh, wishing to broaden the tax basis or reducing tax rates. Not the only reason, but at least one. But these above issues may be conflicting. Extending social protection is an advantage for informal employees uh, at the cost of rising, at the expense, sorry, of rising labor costs for both formal and informal enterprises. At least this is a question mark. Unfair competition of informal businesses vis-a-vis -vis formal enterprises is also an issue and a source of conflict. And therefore, is there a trade-off between increasing tax receipt for financing uh, public goods versus laissez-faire 
in order to avoid social unrest? Still a question mark. Then last but not least is what is or what are the targets? Entrepreneurs versus employees or possibly both. Uh, will formalization reconcile entrepreneurship as advocated by the World Bank and extended social protection claimed by the International Labour Office? I will still leave the question mark. Starting uh, to answer the questions that were addressed in the previous slide, we find there is a broad range of formalizing uh, the informality to formalize uh, in order to choose the best policies. And obviously there is some moderate, modest impact. First, looking at scope, there are two categories of policies. One is those who are influencing uh, formalization, but this is not the main target. For instance, education policies versus policies that are aiming at informality as such. For instance, inform enforcing um, labor regulation, for instance. Second, what are the mechanisms and how do they, uh, how should they be used? We find that there are two categories of mechanisms. One is the carrot incentives. The other one is the stick penalties. Uh, if we look at incentives regarding uh, formalizing businesses, uh, we can uh, have a look quick look to the a list of the various um, incentives that have been used, information campaigns on the benefits of registration for businesses are ineffective, single window proved effective, uh, shrinking registration costs and providing a bonus uh, exerts a positive impact Whereas if we turn now to penalties, formalizing businesses and therefore also employment, uh, it is quite obvious that uh, law enforcement by the Labour Inspectorate, Inspectorate is uh, efficient. It has a minor but significant impact on the formal employment of workers. And of course, you can also use the same categories and address formalizing employment. For instance, looking at incentives, uh, registration of workers and reduce taxes and social security contribution would prove to be uh, effective to some extent. Last but not least, impact assessment is mostly so far addressing businesses rather than employees or employment by and large, whereas uh, targeting workers proves more effective than targeting enterprises, as uh, a few papers did uh, insist on this issue. If we just uh, use a quick list in order to have an overview, skill, skills training in Tunisia and Morocco uh, proved quite uh, effective support for Enterprise development uh, proved effective. Uh, uh, employment services had no impact and subsidized, sorry, it's not an S, it's a D. Employment in Jordan and Tunisia, for instance, uh, are not uh, sustainable on the long run. Last, macro policies yield positive and moderate small scale effect, uh, but they look quite uh, bright as compared with those who are focusing on the group or re region specific policy. So I'm jumping to the conclusions to have uh, one minute. Is that okay? Yes, yes, please. Okay, fine. So uh, the conclusion is that informality requires both ongoing thorough investigation and taking a stock of what has already been uh, um, stored in terms of data, 
but uh, as a matter of fact, uh, data collection was disrupted by COVID-19, which is quite unfortunate. Um, Formalization policies should be assessed according to their outcomes, whether decent employment and general welfare within formal sustainable organization will take place. In this respect, uh, two aspects may be quickly mentioned but not discussed. For-profit cooperatives and not-for-profit social and solidarity entities, SSEs, uh, including microfinance institutions, do play a key role, especially towards women. One may think about the care economy. In the MENA region, uh, SSEs may take advantage from uh, the recent framework that was uh, designed in Tunisia. And female workers must be assigned priority and given job opportunities, especially once again in the care economy. Formalization should target both informal businesses and workers, combining stick and carrot, or carrot and stick, if you want to be optimistic, and specific tax and public procurement uh, policies addressing informal businesses would be uh, welcome. And uh, it should be uh, encouraged that those informal businesses that are establishing as formal and regist registering uh, in uh, due uh, conditions should be uh, helped and not those who are not, of course, uh, agreeing with uh, the uh, formalization framework. Last but not least, MFIs, uh, microfinance institutions, enable the formalization of informality and there is an interesting and encouraging uh, example of the Egyptian MFI ABBA, Alexandria, Alexandria uh, Business Association, which have tripled the number of fully formalized clients in about uh, 10 years from 6% to uh, 18%. I will stop at this point and uh, have a few slides in the appendix if we need to go back to these according to questions thank you very much for your attention thank you Philip. thank you very much uh okay so thank you um now we'll continue with emmanuel unless there are any urgent questions that can be wait that can't wait uh, to be sent via email emmanuel are you here are you ready to present yes i'm here almost Sharing. okay thank you philip thank you very much so, Emmanuel, the floor is yours if you are ready. Okay. So, okay, you have 15 minutes. Please, you know, try to, so you, because you have a lot of slides, so please try to finish it in about 15 minutes, okay? If yes. you can. Yes. <laughs> I will try, I will try. Thank you so much uh, yeah, for this opportunity. I'm, I'm almost yeah, sleepy now because uh, I'm presenting from Japan and it's like uh, 2, 2 20 a.m. now. Oh, so I my didn't name know is... that. I didn't know that. I thought you were in Nigeria. That's why I have okay. scheduled to sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry for that. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. So sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. So um, my name is Emmanuel Moru Haruna. So um, the topic of my presentation is the impact of formalization program on informal also enterprise performance, so evidence from a quasi experiment uh, in Nigeria. So I'll be very, um, I mean, fast, so because of uh, time and, so this is the outline of my proposed uh, structure, structure in the years in, of the chapter. So I'll be, I'll be looking at, I'll be talking about the motivation, um, why informality is important, and also the introduction, research, uh, objective questions, literature, both theoretical and empirical. I'll be sharing some data, so, and also talk about methodology, result, and I will conclude. Yeah, so the, um, now the key question is about why informality is very important. So we all know that, um, yeah, the inform informality actually employed a lot of workers today, so both self-employed uh, self and uh, wage employment. But the, but the fact still remains the fact that um, how, do we, how do we uncover this mechanism of their persistence? 
So we have seen also that it has increased wages. Um, I mean, um, uh, salary disparity and um, yeah, according to one of my recent paper I published last year. So and also with with the likelihood of all those enterprises to to actually create this kind of innovation, kind of investment and and R and D. So it's very limited. And also we have seen how it has affect all those mental health and maybe women too. And the, the the anticipation is this that it's been expected that this this um, I mean the informality will shrink as the economy grow, but this this doesn't really um, I mean I mean occur as being postulated, but um, like uh, so according to Roderick, so that in, informality is here to stay. So based on his um, premature in the industrializations. Okay, so this is the preview of the main finding. So according to the, yet yeah, to my paper, so it shows a kind of uh, that there's form of um, formalization or formality, as in as more enterprises formalize, so they they increase their value added by 0.26 percent, while their net profit by 0.27 percent on average, and um, and it has shown also that formalization actually improve access to electricity internet usage, um, the, the size of the enterprises, so the amount they actually borrow money, investment, um, bookkeeping, and, and the rest. But, but however, so there is no evidence that formalization actually improve access to water. But in terms of the mechanism that has been channeled through these uh, occur, so based on, on my study, I find that it's true, it's been driven by access to electricity, enterprises, the size of enterprises, investment, and mobile phone ownership. But these are more, is, so it's very small. So the impact is very small and is very common among the, among the self-employed enterprises. So this is the introduction. I wouldn't want to go through it because it has been overflowed by others. But the most important thing is that this proliferation of these unregistered businesses. So the implication is that it lowers the, the capacity for government to mobilize tax. And it's also increased inequality, low productivity. It's also, it has also disturbed uh, some of the macroeconomic uh, policies. But in terms of Nigeria, it's averagely 57.1% is huge, ranked third in Africa, but laser, but I mean, I mean higher than Mauritius and, um, and lower than Mozambique, which is almost 61%. This is the context about what makes um, informality very, very, very problematic in Nigeria, because it's like is is the question of legality. So on the on the left hand side, so we have seen all those street vendors and also mobile mobile shop moving on the street, doing their businesses, even even those security, I mean, tax authority, they patronize them. But on the right hand side. Is, is the black market because in Nigeria we, 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 we target as black market, this oil bunkery because um, that is our only source of revenue or uh, crude oil. And even in the filling station, so in the gas station, as, as people will say, so, so you will see this, this, um, this oil orchid. So, so, so those things make it very, very complex to actually quantify how, how the Nigeria informality is like. Then, um, with, with special consideration, the kind of informality that happens, it it it's more common among these um, uh, petty traders, all those artisans, all those street vendors, mechanics, and all the small transport services. So they actually populate those the, yeah the, the Nigerian economy. But the most important thing is this: so it provides us all with a source of revenue. So that makes it very complex. For the government to address, and it also, I, I mean, reduces some of those people who are low income earners. So then, what about the policy measures? So is the, the question is what? How can the government intervene? But empirically, we have seen that whether or not informality, I mean, informal enterprises will benefit from from formalization. I mean, uh, formalization initiative. It, it has been questioned so by by many scholars. And this issue about, about incentives, incentives, so is, is a critical issue in terms of addressing this informality. And, and, and in most cases, any new formalization policy or initiative 
It doesn't address those who are already in the informal sector, right? So it, it actually encourages the existence of the new business instead of addressing, moving those who are in informal sector to formal. So what about the formalization program in Nigeria? So we have seen, so the name of it is, is BIS program. So we call it business incentive strategy. So it's been, it's, so it's been designed in 2019. The purpose is to register, uh, I mean, enable businesses to register their, to formalize their business, to open bank account, to get access to finances and also some of the grants. So this incentive, this um, deformation program just have the registration amount by 50% to actually encourage uh, enterprises to register. So this is the distribution of informality in Nigeria. So it's very common among the northern part of the country. So which I will. I will actually explain later. So in terms of where do they operate, some of, most of them, about roughly 62% of them operate in, in, in retail and tourism. So in terms of regional distributions, so like I just mentioned, is commonly found in the, in the northern part of the country and around 24% is in the Northwest of Nigeria. So the research objective is to look at this causal effect about the formalization program on performance of those informal household enterprises. So the such question is, how do formalization reforms affect all those, all those household enterprises and through what channel does it really occur? So in terms of theoretical perspective, I wouldn't um, say much about this because it has been overflogged, but I want to mention clearly that in the literatures we have four, the dualism, the parasite, the rational exist and the exclusion so, so exclusion and each one of them gave reasons why this informality, why they occur and how to deal with it based on um, theory. So I love this. So I so actually got it a few days ago from, um, from uh, Ulysses. So he made presentation uh, in, um, in this, uh, is it, is it Vox, Vox Def workshop just recently. So it shows is the empirical, so it shows clearly about the effect of formalization rate. So those are the key literature to show how those formalization program actually affect enterprises, either, either in terms of uh, wage employment or maybe, or, or maybe household in terms of strengthening, giving them incentive to register. And we have seen, so from, um, in my left hand side, it talks about this incentive of registration enforcement, as you can see, so, so the thought, one to three on, on, my la, on my left hand side is enforcement. So some people, yeah, so like uh, Prof say, talked about carrot, yeah, carrot and stick approach. Enforcement is a, and in this table, so you can see registration actually, um, I mean, I mean, took the forefront in terms of getting them to formalize. So, so the data, I got my data from the enhanced financial innovation assets. So it's a new data, so in Nigeria to strengthen access to finance, especially targeted at those informal households. So the period is two periods I was looking at, 2018 and 2020. So in between, in 2019, there was this formalization program or call. So I'm looking at the difference. So how does it affect? And so the benefit of using those, uh, those survey data are there. So because of my time, I will move very fast. So in terms of methodology, so uh, I'm looking at the two, two types of outcome value added and the net profit of all those household enterprises and also as well as looking at those intermediate outcomes so in terms of robustness checks so a total number of two, uh, 23,642 observations were obtained and so in terms of the treated and the control group treated group were 4,472 and the control group 7,349 uh, 7, as against the subsample sub of those informal enterprises that I was able to track out of 23642. So these are the econometric specifications. So I wouldn't want to waste much time here. So I use basically the D and D and also PM, a professional score matching. So this is also the extension of the to check the the average treatment effect of the of the matching process. So this is a quasi experimental design, how the design comes into. But I want to say this very clearly that I exploit two type of variation. So in this data, 
So the BIS reforms that occur and the implementation time for me to check the causal effect. So these are part of the results. So I, I differentiate it. So, so looking at the kernel in terms of the distribution on the impact on, on value added tax. This, this on my left hand side is before and this is what actually after. So this is also the, to show the common area of common support. So this is also before with the PMS and, and this is also after the matching process. Also, this one is also to actually reinforce my, yeah, my, my result to show the off, off support zone. This is also to actually declare, so how is the bias in terms of all those data? So this is the result. So the result is very interesting. So our major interest is about the interaction time. So how like, many do I have? Can you please wrap up in two minutes, in about two minutes so that- Okay, okay, okay. So yeah, yeah, thank you so much. So this is the so this is the effect on, on value added tax. And, and the major interest is the one that I've alerted. So the interaction between, between those who formalize and, and so on the time. And, and this is the effect on the net profit. So it's also highly significant at 1% level. So this is also the, the so the effect on the matching processes. So looking at the radius matching narrowest matching and also the kernel matching. So in conclusion, so we have seen clearly that this formalization having those business registration were able to actually increase people to, to, to actually declare their, the, the, so, so they're kind of making profit in Nigeria. But, but the challenge is this, some of the, some of the, um, I mean, I mean, I mean, um, an, an outcome. So intermediate outcome were not is not as, as as expected as the main outcome in terms of value added, or maybe the, so, so the net profit. But this study actually necessitated the so, so in kind of advising for policy mix, policy mix in the sense that carrot and 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 stick approach might not necessarily work. So so in terms of with respect to the stick. I mean, I mean, I mean, penalty. But what is very important is that if we can have a kind of hybrid policy properly identifying the possible benefit of business formalization and increases that this can the the carrot part of the approach. So for those who are who are still informal, so I think it will be able to help to reduce informality in Nigeria. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, so thank I will thank, thank, thank you for your presentation. Now we are about like you know five minutes. Five minutes. We are proceeding with five minute delay, which is fine. Uh, and now our last presenter in this session is uh, Patricia Acosta Restrepo. The floor is yours, Patricia. Good morning, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Yes, but good. Audience good. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you very much for organizing this network. I am. Very hyped, actually, because um, it's going to be very evident that I'm an architect urban planner. So I've been listening to all this, uh, these economic methods, and uh, it's been super interesting for me. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, I've been playing around with my uh, with my working title for the for the chapter, so it's changed a little. Mm, okay. Um, so um, what uh, I'm hoping to make some contributions looking at different phases of informality. Uh, we're looking at informal urban land development types as a mix of social and business practices. This is where we're at with the, with the working title. Uh, this is part of a larger uh, research project, but in the chapter, I'm hoping to um, be able to address um, informal urban development as it is related to land markets, as it is related to housing production. Um, and well, uh, I don't know why this has this effect, so I'll just go ahead and do that. Um, 
first recognizing that in the international literature, we're looking at uh, informal urban development as a ubiquitous global expression of unequal access to adequate housing. Um, also that it is it manifests dual urban land markets that are operating under parallel sets of rules. They are somewhat interconnected, but also and affect each other. Uh, but uh, what we're looking at is, uh, of course, questioning, and it's a, it's a very strong debate right now in our field, uh, the understanding of uh, formal just because things are institutionally and legally defined and those that are referred to as informal because they are not, but, but we can see there's a lot of grayscales in that, and I think it is a strong um, influence in the field right now of urban studies and planning to look at those gray scales. Also in the global south, uh, we observe that uh, in urban development, institutionalized practices can even be more often the exception than the rule. So uh, it's broadly refuted that urban informality be limited to an understanding as just illegality. Uh, research on urban development is shifting then towards an understanding of singularities that are derived from specific contexts. These contexts are geographical, institutional, legal, and they all interconnect, uh, but they all affect or become factors in the logics and behaviors of the agents involved in uh, land production for housing. Uh, our research on informal urban development in Colombia has focused on unpacking a diversity of practices underlying the origin and consolidation of informal neighborhoods. Informal settlement, because it looks very similarly in different regions of the world, uh, sometimes is oversimplified. And what's actually happening is that there are in uh, process a diversity of practices occurring not only in different moments in time, uh, in different geographical contexts, but also in parallel in the same city. So what we're looking at is uh, trying to distinguish what these practices are and what aspects are social practices and what others are actually business practices. Uh, traditional studies in urban studies and planning have explored exhaustively uh, settlement patterns, uh, consolidation processes, uh, urban fabric formation, how informality is related to urban growth and urban dynamics. Um, also, it has been a great interest in community dynamics in self-built environments. However, uh, this persisting dichotomic views, especially from the institutional side, because I think academia has moved forward from that and the debate has been uh, longer, uh, they do obscure structured organized economic agents behind these processes, as well as uh, it obscures the diversity of development schemes uh, that engage actors and land in different ways. So this is what we're, we're trying to look at. Our research has identified and characterized broadly, generally, nine types of informal development practices that have been promoting ur informal urban uh, urbanization in Colombian cities. And we've looked at uh, two intermediate cities, uh, considering that they are the less studied, but that right now are also the ones that have stronger growth dynamics, and that many of the practices observed in intermediate cities are also examples of transferring practices from larger cities uh, at an at, uh, earlier historical date towards uh, new uh, growth in intermediate cities. So we were able to work in depth in two cities, Soacha and Villavicencio. I wouldn't want to uh, discuss this and uh, pardon for uh, not having it in English yet, but I just think that this diagram also looks at a little bit of the intersections between formal production and informal production of both housing and land for affordable housing uh, and how this is related to different um, also groups that might be sometimes having options and deciding to go informal anyway. And one of the elements that we find in the in the literature is that there is a strong dynamic of uh, urban informality being uh, stronger and stronger also in the middle classes now, not only in, in the most vulnerable groups. 
uh, the chapter we're we're hoping to to um, contribute uh, is discussing three of the questions of a broader research endeavor. Uh, we're looking at processes. How is the informal uh, market supplying affordable land to social groups excluded from formal land uh, and housing markets in cities in Colombia? Uh, which strategies of the actors involved or arrangements between them define the main elements of each approach? And so that's related to the practices themselves. Uh, how do specificities of national and local context help explain the types of social and business practices that can be observed in the neighborhoods studied in the intermediate cities we studied in Colombia as related to context, because these behaviors and logics are also framed by uh, not only laws, but uh, authorities, um, governance specificities in local uh, contexts. Um, the conceptual framework to address uh, urban settlement in informal context uh, and the research approach uh, is influenced by uh, these mainly these four aspects. Uh, Harris, uh, in a global context, identifies modes of informal urban development, uh, and in relation to these uh, degree of influence as it is related to urban governance, uh, we've discovered that what we're looking at in the two uh, intermediate cities that we're looking at as overt and dominant modes of um, informal urban development. Uh, also, in, related to go in relation to gov governance issues, both uh, Harris and Roy uh, discuss or frame informality as rule breaking that is not always common in urban areas. And they related directly to the incidence uh, of informal development and settlement, depending on the state's desire and capacity to enforce its laws, and also set against the willingness and ability of local residents to meet them. So this, uh, this uh, perspective allows us to also consider how the state uh, is involved and influences uh, the, the degree to which uh, informal development uh, happens in specific contexts. Uh, the, the third aspect uh, related to practices is that we would be looking at how these delivery systems are organized, what is their logic, uh, how they constitute a practice because it's done over and over again. And uh, so, Cruz would say that informal settlement can be seen as a compendium of practices and a set of functional urban operations. So from that perspective, we're hoping to look at uh, having a, a more nuanced understanding uh, about informal processes in terms of uh, land uh, provision uh, and how it's re also related to prevailing inequalities in specific contexts. Um, fourth, uh, we took a case study approach to observe the practices and the processes in relation to actors and their interactions, uh, because uh, this means that we'll be looking at the political economy of, of, the, of the different emerging practices, and we interrogate the sites and practices and processes in terms of a series of factors that influence them. Um, in the case of Colombia, one of the very singular um, components of, of, of what sometimes promotes these dynamics and that influences them greatly is, of course, armed conflict and conflict actors in, in, in the cities. Um, I'm not being able to go on to the next one. In terms of methods, we've applied several um, several methods to approach this, this research. Uh, first of all, uh, during the pandemic, we did a general literature review, uh, hoping to find some evidences and clues about how things, what practices are actually taking place in different types of settlements here. Um, and also to see in the international literature, if uh, there has been a study of the practices of specific practices. And uh, we actually found a gap in urban studies in that aspect. So we hope to contribute in, in that uh, that sense. And in terms of Colombia, we were, we were 
were able to only find indirectly some clues about how uh, urban infractions, for example, are observed. So uh, lawyers and, and uh, authorities have learned a lot about uh, how these um, how these uh, mechanisms uh, work, but because they're actually just looking at what infractions are being um, made. And uh, also, uh, especially from architecture and, you hear me? and urban studies, we've been looking at, yes? Uh, if you can like, you know, wrap it up in about two, three minutes, that would be great. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, and thirdly, we've been looking at in-depth neighborhood cases with field work, um, working with experimental games designed to be able to explore individual logics because these topics, uh, participants fear uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the people and the organizations and the power structures that are present and they really don't feel free to discuss. Uh, so there's limited disclosure and there is uh, problems of safety when we uh, selected our neighborhoods because in some places authorities uh, told us that the places were off limits. So observing these in field uh, can be very complicated. We, we're going to be looking at through the development process stages, uh, especially emphasizing these two first ones where all the actors involved in uh, supplying land um, are involved, and we're looking at the history of the physical evolution of settlements, how the land provision mechanism works, and what roles and what actors are involved to observe the strategies, practices, and the interactions between them. I won't go into the detail, but these are the nine um, mechanisms or the, the nine types of, of um of urban land development that we've been uh, discovering and that we've been able to find examples of these in, of some of these, many, uh, in the two cities that we were looking at. Um, let's see. And some of the preliminary insights uh, include uh, the fact that there are significant differences in uh, how, in cities with similar institutional capacity, there is uh, a differences in the political desire and the capacity to face informal urban development. And we observe cases of overt and dominant uh, versions of since from the perspective of governance, uh, that these nine types of practices that we've been looking at, uh, it's challenging to really fully understand them, uh, but the work in the urban fringes that we've been working on, we found sufficient examples and through the game, the experimental game that we devised to be able to talk to people so that through role play, they can more openly express their relationship that they've been having with uh, people who sold plots to them. Uh, that's been helpful in under, under covering some of the elements there. Uh, the case studies uh, that we're looking at, three in each city, uh, suggest that formal property is less and less appealing to people because the subsidies, tax exemptions, and other uh, burdens that um, individuals prefer to avoid when they actually become formal property owners, uh, and they also fear losing squatter protection privileges that come to them through different types of public policies. So even when we're working with them in the workshops, most participants will only reveal uh, through uh, the conversations and the games, but they usually present themselves as squatters, even though squatting has actually uh, almost uh, disappeared for, as a way of uh, access to land for uh, low-income residents who seek who are excluded from housing markets because they have been replaced by agents that are driving the informal land markets who are organized economic agents who exercise power over the settled territories, who use forms of oppression uh, to um, not only um, charge for the plots, but also to uh, offer and retain uh, property uh, titles, uh, but also because they're, they definitely participate in uh, diverse networks associated with criminal activities and sometimes are directly related to the Colombian armed conflict. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, so 
Now we are done with the eighth session as well and can start the last and the ninth session. Uh, slightly, it's a bit very slight delay, uh, not really serious considering that, that we are in a nine hour adventure. Um, now the first paper here is by my former classmate, Mario Solis Garcia uh, and his uh, co-authors Ying Tong Hie and Valeska Kohan from McAllister College and Carlton College. Uh, so Mario, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Can you hear me all right? Um, yes, perfect. We okay, can hear you perfect. perfect. Okay, so I'm going to start sharing my screen and I don't trust my uh, bandwidth so much. So I'm going to shut my video so you guys can see what I want sure. you to see and not, um, not my face. Okay, so let's see. Uh, and let me just open this up. Can you guys see the? Yes, we can. perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, awesome. So this is, um, I took some liberties and since we are back to back with the papers, I just decided to put the two of them in one set of slides. And actually this makes a lot of sense because this is kind of like the natural way that this project uh, started. And so these two contributions to the paper are first, what we are tentatively calling the DGE-based estimates of the shallow economy, asking whether the informal economy is an escape valve. And then our second contribution is titled measuring the size of the shallow economy using a dynamic general equilibrium model. And of course, I'm gonna be moving from one to the other. Uh, so they're not gonna be necessarily in this order. And as uh, Jehu has said, this is joint work with uh, Valeshka, uh, who is a student at McAllister College and Jing Tong, who is at Carleton College, former student also from McAllister. And so what are we trying to, to do here? So the motivation is we start from a very basic uh, stylized fact, which is that business cycles are way more volatile in developing countries relative to developed ones. And so there is a standard explanation in the literature which says that, well, is the cycle that is the trend, and this is what uh, Aguiar and Gopinath share in their 2007 JP paper. But we wanted to, to take a different spin on this, uh, which is to say, well, Maybe there's a cycle uh, that to blame, but we want to see whether the informal sector matters when we account for volatility differences between developing and developed countries. And so why would this matter? Uh, there are two also fairly stylish observations that we're gonna try to, to motivate in this, in, the, in this presentation. The first one is that, well, it's, it's kind of obvious that the shallow economy is larger in developing economies and not so much in developed ones. So think about Peru versus Norway, there is certainly a very different uh, size of, of, the, of the shallow economy in both, uh, in both economies. And then the second one is that the informal sector size tends to change depending on the state of the economy. So you would expect that in bad times when the economy is in a recession, people gravitate towards the shallow economy, maybe because there are no, there is no social network, there is no unemployment insurance and stuff like that. And to decrease in good times, because other things the same, you would rather have a job in the formal sector as opposed to the shallow economy. And so this is what we're playing with when we say that the informal sector units are escape valves from recessions. So it's not like in the US where if I lose my job, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be able to claim unemployment insurance. In this case, well, I still have to, to, to earn my, my living. And so I'm gonna go to the informal sector because that's, that's the way out. And so here we're proposing the following mechanism that is, is more or less a, a, a a more detailed version of what I showed you uh, in the previous slide. So we're gonna say that first, when times are good, think that when we're in an expansion, it's it, we can think that productivity is gonna be higher and then workers are gonna gravitate towards formal activity. So basically this is think of a hot labor market, uh, uh, an expanding economy, booming economy. Basically, if you have two hands, you're higher, right? Think about what's happening in the US right now. Then this is what, when we're saying when times are good. And when these uh, you know, formal activities, by definition, these ones are measured by official sources. So real GDP as it's measured is gonna go up. However, you can think that when times are bad, productivity tends to be lower and households are gonna be moving towards informal activity and think that there is a, a big batch of lo think low skilled or low education people who are gonna be the first ones to move toward informal activities. But as these go undetected by official sources, then measure real GDP is gonna go down. So what we're gonna see in national accounts is the formal sector real GDP is gonna exhibit a lot of volatility, but this is what we measure. But when we think about total real GDP, what we define as measured and the shadow economy real GDP, 
that shouldn't vary that much. So our conjecture is that if we include the role of the shadow economy, then we shouldn't see real GDP moving in the measure of total, uh, total output of the economy. So this is where we start connecting things with the, with the second contribution. So of course, if we could measure total real GDP, basically the sum of formal and shadow uh, output, then this hypothesis could be very easy to, 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 to test. But of course, this involves having a way to measure the shallow economy. But this is, of course, a problem because how are you going to measure accurately something that, by definition, doesn't want to be measured, which is, of course, the shallow economy. So this is where we started uh, thinking about this. And this was something that uh, Yington and I produced around, started poking around 2016. And so we, we found that there are some alternatives. But then we started thinking whether they cut the bill or not. And so, you know, quoting from the giants, uh, Schneider and Ernst, this is an old paper, but basically this is summarizing what's out there. There are three broad approaches to measuring the, the shadow economy, the direct uh, method, which is basically surveys or, or, or census, indirect methods, which is electricity or, or currency approach, and then the model base, which is uh, what Schneider has, has favored a long time. Uh, and then, you know, thinking about the model-based approaches, this is essentially a structural econometric model that tries to back up the size of the shallow economy. And, and the, the poster child of this is the mimic method, which is the multiple indicator, multiple causes method. And so the way it works is that you make a conjecture about how the economy has multiple causes, maybe unemployment, maybe GDP, and it has multiple effects. Think about an excess of, of uh, uh, currency velocity, et cetera. And so if you can measure them, you can connect causes and effects to try to, to fill out the details of the structural econometric model. So this is fairly easy to implement because there's no need to, for survey data. But the, the con that we found as we were going through this uh, project is that we, the, the estimates lack the action we would expect. And I'm gonna show you what I mean for this. So here I'm just picking three, three countries that are some close to, to, to our hearts, Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico. And I want you to focus on the blue line, which is Argentina. So it is well known that in 97 and late to, in, in early 2000, Argentina had major meltdowns in their economy. So we would expect that the size of the shallow economy, which is what I'm, we're plotting here on the y-axis, the percent of shallow economy as, you know, total G, as a fraction of total GDP, would spike a lot in, this, in these years. But we don't see anything. Brazil also had a major meltdown in the in the in the 1990s, but we don't see anything really. So it's 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 a good measure, but we don't see the volatility we would expect. You know, having been there and having experienced these uh, these uh, massive recessions, or some would say great depressions. And so we we looked at this when we didn't think they cut they cut the bill in terms of what we wanted to get. So this is how the second project started. So we decided to build our own shadow economy times years from scratch. And so this is still going to be on the model-based approach line, but we're going to use a dynamic general equilibrium framework as opposed to mimic. And what we get is something that resembles our conventional wisdom. So I'm from Mexico, Valeska is from Argentina and Brazil. And so here you can see, again, in the blue line, you have the, you, the increases that we would expect in the size of the shallow economy relative to formal GDP. Here we have the massive increase in, in shadow output coming from Brazil. So these time series have a lot of movement, they have a lot of variability, and they seem to, to be more accurate relative to what we know happened in, in the real world, okay? So uh, I'm just gonna point your attention to this line, which is into the year 2000. You know, this is basically 40% for Brazil, 30% for Mexico, and about 25% for Argentina. So we're gonna, I'm gonna use that in just a second. But this is what we're getting out of this approach. So a lot more action, a lot more variability, and something that is grounded on, you know, dynamic macro theory. So what, what is it that we're doing here? So obviously in the time that we have, we're, we're not gonna have enough time to, to go over all the details. There's, there's a lot of moving bells and whistles, but you know, I can try to, to give you a good glimpse of what's going on here. So we use a fairly simple dynamic general equilibrium model. This is basically, this is loosely based on Eirig and Mo, their, their Journal of Development Economics paper from 2004. And essentially, we're assuming that there is an economy that consists of a representative household producer and the government. And this household producer has two uh, production technologies, one that represents the formal economy, one that represents the shadow economy. 
And the only difference between the two is the level of productivity that these technologies have and that the shadow economy doesn't have capital in their uh, production inputs. And if you can if you can see around you know developing economies, you can see that the shallow productive units are not don't have the same scale as the ones you know like a, a big company that that has access to banking accounts, et cetera. So those are essentially what what their inputs to the model are. And so the strategy here that we use is that we use the equilibrium conditions that come from the model to back out the dynamics of the shadow economy. So if we believe that the economy behaves like our DGE model, then there is a set of equilibrium conditions that must hold in every single step along the way. And so if we take those equilibrium conditions, those are going to impose some restrictions on the growth rates of the economy. And so that's essentially what we're going to be looking at. And so once again, this is only our methodology in broad strokes. There are two contributions uh, with Ying Tom Dart. 2018 journal macro paper on 2022 upgrades on econ journal watch so i'm not going to go deep into here but i urge you to look at these ones if you're interested but essentially as i was saying the equilibrium conditions that are coming from the model are going to be key for the, allowing us to derive the dynamic properties of the shallow economy and so there are three key conditions that that, that are going to be uh used by us well, there are going to be the two intratemporal conditions, basically the ones that tell about the trade-off between formal labor and leisure and shadow labor to leisure and the shadow economy technology. So just I, again, I, I apologize for not showing you the equations, but these three, intra, these three equilibrium conditions re basically require that these three equations, which are growth rates, uh, must hold in every period. So just to, to show you what equation one says, it says that the growth rate of total labor raised to some exponent chi equals the grade rate, the growth rate of consumption raised to some exponent minus sigma, which is parameter again, times the growth rate of formal GDP, which is what is measured in the data, times the growth rate of formal labor uh, inverse. And so these three equations, this one, imagine that it's not right. I apologize for this typo. But we have things that are highlighted in red, and that means that these, these variables are measured from the real world. So you can go to the pen world table or you can go to the national accounts for the country that you want to look at, and you're going to be able to find good estimates of, say, measured consumption, measure real GDP, hours work, and so on. So the trick is, how can we make it so that given these three equations, we're able to derive the dynamic properties of, of uh, the shallow economy? So this is doable. Um, and basically, there's a lot of stuff that happens in the background. Once again, that's uh, highlighted in the paper. But essentially, what we do is calculate the value of shadow labor from the base period, calculate the key parameter, which is the productivity or the exponent on the on shadow labor on the shadow production function. Then we calculate labor for the total amount of the economy and shadow labor for the full sample, and then productivity and output for the full sample. So this is actually a lot of, of, of stuff that I'm, I'm on purpose skipping here. But what we're able to get is, you know, a lot of, of uh, time series graph that uh, have, as we said, all the dynamics that are expected given conventional wisdom. And so what I'm going to show you here is uh, some raw data that we use from, well, no, I'm not going to show you the raw data. We use the raw data from the pen world table. And then uh, we're going to, I'm going to try to convince you that these measures that we get fit conventional wisdom really well. So we're not going to get that, say, developing economies have lower shallow, econ shallow economy values and developed ones and so forth. So, for example, this first graph that I'm showing you is the weighted average shadow to formal ratio grouped by region and weighted by population. So you can see that here, out of the sample of countries we have, you can see how these these uh, regions have evolved their shallow to formal ratio. And so you get things that are reasonable. So for example, this light blue line is North America here measured as the US and Canada. So as you can expect, this is fairly low in terms of the shallow to formal output ratio. You can think of say Latin America in orange. This is higher. It spikes in the late 1990s as a as a thank you from the tequila crisis and then starts going down and again the, the reason why this drops so massively is basically a, a a playoff between the sizes of the shallow economy and the population ratios and so on and so forth but i think that the graph that 
captures really well that what we're doing makes a lot of sense is this one over here. We are able to categorize uh, the countries between developed economies and developing ones. As expected, you see that the developed ones have a much lower child economy ratio relative to the developing ones. Okay, so this points us, points us to the fact that this seems to be a reasonable uh, methodology that is, you know, based, grounded on theory, and it allows us to get, you know, a lot of action that resembles what we see in, in the real world. So now that we have this methodology, now we can answer the question, well, starting from what we wanted to answer at the beginning, is GDP really more volatile in, developed econ in developing economies? So we take this, these values from the methodology we derived. And so what I'm gonna show you is basically coming from these uh, step, four steps, which are argument for, for this talk. So first, we're gonna take a subsample of all the countries uh, because we want to keep only those who have a continuous time series from 83 to 2019. So if you have gaps or if you work with the pen table, you, you know that there are some countries whose data doesn't don't start until 1990 or you have cuts. So we're going to take those out in the interest of having of comparing apples with apples. And so once we use the methodology and apply it to these 43 countries, what we want to do is, is take a couple of steps. First, we want to verify conventional wisdom that says for, for these sample of countries, the developing countries have bigger shallow economies than the developed ones, which again, here we show that it is true in general. Then we're going to check the volatility argument. So we, we argue that the total output should be less volatile than formal out because of this escape valve mechanism. And so here we have a mixed uh, answer. This is a kind of like a so-so. I'm going to show you a graph in a second. And then I'm going to verify whether the escape valve mechanism is out there. So basically here I'm checking whether there is a positive correlation between the volatility of formal output and shadow output. Here the answer is a resounding yes. So looking at what the data tells us, here this first graph gives us, you know, on the x-axis, the shadow economy size that's coming from the model. And here I'm getting the relative real GDP uh, from the data. And here I use relative real GDP because I'm normalizing it. I'm taking the GDP of that country divided by the US GDP. So you can see here that the United States of America has a relative real GDP of 100. But essentially, you can see that as countries have lower GDP relative to the US, and again, this is just a normalization, the size of the shallow economy increases. And here I'm showing you in red the best fitting line, which is clear, which clearly has a negative slope. Okay, so the, the first step is showing that the model at least hits this, this uh, conventional wisdom uh, stylized fact is true. And then we come to the so-so part. So the, here I'm showing on the, on the, on the x-axis the formal output volatility. So this is, we take measured GDP, basically what comes out of national accounts and calculate the volatility of the series. And over here in the y-axis, we compare it from for with the total output volatility, which again is measured or formal plus shadow GDP coming from the model. And so if the conjecture was true at 100% level, basically this is a home run, we would expect all the names to be on this side of the 45 degree line, which here is plotted in red. So we see that it's so-so because we have some countries for which total output volatility is higher than we measure in the formal sector. But there are also some countries for which the total volatility is lower than what we measure in the data. So we can't claim a home run, but we can't also say that this is a complete waste of our time. So thinking that there, there this is kind of like the, the lowest or the easiest model that allows us to get as many countries as we can, given the data, I think it's 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 an encouraging way to, to to say that this has a future. And then the last thing is we want to look at the escape valve. And so here we are comparing on the x-axis the output volatility from the shadow sector that comes from the model with the formal output volatility that comes from the data. And so we would expect that if the escape valve mechanism were here we would have you know, these two growing, you know, being positively correlated. And so this, give, giving the data we have, there's a positive slope. It's, it's kind of weak, but we can immediately see that there's a friendly outlier here, which is Vietnam. So what happens if we take it off? Then we have this. So this is a, clearly a, a robust 
uh, relationship, the, this is a much steeper positive slope coming from the, the, the model and the data. And so it seems to us that there is a, a way to think about the escape valve mechanism as, as a contributor, as a contributing factor to whether you know, developing economies have much, much higher um, volatility in terms of business cycles than developed ones. And this, the, the shadow economy could be a big uh, role, could play a big role in, in, in this. And so wrapping things up, uh, we have some final comments and, and some loose odds and ends. And so here, what, what I, we tried to show is that we can't think about GDP volatility and this question about whether uh, the shadow economy, sorry, developing economies are more or less volatile than developed ones. Um, that we, we, if we don't think about the shallow economy, uh, we try to convince you that countries with high GDP volatility also happen to have a large shadow sector. And, and the, the, the side, the bonus of this is that we also have a methodology that allows us to think about the shadow, the, about measuring the shallow economy, you know, in, in a way that's consistent with economic theory and, and modern macro models that like the ones that, that are taught in, in grad school. And so our findings, at least at the preliminary stage, uh, show that this hypothesis is not too too far out. There, there is a, a case to be made that for some countries, adding the shallow economy actually gives you a lower volatility when you measure, you know, output as what's produced in the formal sector plus what's produced in the shadow economy. And so, just some loose odds and ends here. You know, it's it's obvious that this model, as as simple as it is, doesn't exploit some features. Uh, that could influence the size of the shallow economy. So here, as, as if you remember, since this was based on, the, on Eirig and Mo's paper, we, we take a very simple, uh, you can think of a toy model. Um, and, and the reason why we did this, because we wanted to get the first pass looking at a unified data set that worked the same for all countries in the sample, or try to maximize the number of countries for which we had data, uh, and then see if, if this panel that we're getting, it makes sense in some way. But of course, you know, if, if you think about financial frictions, you would say, well, the, the, the nature of the, or the state of financial frictions in Norway is going to be different from the one in, in Mexico, or the, the state of borrowing constraints in Bolivia is going to be different from the state of borrowing constraints in Canada. And same for taxes, which are kind of like the usual um, uh, point finger at uh, item for the shallow economy. So it's very easy to, to add these frictions or these constraints to our baseline model, right? The reason why we didn't do it is because we, we didn't want to get bogged down in the data by saying, hey, we need to spend you know, two years getting data for tax systems across 40 countries because then you know, it's, it's far too late. So the, the point here is that if you have the data for all these constraints or all these details modifications that you want to the model, then the sky is the limit and these features are there for, for all the adventurous um, uh, researchers. And so that is what we have. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna try to stop sharing. And now where am I? I don't know where I am. Thank where you, thank you, Mario. Okay. You were wow. really right on time. Yep. Uh -huh. <laughs> Okay, so any questions and uh, feedback are going to be sent to you via email uh, by the uh, attendees if needed after the workshop. Uh, let me just call out Anastasia again. If she is ready, she can present now. Anastasia, are you there? Will... I I am here. Uh, uh, okay. Do you want to present now? Yes, I can present if you can. Uh, if you are fine with it. Yeah, I, I am fine. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Oh, so fine. okay let then. I just made you co-host and you can just go ahead and share your screen. So you are going to be your last presenter today. Thanks for this opportunity. I'm sorry again. I, I got it completely wrong. No, that's fine. To time. So Anastasia Litina will so be presenting. Let me see. Um, let me, I cannot figure out how I can upload. You will just share screen. Ah, there. Yes. yes, yes, I just I just see the button. Share screen. And uh, you are gonna okay. share the PDF or whatever file you are gonna use. Just one second. Okay. So um uh, okay, share screen. 
Sorry, but it says oh, the PDF should be open, hard. or maybe you should give permission to share. Maybe sometimes that constitutes a barrier. Is it yes, fine? You are sharing. Yes, now it's ready. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Thanks a lot. So, thanks again for the opportunity to present in general and especially uh, in the last session after my mistake. So, the paper is about um, corruption, tax evasion, and social values. And the main idea is to uh, um, empirically explore an idea that we had established earlier with my co-author, uh, Theodor Palvos, um, that, uh, that actually societies might enter a vicious circle of political corruption and tax evasion that is triggered by reciprocity. So what is the idea there? The idea is that if we observe other people being corrupt or politicians being corrupt, then we tend to, uh, to be more corrupt ourselves. We enter in such a, a vicious circle. This was a theoretical finding. And the idea here is to try to establish this empirically. So we use two types of samples. The first is the World Value Survey sample. But there we have some issues of identification. We can simply show correlations. And ultimately, we resolve uh, uh, we resort to a sample of second and third generation immigrants from the general social survey in order to try to um, mitigate identification concerns. So long story short, our findings suggest that the higher the level of political corruption, at least of course as perceived by citizens, it is all about perceptions, then the more justifiable they find it to cheat on taxes. Now, if we move to the US sample, we find that higher mean levels of perceived political corruption in the origin country, so this is what the parents of immigrants had themselves experienced, and therefore they transmitted these beliefs and norms to their offsprings, still have a persistent effect on individual attitudes of immigrants towards tax evasion in the US. So it is not a reciprocal action towards US politicians. However, it is the type of norm that was instilled to them by their parents, and it manifests itself in the host country. Uh, I think I can skip the literature uh, in the lack of time. Uh, I mean, it's uh, well known, it is here, and I'm happy to uh, give any more concrete references. And I will go straight to our uh, identification uh, strategies. So overall, our idea relies on the so-called epidemiological approach. And the idea is that there is some sort of cultural inertia, as has been suggested by uh, much of the literature. This is the only part I would like to focus from the literature. Uh, so the idea is that there are some norms that are being transmitted. And we are able to observe them two or three generations later. So as I said, the first specification is the OLS specification. So the only thing we claim to do is simply to show some correlations. And to this end, we resort to the well uh, value surveys. This is a, I mean, you're all familiar with it. It's a cross national survey. And we use the rounds that have available the questions we're interested in. Therefore, we end up with more than 50,000 individuals from 45 countries. So the world values questions that are world value service questions that are relevant is how widespread do you think bribe taking and corruption is in this country? And we view this as a proxy for the extent of political corruption as perceived by individuals. And then we try to capture the proxy for individual attitudes towards corruption, and we do this using the question. Please tell, me for, uh, please tell me for each of the following statements whether you think it is justified, never justified, or something in between, to sit on taxes. So we concretely capture attitudes towards tax evasion. Let me clarify here, we do not really capture the tax evasion itself. It's attitudes towards it. I mean, we don't know what is the end result. On top of this, we try to, uh, to account for additional confounders like the age of the respondent, the gender educational level, religious group, and other uh, variables um, that are available from the World Value Survey. So this is our baseline specification. 
So our, uh, uh, our outcome variable is the proxy for tax evasion as this is expressed by individual I who lives in country J and has uh, participated in the um, uh, teeth a uh, world value surveys round. So we try to capture an observables that remain constant across countries and across time. This is our proxy for political corruption and it corresponds to the answer of its individual I. And this is a vector of the individual controls, country fixed effects and year fixed effects. And we cluster standard errors at the country level. So <clears throat> to jump directly on our tables, I will, I will I go immediately to the last column. So they all use the same sample. We simply add uh, sequentially um, all the controls that I mentioned so as to study the evolution of the coefficient. And what we find is that once we add the full set of controls, individual controls, country, uh, and year fixed effects, there seems to be a statistically significant and positive effect suggesting that individuals tend to find it more justifiable to cheat on taxes, the more um, they believe that, that politicians are corrupt themselves. So we believe that we show a correlation between uh, political corruption and individual corruption, if I may use the word corruption to describe tax evasion. Now, as I said, the first approach, the World Value Survey, is mere correlation. It is very difficult to find a valid instrument in order to resolve identification issues. To this end, we resort to the so-called epidemiological approach, uh, which I discussed in the context of Fernandez, Giuliano, and other uh, people that have worked around it. And uh, the idea is that we explode the, if I may call it the natural experiment or semi-natural experiment of migration. Now, it is not the perfect experiment, of course, because uh, immigrants may be selected. And therefore, we use only second and third generation immigrants who are not directly related to the country of origin. Uh, in particular, we exploit the sample of the General Social Survey over the period 1972-2012. And uh, as I said, we use second and third generation immigrants and we end up with something around 200 immigrants from 16 origin countries. So that would be Greeks, Turks, Germans, Swedish people living in the US and actually the offsprings of those people that once migrated in the US. Here you can see uh, the, the countries, the origin countries and how many people from its country moved to the US. Now the questions here are, First, is it wrong to cheat on taxes? And this is the proxy for the attitudes of immigrants, the offspring of immigrants towards corruption. Now, what we do here, following the epidemiological approach, we associate each individual in our sample with the mean level of corruption, of political corruption, back at home. And in order to construct this and to have a similar uh, uh, analysis like the one in our World Value Survey sample, we use the World Value Survey question, we construct the averages for its country, and then we associate its individual with the average corruption level of the country of origin. And on top of this, we control for age of the respondent, the gender income, and the ethnic origin of the individual. Uh, as I said, we use second and third generation immigrants to mitigate selection concerns. Uh, and because we know that first generation immigrants are usually more related to their origin country. Um, and therefore, if we still observe differences, we believe that these differences are driven by, dif by cultural differences of immigrants and not by the host country, which is the same actually for everyone. So they all live in the same country, they are, they are all faced with the same set of um, uh, institutions. Uh, so the specification is, uh, so our outcome variable is the tax evasion proxy of individual I, actually the immigrant I, who comes from origin country O and has participated in GSS round T. And this is the mean value of uh, the political corruption proxy based on the country of origin. So this is a type of multi-level analysis 
This is a vector of individual controls, and we use a general social survey uh, around fixed effects. And what we find here, again, let me jump directly to, um, uh, to the last uh, column. Uh, so that would be here. Uh, what we find here is that the mean, the higher the mean level of political corruption back at the origin country, then uh, the higher, uh, the more likely individuals are to declare that we find it justifiable to cheat on taxes. Okay, this is the sample of 197 individuals. The last column, column five, extends the sample to include first generation immigrants as well. The trade off here is that on the one hand, we have more observations, we jump to 750, but on the other hand, we allow more unobservables, but nevertheless, we still find that the effect is present and statistically significant and in the same direction. So, to conclude, and I hope I'm fine with time. Um, uh, the idea is that uh, we empirically try to establish this reciprocity between political corruption and individual corruption using both uh, simple correlations from the world value surveys and trying to uh, better identify the effect relying on the epidemiological approach. We believe that the message of our study is that indeed both empirically and theoretically, we can argue that actually corruption may corrupt and there are feedback effects. Thank you very much again. Uh, thank you, Anastasia. Um, so this was basically the last presentation of the workshop uh, after eight hours. Uh, <laughs> so we are only now seven people here attending. Uh, at some point during the day, it was more than 25. Uh, of course, it's understandable on a Sunday, uh, talking about shadow economy informality for eight hours straight. That's really a demanding job. Thank you for all your contributions. I will send you more information about how to submit your full chapter proposals or full chapters, so to speak, by the end of May. Uh, but uh, that's all about the workshop for today. Thank you for your attendance. I'm looking forward to seeing your final chapters. Bye bye. Thank you very Thank much. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Have a good rest. You too.